Good evening and welcome to Bench Monster TV. I'm Ashley Lynn Condre. And I am the Bench Monster. Good evening, Thanks everybody. Thanks for joining us. Good to have you here. I hope our Very audio, excited for tonight. I hope our audio isn't blowing you out of the water. I got it turned up, and uh, it's going to be an awesome show tonight. Yes, we're very, very excited. We Oof, have a super I'm, special guest. I brought a towel down because I'm sweating already. <laughs> it's it's going to be exciting. Yes, uh, it's going to be very Let's cut cool. right to the chase here. Uh, we got Dave Hoff on tonight, and uh, we got questions to ask. And we Lots get of questions, and we know you guys are probably going to have some questions and comments. Um, so we're going to make sure we, we have some time for those also. So we'll... Pretty much get started. I yeah, what, what I got here is a little intro, and I got a intro video that I'm going to play as I'm reading the intro. So let's uh, let's hop aboard here and uh, let me get started. I got a lot to read. <laughs> lot All right, to okay. Our next guest has the all-time world record squat, 1,210 pounds at 275, and 1,273 pounds at 308. Also, the all-time totals, 3,005 at 275, and the l largest three-lift total of all time, 3,103 pounds at 308, actually weighing 292. He was the first man in history to total 3,100 pounds, first man to squat 1,200 under 300 pounds of body weight. He has the highest Wilk score of all time, 798. In addition to the biggest total of all time, he is the pound for pound the strongest power lifter on the planet. Three-time WPO champion, only power lifter to bench a thousand pounds in a full power meet. Benched 1,000 pounds in two weight classes, 1,000 at 271 and 1,015 at 292. Became the first teenager to squat a grand with 1,005 pounds at 257 pounds body weight at 19 years old. Is the youngest person to total 2,500, 2,600, 2,700, 2,800, 2,900, 3,000, and 3,100 pounds. Best competition lifts, 1,273 squat, 1,015 bench press, 826 deadlift, 3,103 total. Starred in the hit documentary, West Side vs. the World, and has, has appeared on MTV's Ridiculousness and the WPO Superfinals on ESPN3 and SportsCenter. Ladies and gentlemen... I'd like to introduce Power of Things baddest man on the planet, Mr. Dave Hoff. Dave, thank you for joining us this Hi, evening. Dave. My goodness, what, a, what an intro. Well, Sean. thank you. I worked on that all day. I actually re rehearsed it uh, in my computer room. So I just want to make sure I got it right. I typed a lot it of up accomplishments correctly. Yeah, that... to name off. My word. Yeah. Very impressive. Holy shit. Many years. Many, many years. Oh, Dave, I'm sweating already. Okay? I'm nervous. Yes. <laughs> I ate a deep fried pork tenderloin before I got on here as a pre-workout, so I'm Excellent. sweating already. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> well, Ash, we got a lot of you questions, right Dave. To the, right to the questions? Yeah, yeah. Let's cut to the chase, Dave. We Bring it. Let's do it. All okay. Right. We're here doing it. Perfect. So, as long as you can stay and hear me. I can yes, hear you. We can hear you. We can see you. Right. We, we, maybe we so should far. let people know, Dave, that your internet uh, service took yes. a crap last night and we're running on a Wi-Fi hotspot, so... Things might be a little jittery, might be a little fuzzy, but you know what? We're going to make it happen. And uh, I believe Dave said, you know, if it, if it works, doesn't work as, as total like we want it to here, we can do it again another time. So, and he's more than welcome to. How about this? We'll just say we're going to do it another time. We'll play yeah, it for another two, awesome. probably whenever you. Sounds great. All right, Sounds Ashley. Great. No matter what happens tonight, there will okay. be another. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, Ashley, go ahead. All right. So when and how did you get into power into weightlifting in general, and how did you get introduced into powerlifting specifically? Oh, um, weightlifting in general, like I was always an Arnold Schwarzenegger fan. When I was growing up, I always watched Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I watched uh, Sylvester Stallone and Jean-Claude Van Damme, and those guys were always jacked. So, you know, in the when you're a kid, you're like, I got to be big and jacked, and I'll have what those guys have. So. Um, I always started lifting weights when I was young. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just knew you go to the gym and if you worked out, you got big. And, but I, you know, you're a kid. I, I think I probably touched my first weight set maybe 10 or 11 years old. My, my friend had a, uh, his dad had sand weights in a basement, and we played around with them. And I think I benched 80 or 100 pounds, and I thought I was <laughs> King Kong when I was a child. I have a gift, you know. I have been born. <laughs> if only you. So, knew. You know, I always trained, like in middle school, I would always train with the high school football team. Um, the high school coaches, I was always familiar with them. Uh, I would do weights with them, like I said. And uh, all, during the off season, I'd go to a local gym. It was called Merch Gym over here in the town I live in. And um, there was a, 
I remember one day I was in there, and this is to your question: How did I, how did, how did I get into powerlifting? I, I knew nothing. I, I just knew I liked to bench press, and you know, everybody likes to bench press. I didn't really know. I knew about squatting and deadlifting, but you know, everybody asks about the bench press. Right? <laughs> and he goes, "Hey, excuse me, sir, how much, how much can you deadlift?" You know, and we'll get <laughs> but uh, I had uh, this guy. His name was Travis Fletcher, and this guy was he was maybe about six foot four, three hundred and ten pounds, and you know, at the time, I think I was a seventh, I must have been in seventh grade. I must have been 13 years old, 14 years old. I think I was 14 years old, something like that. And uh, I remember I saw this dude walk in, and it was the biggest human I'd ever seen to date. I was like, what in the, what the <laughs> fuck is that thing? You know, like, and, and how do I look like that? So, you know, I remember I'd seen this guy, and uh, I was kind of, I was kind of chicken to talk to him. So, you know, one day I came back in, and this guy, the same guy, Travis, he had a bench press shirt on one of those old Karen's denim bench press shirts. I remember Karen Klein. Uh, so I was like, what is that thing? You know, I want, I seen 500 pounds on a bench press bar and, and that blew my mind. I couldn't, I was, I didn't think that was humanly possible at the time. Here's me benching two plates thinking that, you know, like, you know, I'm hanging with adults, you know, I'm benching two, two plates, you know what I mean? So basically that guy, I basically had bugged him every time I saw him and he got sick of me bugging him. So he's like, all right, kid, I'll take you over to this place. Lo and behold, did I know that place was West Side Barbell, but I guess that's wow. it. So that's how I got into it. I saw, I, I just bugged the shit out of a giant guy in the gym and eventually got sick of me bitching at him and said, fine, you know, like, okay, I'll show you. Very cool. Very cool. Next question. Perfect. Yeah. Did you play any sports in high school? If so, which ones? Yeah, yeah, I played, um, when I was younger, I played basketball. I'm sure probably every kid starts out playing basketball when I was young. Um, and then I started playing football. I think I started playing football my first year. I always played peewee. I think I played like fifth or sixth grade. So I started very young playing football, contact sports. And um, I think that's probably what helped uh, set the foundation of what would lead to me being champion later on, like just in later in life, because I think those type of sports are really good foundations for um, building blocks in life, making you deal with adversity, not always being, not always winning, what happens when you lose, stuff like that, so, yeah. Totally. So I played uh, high school football, I played all the way up to I was a senior. Um, I didn't really have the grades to, to play. School did school was it like I shouldn't school just didn't really interest me. I mean like not that I wasn't a good student it just didn't interest me. Um, so yeah, sports did though, and um, Ohio State wanted me as a preferred walk on, but it was something that I basically would have to pay for school and go do it all myself. So it, you know at the time I was getting really good at powerlifting and I looked at uh, football and I kind of weighed them out and I just went the powerlifting route. How much did you squat, bench, and deadlift in high school as a freshman and as a senior? <laughs> I think as a freshman, and I don't see, it, it all happened so fast. I think when I was like a freshman in high school, I was around 200 pounds. And I was a fairly big kid. I always had like big bones. My dad's got really big bones, you know, like there's just my, my family just, you know, you see there's like, you know, I'm sure your family, they all oh, yeah. got big bones and they're just big lights. So that's kind of how all my family. But, um, shit, what was the question? It was how much Sorry. did you squat, bench, and deadlift in high school as a freshman and a senior? If you remember both of those. See, I don't really remember when I was a freshman, but I know I started doing powerlifting meets probably around my sophomore sophomore year. And I was probably 14, 15 years old. And I, in my first powerlifting meet, I squatted 700 pounds. 705, I think I benched 470, wow. and I think I pulled six. And uh, it was, I think I was a little over 200 pounds. Because if you ever watch the video, if you ever watch the West Side movie, you hear Bob telling me, you know, the kid told me he was going to outsquat me his first meet. And then he told me I was fucking crazy, but that was the time I went to my first meet and outsquat Bob my first nice. And I think that's what, like tied me and Bob to together. Like, this little shit did it. Like, okay. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, that's impressive, Dave. But when I was, I guess to end that, when I was, uh, I, what, I just graduated high school, so I mean, I, I was a year out of high school, so it was a teenage division. I think when I was actually in high school, I think I squatted 875 in a powerlifting meet. I think I was 17 or 18, and uh, 
think I benched in the high around six maybe. I think five eighties, and I think I pulled like a high six, low seven, seven hundred, something like that. So when I when I turned nineteen, that's kind of when I made that run for a thousand as a teenager. Yeah. So a year out of high school, I squatted a thousand, and I think I benched uh, six eighty or something like that, and I pulled seven fifty. It was like twenty four thirty total, and I was nineteen. So. I, I, I guess I, I guess, I guess we can get into that later. But that all that early success was a lot of due to the people that I was around. Like I was when I, because I was just a kid, man. When I, when I, they threw me to the wolves in Westside Barbo, and they treated me like a thirty-five-year-old man. I wasn't. They didn't care that I was a kid. They didn't. They didn't go any easier on me. In fact, they tried to go harder on me because they didn't want a kid in mm-hmm. there. You know what I mean? That's interesting. That is interesting. Was was that was there an intimidation factor training at that gym? I mean, with around intense individuals. Yes, very much so. Because, like I said, I was a kid, and um, I'm sure in most gyms, when a kid's in there, they you know, especially that place, they they just looked at me as like a, a waste of time, and um, basically you had to earn your right to be. They would give okay, they would give you a nickname. They. The thing was, is when you came to Westside, they just give you a nickname. They didn't say, hey, oh, what's your name? Nice to meet you. They went, what's your name? Oh, I don't give a fuck. Your name's, your name's Noodle now. And then you'd be like, all right, Noodle. And they'd, they'd fucking call you Noodle for, you know, your first three or four months being there until you did a powerlifting meet. And if you did good in the meet, they would be like, all right, Noodle, now you graduated to Alfredo or something like that. Like, like I don't know. You'd go up in the Noodle class from Noodle to something else. And... I guess what basically I'm trying to say is they give you a nickname and you would earn the, your, the, your right to be called your name. What was your nickname so, in the beginning, Dave? Do you remember? They called me right. Neutron because I used to have a little bit longer hair and my, my hair would kind of stick up a little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. Like uh, Jimmy Neutron. They call, me, they call me Jimmy. Yeah, they call me Jimmy Neutron. Uh, Bob Coe would call me Junior because, like, you know, I was just a little little guy. So, like, come on, Junior, let's do this. Come on, Junior, listen to Lou. Come on, Junior, this, Junior, that. So, Bob called me Junior, and, you know, Louie called me Sorry. Neutron. <laughs> like that nickname. All right. Um, next question. How much did you weigh in high school? You already pretty much answered that. I think you said around 200. Anything you want to add? Well, I gra- when I graduated high school, I was probably 235 Damn. pounds. Yeah. So I gained a lot of weight in high school. When was your first meet? How much did you squat, bench, and deadlift? My first meet, my first meet was actually a bench press only meet, and uh, here at the time we had some uh, meets were like few and far between. I mean, this is like early two thousands, maybe o four, o three, something like that. So you had your your local meets, and they were locally local meets, and then you had your nationals. So they went from like backyard meets to big meets like very quickly. So uh, we would always do this. Westside would always do a bench meet called the Circle Bowl Barbell Meet, and. Um, um, I benched 440 in that meet, and and Bob talks about it in the video. I I took Kenny Patterson at the teenage world record at 465, and uh, I took 470 on my third to try to beat Kenny Patterson, and I missed it, but I tried it. I got close with it, but anyway, yeah. So uh, I benched 440 in my first powerlifting meet. Um, I think I was 13, maybe or something like that. 13 or 14. It's been so long, I can't really remember. It's 14 probably, but. Um, uh, but in my first full power meet, that's when I out squatted Bob. I squatted like 705 pounds. I think I finished 470 because I came back and I beat Kenny. And then um, I think I pulled 600. So I think I totaled like 1775 or 1770 in my first power lifting meet. And that was uh, a little over 200 pounds. It was a 220 class. Wow. wow. Very impressive. Very nice. Not bad for that's a little bit. No, that's very impressive. It's huge. Especially for your first one, I'm not young. I mean, nowadays you got some teenagers doing that's some true. strength that's stuff. That's true. Just, just a powerlifting as a whole. I should, I should just say strength sports. I mean, people, everything from Eddie Hall and Thor to Julius. Uh, things happening. Yeah, like Julius Maddox. I was just getting ready to say that guy. Nuts. Like, boy, that guy's a kind <laughs> of like that's a yes. big human being, and the fact. That much power comes out of that big of a human being is pretty yes. damn impressive. Yes. Very. 
So what is your training split? Like what days do you do? What lifts, you know, speed squat, speed bench, max deadlift. How do you organize that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My entire, like I've trained one way that my entire career and it's been, um, it's been rooted in the West side conjugate system. You know, I, I was there for almost 18 years, so that's all I've done. You know, aside the whole, I guess I should say the bread and butter of my training is that like I have uh, Sunday is a speed bench press day for me. Uh, Monday would be a max effort lower or deadlift day. Uh, Tuesday is an off day for me. Uh, Wednesday would be my max effort bench. Uh, Thursday is an off day. Friday's a uh, dynamic lower or squat day. Saturday's off. So basically, you just have 72 hours in between your max effort upper and your speed so my, 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 my speed day is a Sunday for bench press and max effort squat. Prepping for your, and it's literally been that, and it's literally been that way for my entire career. Like I've, there was a stint when I when I trained with Chuck that I was training on like Tuesdays and Thursdays, but that was for like six months. So for basically my entire career, it's been that same stint. Okay. Mm -hmm. It ain't broken. That's right. Oh, for sure, it's yeah, working for you, obviously. Yeah. So. Wheels keep turning, right until That's they right. fall yep, off. There you go. There you go. Prepping for your competitions, what does your diet look like? Man, I sure, I, Ryan, you I know, know what told this me. is. It, you, you eat by blood pressure. You're like, okay, what's my blood pressure? I can eat more sodium. You know what I mean? Like, oh no, my blood pressure is too high. I should probably not eat those little Debbies. You know what I mean? Like, there, it's no secret. We're not here yeah. to look at me like, I mean, I, I, I eat a lot of red meat. You know what I mean? I guess. We'll get into my Scott Mendelson questions yeah. later, but like, I learned like you know brown rice and brown rice and turkey, yeah. bro. <laughs> I love Scott. Scott, if you're watching, I love you, and he knows right. it's all a good fun. But I got a good. I'll be doing. You know, that'll probably go on throughout this entire okay. live stream. How, we expect so, it. Yep. How, mu how much? How yeah. much red meat do you uh, eat a day, Dave? Oh, good God, dude. If if the old Meyer has those T-bones or ribeyes on special, I'll buy really? them all. So It's not, yeah, man, it's not, if, if I can eat, if I might eat red meat every night. It just kind of depends on what, what, what I can get when, but the vast majority eat a lot of ground turkey. I eat a lot of, like, uh, you know, ribeyes and stuff like that, big ones, you know what I mean, I eat a lot. Um, but pretty much ground turkey, red meat, um, um, I like some fish here and there, but it's kind of like you don't really nope. get full water. So, We're, if, if you're trying to you know, shrink your your midsection, fish is probably the way right. I would right. go. But Not. It's nothing. It's nothing exciting. It's just every because at the point that I'm at, it's most. I'm just trying to eat everything to whatever sounds good in, in a lot of it. Okay. What's the heaviest you've ever gotten up to in body weight? I mean, I'm sure you got with with wearing powerlifting gear. You know, I know Scott Mendelson would always say if you put on five pounds, you know, he couldn't touch in his bench shirt. So do you, do you have to dictate your body weight gain by, by your equipment and yada, yada, yada? Or, or, or can you get up to 300 and... Well, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a funny story because this is in the next, uh, um, this, uh, the next project Michael's working on um, is another powerlifting documentary. It deals a lot about with the WPO and... Um, Kind of in the beginning of it, um, I go out to, to Big Iron and I do a full power move to try to squat the biggest squat of all time, 1273 yeah. at the time. And it was in like March when I went out there. And um, I was real big. I was like 304, 305. And um, I wanted to go super heavyweight to take Matt Smith off the board. And I'd never been super heavyweight. So I was like, whatever. So I remember I went and I was out at Big Iron and uh, I went to the weigh in. And fucking Mike Taylor, God love him, I get on the scale and he looks down and, you know, I, I had my shoes on and it was like, I, I wasn't even super heavyweight. And he's like, well, bud, you got to take your shoes off. I was like, take my shoes off, man. Like, so I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not super heavyweight. So long story short, I ended up pounding an entire gallon of water, which weighed about like six pounds or something like that. I forget how much, but I pounded it and I got on the scale and I weighed like 311 or 312. And uh, it was the most, um, for, I mean, I'm not a tall person. Right. You, you met me. I, I'm like to your shoulder. I'm like a little, a little, a little cage. <laughs> so uh, 
I uh, I went to get my so to that point I, I put my we went to the meet and I was warming up in the warm up room and I was like dude I am fat as fuck dude like I don't know how this is like I don't everything just felt I just felt like my head really? was gonna explode so I remember I went out I went out and I was at 1173 and I went down the hole and missed it because basically like I all I, I have I was wearing 275 gear wearing being 200 and, or 312 pounds and it was a no bueno a no go situation. So I remember I did that, and I went up to 1273, and I just went down the hole and just just lost it. You know what I mean? I had an oxygen machine on, and it was just real bad. Oh, it was terrible. So the biggest I ever was was 312, and yes, it was terrible on my gear. None of my shit fit, which is probably why I'm not 312 right now. So, so for, per the gear that I have, those body weights are not conducive to me. Gotcha. What type of music do you listen to when you train? Okay. Oh, well, see, like, this goes back to, like, West Side. I remember uh, when, I, when I was a kid in there, you were only allowed to listen to, uh, I remember Gritter would come out. You don't always see Gritter in the documentary, but a lot of people know who Gritter is. He's just this angry old man, and him and Lou would, would constantly fight to the point of fisticuffs uh, most days. Wow. Um, but uh, Gritter would... Uh, would only allow you to listen to ACDC and Metallica, and if you came in and listened to anything else, you'd come out and break the CD and throw it in the middle of the gym. <laughs> Don't play this fucking shit gym anymore. <laughs> and like, he'd just break, break your CD and throw it in the middle of the gym. I was like, okay, well, I guess we're listening to ACDC and Metallica. <laughs> for the longest time, for the longest time, all I was able to listen to was ACDC and Metallica, but you know, that goes into, like, you know, Six Feet Under, things that I like, hate breed, stuff like that, you know, good stuff. Nice. I don't mind, I don't mind a little yeah. Tupac here and there. Same. A little bit of that old school. So he likes I'm that down too, with that. Yeah. He can get into that as well. It's good pump. It is. Sense, you know what I'm saying? Get Especially pump. on bicep day, Dave. Get the pump. <laughs> Well, you know what? I never did biceps because I figured if I didn't have any, I could never tear That's them true. off. So, There's some logic. There, it might not be good logic, There's but some it's some. Up. True. Um, kind of a random question here, but do you use do you use pre workout? If so, which which one's your favorite? Oh yeah, like so, like I'm not sponsored by this company, or like I don't have a dog in the fight, but I think they have good products. It's Redcon One. Um, they make uh, something called Total War, and that's a good pre-workout. They have something else called Moab, which has, I believe, HMB in it. So it's just muscle building stuff, and it's good to stack them. And I like it primarily because, dude, I hate jittery stuff. I don't like stuff right. that makes my heart race and makes me and fluttery and shit like that. So, uh, you know, those are things I use, and I don't and I don't use pre- I only pretty much use pre-workout on one day, and it's my speed bench press day, because that's when I do all the bodybuilding stuff and I get a pump. I'm not really looking for a pump when I'm trying to bench press max weights because, you know, then you turn into a fucking mm -hmm. marshmallow. You can't, you know what I'm saying? I pretty much just take pre-workouts for uh, speed bench press. Okay. okay. And you like the Redcon um, Total War? Yeah, Redcon One. I also like, uh, what's another good one? Um, the Inno Explode. I guess that's the mm -hmm. BSN. Yep, that's a good one too. like that one. Those are just stuff that I like. I like to get anything that gives me a really good pump because that's really what I go for on the speed bench first days. I'm of the opinion that if you don't get the pump, you don't grow. And if you're not growing, what the fuck are you doing? No. Okay. All right. Have you suffered from any injuries in your powerlifting career, and how did you recover from those injuries? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't. Well, I don't. I, I don't want to call them. I don't think I had any catastrophic injuries. Like I never had any. Like I had like, you know, I've jerked my pec loose here and there. You know, we have some a little bit of bruising and stuff. Like fascia, mm -hmm. probably, but not actually any muscles. Um, I probably the worst one I had was uh, I think in 2013. Um, I was trying to. I was. I think I was at an APF Nationals in Baton Rouge. Gary Frank was running it. And uh, I. I don't know. You know what? Like. I didn't, you can probably test this. I was coming down, I had like a 970 bench press I was trying and I had, I basically had folded in on my chest rather than like bringing my chest up and I separated two ribs that come right off my collarbone. It stuck up like, it was, it was 
was all messed up. Yeah. So, and one of them, and one of them had come up out of my, out of, out of I basically I separated three ribs. And uh, Scott Mendelson at the time was like, bro. I was like, dude, I remember I set up off the bench and I thought I tore my, I thought I tore my whole pec off right here. Um, I was putting my fingers right here and they were just going into my chest like squishing. Like they were just squish, squish, squish. I was like, what the fuck is going on here, dude? And I, I like I said, I thought I tore my pec from, from here all the way off down here. I thought it was off. I was like, oh, I'm dead. I was like, ah, yeah. And then I was like, why the fuck can I breathe? Like, what the fuck? And, and then Scott's like back there going like, you know, if you ever see Scott sit on a bench, he's like, he's like bro. He's like, bro. He's like, your ribs sticking up in the back. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean it's sticking up in the back? He's like, it's like out, bro. It's out. And he's like, He's like, he's like, lay down on the bench. So I was like, lay down on the bench. So I was like, fuck, dude. Like, do I, if I let this shit stay there and swell, it might not ever. Dude, if you ever have rib problems, if you don't, like, set them immediately, you will have rib problems for the rest of your career. Like, it's the most fucked up thing. Because I had it for years after that. Like, it, like, and even then, I can, like, my ribs will pop if I push on my chest and shit. But it's a long story short. Scott, Scott Mendelson, I laid down on the bench flat. And uh, he's like, take a big deep breath, bro. <laughs> and he took his big fat, he took his big fat calcified Mendy elbow, and he and he put it right on the one that was uh. sticking up, and he jumped up and put all of his Mendelssohn chunk right down on my shit, and it and it did the trick. It was one of the worst pains I ever felt. Felt like somebody took a hot poker and jabbed me right in the chest. Wow. That was probably the worst one, and that, that took a long time to kind of get right because when you're putting bench press shirts on, you just have to kind of like, well, if it goes, it goes type thing. Like, here we go. Uh, probably another bad one I had was um, this was more of a of a wear and tear injury. Since I'm a I pull sumo, so I'm, I'm you know I'm a wide stance deadlifter. You know I'm a wider stance squatter, and. Um, I just had years and years of external rotation, constantly pushing my knees out. I started getting uh, scar tissue built up in my right hip. And what that started doing is, uh, as the scar tissue started building up, it started uh, impinging uh, nerves. So I would start getting like nerve packs. Scar tissue start packing around nerves. And it was causing my, my right leg to atrophy. It just wouldn't work. I remember like I'd walk out on the platform, I'd put my leg on the ground. And like my quad wouldn't collapse, you know, I just felt like my leg was dead. So um, I thought that was the one that I just didn't know how to come back from um, until I'm until Donnie Thompson goes Hoster. That's why I love Donnie. Me and Donnie are super close, and that's where I got introduced to body tempering. And I would say Donnie Thompson is probably what saved my powerlifting career up until that point. Like. Um, it basically nutshell donnie had showed me some exercises he set my hip and basically broke i remember he did he he had set me on my back and he had put on my my knee was up in the air and he was putting all his weight down on my knee and my, my ass cheek was being pushed into a concrete floor and if anybody knows donnie the guy's 350 pounds so he starts turning my leg and all of a sudden he turned my leg in and he goes pop 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 and i remember like these just felt like a lightning bolt went all the way down from my ass cheek to my my heel and it was like that was the day my leg woke back up. So whatever he did, um, he would roll me with all his um, his ex-wives, he calls them, and he has ex-husbands, and he has all these crazy little names for his body temporary devices. But um, yeah, that, if, so if anybody's got like I, so IT band problems, so that's basically what happened. It was ruining my IT band. So I thought it was an IT band, but it was my hip. So basically, long story short, uh, I had a nerve issues in my hip and that's what fixed it was donnie thompson okay. so. Okay. Nice. and so many words, i guess all right outside of the gym what do you like to do what are some of your hobbies well i do enjoy naps <laughs> i get up pretty early i'm probably up 5 a.m every day and you know i'm at work by six so i try to i work outside all day long so i try to get out before the heat gets real hot so I get in before the sun comes up and I'm in before it's the hottest part of the day. That's kind of my, my thing. But well, so naps, um, um, my girlfriend has a horse, so we have, uh, she's got a thoroughbred horse. So we, we always, uh, that have our hands tied with her. So she's an ex race horse. So that's pretty cool. A lot of, a lot of work goes into a horse, but it's pretty, it's pretty relaxing. You know what I mean? I enjoy it. 
I teach her tricks how to stop a fucking that. foot and piss on everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good thing to teach a thoroughbred because a thoroughbred horse is like uh, they're very. Uh, it, if you if you know anything about bulldogs, they're gamey. You know what I mean? They like to fight. Well, they're spunky and they they they're just they're like the they're like the pit bull of the horses. So they're they're very temperamental. They don't they don't like to they they like to do what they want to do and. She wants shit now. Boom! Stop! Just uh, so she's a crazy horse. Headstrong, kind of. So that's something I enjoy. I like to, I like to go fishing a lot. So anytime I'm in the coast, you know, I was just out in Long Island. And my buddy Vic, he's got a boat out there, and we were out there. I, got, I think I got there Thursday. Me and my Alex Kovach buddy on my team, we drove. Uh, uh, we drove nine hours from Columbus to Merrick, Long Island, and we got right into the car, got into his car, and went right to the boat, and got on the boat until the sun went. So I like to go out on, uh, you know, inlet fishing, deep water fishing, any any kind of any kind of fishing I enjoy, stuff like that. Same here. Yeah, we enjoy doing that too. Absolutely. Oh, I like this one. What is your favorite moment in your powerlifting career? Well, you know what? Um, this was actually not a not a not a hard one to answer for me. To be honest with you. Probably the meet I just did. They're the not the meet you guys saw me at, but the 2019 uh, WPS Super Finals where I total 3103. Um, it was on ESPN. It was just a when I woke up that morning. It was a very. It was just something in the air that day. I don't know. I can't really describe it. Ryan, you can probably attest to it. Like when you just know something oh, great's yeah. gonna happen. Um, the, it was just a different meet. Everything about this meet was just that meet, I should say, was just different. Um, how the meet went, ran, it was going to be a five hour long meet. And I think we went through it in like four and a half hours or something like that. And most meets are eight and nine hours long. So, like, it just had a different feel to it. Uh, and to go out on the biggest stage in powerlifting in history, you know, powerlifting's never been on ESPN, it's been on CBS Sports, like, there's been clips of it, but an actual powerlifting meet being streamed on ESPN has never happened. So to to go out on a stage like that and not shit down my leg was pretty good and memorable. Very cool. Very cool. There's a little bit of pressure. Oh, oh yeah. I bet. <laughs> I bet. Well, I got a question about that, Dave. Did they rush your war- your warm ups? Uh, being at a five hour meet, I mean, it moved pretty quick then. Well, here's what they did, and this is this is where I think uh, really. I want to call it pro powerlifting. This is where I think they're making really key good changes. They didn't start the meet until noon, one o'clock. You know what I mean? It was something like that. So, you know, I'm I know I'm up at eight, you know, seven o'clock. You know, most meet days, and I I got through. I got to go eat, uh, walk around, get my blood moving through my body. I was awake when I started warming up, so I was there like. You know, let's see, it started at noon. I was there at 10, 30, 11, and I started warming up. And then the first flight, we had a first flight of the ladies that went before all the men. And um, I think that's how it went, yeah. So, you know, I could get there before. They had five monoliths in the warm-up room, and every monolith oh, wow. was the same. So you could, yeah, you could get on your monolift. And it was just, a, it was a really, it just felt like the first pro meet, like a real pro pro meet. It was, it was pretty sweet. Was there a... Was there an added uh, excitement, being that there were cameras there? Well, here's the thing, man. So, so ESPN was there. They had, they probably okay. had one. So they had cameras everywhere. I'm sure if you watch the ESPN broadcast on that's on YouTube, um, we had ESPN. All the ESPN cameras were basically at the entrances going on to the platform. They had a, they had a big camera that was on. Um, on a big scaffolding in the back that would shine down to the front and then they had the van outside and, and I'd never seen so many fucking wires <laughs> running out of stuff. Um, they had dudes with microphones, ESPN microphones walking around so you'd walk to the back and they'd be like, tell us this, that, and the other and I'm just like, eh, you know, like, you know, you when you lift weights, you can't talk to anybody after that. You can't, you're just trying to like regain your composure. Right. But, uh, what was cool is we were also filming for the the, the next documentary Mike was working on, and um, so we had basically whatever the ESPN cameras didn't pick up, Michael's camera crew would catch right where the ESPN cameras came off. They were kept receiving like passing passing a baton right. off, 
So when I would go in the back warm-up room, those cameras would be all over me. And when I crossed onto the platform, it was all ESPN cameras. So uh, I think Michael told me, he says, he says, dude, I don't think you understand this. This, this is the most, this will be the most viewed world record of all time. Like, and I should say me. Uh, specific to me, that's the most filmed, most angles, you know what I mean? Like, it was just, it was just really cool to be a I part understand. of it, you know, it was totally. real, you know, I, I had hung on, you know, the WPO was one of the reasons that I got into powerlifting, and it was one of the reasons why, um, you know, that I, I thought that was the pinnacle, that was the stage, and as soon as I qualified for it, you know, it went away, so I just went my whole career up into that point, wanting that, that moment, I just had never had it yet. So to have like everything I wanted and more wrapped up into this big giant snowball and then to have success on the yeah. day, that was a really cool moment for me. Don't mean to interrupt you, Dave, but we lost you on camera. You, did, did you do something? Oh. I, I don't, I, I see your shoulder. It's like you got zoomed in a little bit. Is there something on my end? I guess if you scoot over, I can see your head. Hold okay. on, hold on, I'll try it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you did something on your end. I didn't do anything over here. That's uh, okay. I got now. Nah, there you go. Move it over to, so I can see. I get. I don't see you. I, I see. This way. Now I see you. Now you're moving in. A little bit more. There you are. That works. Hey, oh yeah. Again. Okay. <laughs> oh. oh, you got a friend. <laughs> this yes, he is a he is a piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> you see yourself, Dave? Yeah, I can see. Okay. Myself. I can't see myself on your thing but can you guys see me well now? i can't see your chin i see your i see it's everything like, but your 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 mouth and your chin if you could angle like your camera totally down uh, other way <laughs> if <you> go, <laughs> up higher so, sit up higher there you go that's good we got you here i'm gonna zoom in a little bit is that better oh dave that's perfect yeah right there that works we got your whole head in there now dave <laughs> now we see it all <laughs> that works excellent <laughs> Oh, that's intense, man. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so we just talked about your favorite moment in your powerlifting career. <laughs> now I want to ask, what's your least favorite or, like, your worst moment in your powerlifting career? Oh, man. I already know this one. The worst moment in my powerlifting career was when the first time I had tr I qualified for the WPC Worlds. It was in Las Vegas. And um, I went to my first APF Nationals, and I remember I totaled like 29.21, and um, I broke the all-time world record at 275. And everyone, up until that point, I had not really lifted in the APF. So uh, everybody told me that when I went to a real federation, I was, you know, I was going to lift X amount of pounds less, or uh, since I got legit judging, I wouldn't do these certain numbers. But I actually went to the meet and got a five-pound PR total. So nice. Nice. I went to the APF. I I built. I had a bunch of steam going into this. Uh, I totaled twenty nine twenty one, and I was like, "I'm going to go to the WPC Worlds. I'm going to total three thousand. It's going to be great." You know what I mean? And I flew all the way to Las Vegas. I remember I got in the warm up room and just everything, everything fell apart, dude. Like everything just, it, you know, that was one of my first meets ever really traveling, um, going through like a time change. So they were just weird variables I'd never dealt with, and. Um, and in some sense, or some sense or another, I let that shit get to me a little bit. Just, you know, experience it. You get caught up into new things. And um, yeah, I bombed out. So I, oh. went to, I went all the way to Las Vegas. And I, that's, the whole, that's the whole point of it. I bombed in the squad. Oh, no. and, uh, and then I remember I got completely shit-faced that night. And we were all out. And uh, we, didn't, we weren't watching the clock and didn't know what time it was. And I remember Bob Coe goes, hey, dude, don't you have to catch a plane? I was like, what time is it? You know, because when you get in them stupid, them stupid fucking casinos at Las Vegas, you don't know what time it is after a while. Well, we had been in there all night, and my plane was leaving in like two hours, and, and it was time to go to the airport. So we went from the bar to the airport, and lo and behold, I had a middle seat <laughs> between, between two large individuals. So I was completely shit-faced, grabbing the, the tray table, just trying to stay in the center as best I could. Oh man! Wow, so that that was probably my worst my worst power lifting. I would say my worst memory. That wasn't a good time. Oh man! Yeah, it sounds rough. It sounds rough. Yeah. It was... <laughs> um, 
when you first started out, what lifters did you look up to? Oh, I would say probably the very first one was Chuck Vogel. Because I remember uh, when I first got to West Side, I never saw Chuck. But I always see people talk about him. Chuck this, Chuck that. And I was like, who's Chuck? You know what I mean? Like, and uh, we're going to go watch Chuck. I remember when we all would go to the Arnold, it was all about watch Chuck. <laughs> So we would go get breakfast, and then we'd get there early, and, they, and then all the guys that were of merit would go back in the back and help Chuck warm up. And when this dude walked out, fucking chewing, tried basically chewing the squat bar off, I was like, I want to be like that guy, you know? Like, so uh, Chuck was a big one. Uh, Gary Frank was a big one. Actually, Ryan here was, was a big <laughs> Thank one. Thank you, Dave. Very cool. Very cool. I remember the first time I saw Ryan, I want to say it was 05 or 04. I'm going to say it was 05, the Arnold Bench Bash for Cash. I believe you had the nice, the nice mutton chops. I had chops. the chops, <laughs> yes. Had the nice chops. Um, and I think you benched 903 or something like that. You were in a Ray Jacks, the last thing how I remember this stuff. But uh, I remember you went like this because you didn't like something in the crowd. That's right. Yeah. You, were kind of, you were like, you were like, just. You know, like, that, yeah, that was, I was like I like yeah and I liked your insatiable bleeds yep so that's why if you see in the gym we got that big banner of you bleeding yeah so cool <laughs> yeah so Gary Frank was probably another one I really looked up to Gary Frank because he was one of those guys that was the, the, the paving the way lifting the biggest so I was always a fan of him but yeah those are pretty pretty okay. much the most important. okay now, what are your favorite accessory exercises for the squat, the bench, and the deadlift? Oh, <laughs> Maybe just pick one of those. Yeah, yeah. For the squat, um, well, that's a good question. The bench press, I'll say probably a skull crusher or a tricep rollback. Any kind of like dumbbell tricep rollback, I do a lot of that shit. Dude, we do all the same yeah. stuff, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, I mean, if anybody's heard Ryan talk, it's, there's, all the guys at the top pretty much do the same shit, like, but it's, like, a little different, they say it differently, you know what right. I mean? So, uh, I do a lot of skull crusher stuff, any kind of, um, single joint exercises, you know, when you're, when you're isolating muscle groups, um, so a lot of skull crushers I do, a lot of tricep rollbacks, and I change the angles on them a lot, so sometimes I'll incline them, sometimes they'll be declined. Uh, sometimes we'll put bands on them. Sometimes we'll put chains on them. We'll just change the variation. Um, as for squatting, like on squat days, like since I box squat so much of my volumes done in the actual box squatting, where I don't do a ton of accessory movements. But you know, uh, I do a lot of my belt squats uh, for it, for any kind of like uh, speed lower stuff like that. Any kind of belt squats, belt squat stands, belt squat holds, we'll tread walking in a belt squat, that kind of stuff. It's like. That's that. That's the kind of stuff that I do for accessory movements. I really, I mean, I'll throw like uh, you know, we the quad extensions and stuff like that. But for the most part, it's that kind of stuff. Okay. okay. Uh, I like to do a lot of rowing stuff for deadlifting. You know, I like to double overhand deadlift a lot. People say like, what do you do for traps? Like I, don't, I personally don't really ever do traps. I just double overhand deadlift a lot. I use that grip for any of the deadlift. Do you do a, so can you see? Are we still good? Um, um you could sit up a little higher. You can, when you it's there, it's kind of not really centered. It's kind there. of weird, but your face is perfectly centered right there. But when you leaned over, okay. yeah. but it keeps kind of like just, changing. No. Like there's something a little bit going on. Yeah, but. that looks good right there, Dave. If you could just sit right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure that like I'm not like my like you don't have like my eye. <laughs> yeah, we had that a little bit. We yeah. kind of had half of your uh, But face. I don't want to interrupt <laughs> you. So after you're done speaking, I'll say, Dave, move over this way, move over that way. But you're you're perfect right there. Okay. You're perfect right there, man. <laughs> All right. Okay. What's well, like, like close? If there's some way to zoom out or something. It's kind of it's it's close on your face, but I think we can live with that. I mean, like this view here is. We can find that. Oh, there you go. There you go. You're doing something. Yeah. That that better. That's better. Now, if you, all right. Well, I zoom out as much as I now can. Now, if you can move over one direction, um, <laughs> uh, nope, other direction, other way, other way. There you go. Right there, oh, Dave. Oh yeah, there. Oh, a little too far. A little too far. <laughs> other way, right there. There you go. <laughs> sorry, I know this is super annoying. Hey, I'm sorry. sorry. There but you look. Good now. You look no, great this, now. The next time this happens, there will be no delay, and I'll just know where. Okay, perfect. So. <laughs> you look good right there, Dave. You're don't, good now. Don't touch. Don't touch <laughs> any buttons. <laughs> Okay, um, 
what is your favorite most fun meet that you've ever done? Which I think you've kind of. Uh, I'll probably say that that WPO. WPO Super Fun. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just because it was on TV and it was real TV, it was it was the real thing. Like everything about it was ESPN. Like you had sideline guys. Like after you come, the people would talk to you. It was just it was just a very unique experience. Yeah. It was really cool. That sounds really cool. That's very very awesome. Um. What is something about you that would surprise people? Uh, I'm not. I'm not like mean. <laughs> For some reason, I think since I, since I'm seen assaulting uh, <laughs> gen, old gentlemen on a various uh, television platforms, <laughs> that people think I'm like mean. A lot of people think I'm taller. I get that a lot. Like you're a lot. You're a lot shorter than I thought. I'm like, well, you know, years of 1,200 pound squats don't make me any taller. Right. <laughs> Doesn't help your case. What is one of your favorite West Side stories? Mm, oh, there were, uh, let me think here. I know there's probably a bunch there's of probably them a bunch that come of them. to mind. Yeah, it's like, I don't know which direction And you can going. share more than one, too. You can tell us a couple of West Side stories. We all love West Side stories here. Um, I remember this one time there was this, uh, back in the day we'd always get these visitors, and this is more of a Louis story. Louis was, uh, Louis was a lot more spunkier back in the day. You know, with any with age, you know what I mean. And you're you're not going to say you, you just as back in the day, Louis was a handful. Uh, so he had, we would always get these visitors. This one coach had come to the gym and was just giving Louis shit about all the training we did, about box squatting, just being very contrary to Louis. And Louis and like like the guy was just coming to the gym and Louis was giving him his time basically. So it got to the point where this guy had said something. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it, uh, uh, he told him that his training only worked if... It, I don't remember what he said, but it pissed Louie off. And I remember I looked over, Louie had grabbed it. Has anybody watched WWE Wrestling and watch uh, Mankind? He, like, grabbed the dude by the back of his head and grabbed him in his mouth and, like, picked him up and then choke slammed him. And Louie's like a 63- or 4-year-old man, and this dude is probably 30 years wow. old. So this is ripping this dude up and tossing him on the ground starts kicking him and telling him to get the fuck out of his gym. Whoa. So that was a funny story. Um, Louis doesn't like cameras. I remember one time uh, we were in there filming and it was the day that Louis doesn't really come in and he had just come in and saw the cameras and he'd slam the door like in disgust. You know, like, I'm going to let you know I don't like these cameras. Stop you know, like, um, I've seen a lot of people puke. Um, that the uh, that's that's kind of a, probably a given. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. There's there's a lot of a lot them. Of good ones. None that I can think of offhand, but I'm sure as we go on, if I remember, we'll tell. Okay. Sounds good. Perfect. Who do you think will be the future of the sport? Is there anybody you see up and coming oh, that you just? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think there's so many areas of the sport now that. Um, it kind of depends on what area it's in. In multiply, um, it's kind of, I would say it's kind of up in the air because multiply is kind of just a version of the sport that just takes a really long time to progress and be good at it. And when you're a kid, you, you know, it's, so in one sense or another, um, that's a good question. Yeah. I know some of the, they're just, I'm, I'm going to be biased here. Some of the guys on my team are really young. Like, uh, there's a guy named Alex Kovach. He's, I think he's 20, 20, just turned 22. And he's got a, he's got the world record squat at 165. So he squatted 903 at 165. And he just did 1,010 um, on a chain squat in the gym. So, you know, it wasn't a full depth squat by any means, but the little fucker can, is 180 pounds and he's handling 1,000 pounds. So it's like, um, there's a few guys on my team that if they stick with it and they, they get through the hard parts of uh, not having success immediately and um, taking your growing pains and um, there's a few guys out there that I think that can that have a lot of potential um, so I'll, that's actually what I'm looking for so if there's anybody out there that thinks they have potential I'm always looking for the next best guys is it is it hard for you to get people to come in the gym and want to do what you do? I mean, I know here 
people see the bands, the chains, and it looks like fun. And then we invite them in. And then they find out it's work. They find out it's commitment. And then they, they lose interest. Then they find out there's pain involved. And, it, it, you know, that, that's what I deal with out here. Like I tell my guys, there's nobody's lining up at the gym to come in and do what we do. Um, and I'm not a three-lift lifter. My other guys are. But, you know, it's, um, that's what I deal with out here. But uh, it takes a special breed, I think, of person to uh, come in and, and fulfill this and, 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 and commit to it for an extended amount of time. So do you, do you have people lining up in, in Ohio? Uh, oh, that's the thing. Yeah, yes and no. There's a lot. I get a lot of people that always want to come train. There's people that ask about, you know, wanting to join the team and stuff like that. But there's like a vetting process that I always that, that you have to go through. Just for me personally, like uh, I don't, I don't, I don't need somebody that's a black hole that's going to take away from the group as a right. whole. I need somebody that knows how to be a training partner, knows how to load plates, knows how to spot, knows how to coach. Uh, that I don't have to sit there and tell all this shit to you know that you need somebody that's going to contribute, that's right. not take away. And so, and um, it's hard to find. Good help's hard to come by. So, uh, um, I'm you see me personally. Like I, I mean, I remember the times when I was squatting 1,200 pounds with my girlfriend running the running the rack and and a 50 year old man back spotting me. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm used to having no training partners. You get what I'm saying? So like. So having no training partners is almost better than having bad training That's true. partners. I think there's a second second part to that question um, down the down the line here about training partners, we'll, and we'll, we might, might touch on that again, Dave. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're right. There's another question that yeah. talks about training partners and how important they are. So that's here in another couple questions. The the millions of questions that we got here for you. We've got we've got more. Um, if yeah. if you had the opportunity to go back and do it all over again, would you change anything? And if so, what would it be? See, this is another spoiler. I wouldn't. I, you know, I think that I was fortunate enough to, to to make a lot of the most important decisions I made right, and I had a lot of good counsel around me. And I think that's. Um, I don't think I could have done it any other way. I, don't, I mean, that's just me. I might be biased in that thing, but like, I think I, I probably had the best situation possible in terms of training partners and coaches and people that were looking out for my best interest mostly. Like people like Bob, they 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 didn't they didn't let me get hurt. They would always pull me back if they thought I was tired. They were they were looking out for me. That's good. They that's knew good. that if I got, if they knew if I got hurt that I would be done. Like most most times when people get that injury, that's it. I mean, most people don't, they, they get, they get that, you know what I mean? You're like, okay, well, that's, I'm good with that. You know, you know, once you tear a peck off, you know, you're like, I don't want to do that again. Right. So I was always sheltered from that. And I think that uh, if it hadn't been for the way that I was brought up, mostly I wouldn't have been the lifter that I am right. now. So, yeah, I don't think I would change anything. Okay. Weird as that sounds. Well, I mean, as much success as you've had, like you said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Don't try to fix it. It's it's working. It's working for you. Where are we at on the questions here? Right. Did you skip anything? No. Right here. Uh, yeah. I'm oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what are you? I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, sorry about that. Um, where do you see yourself in 10 years from now? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully, still in one piece. Yeah. Yes. You know? I, I've gone this far, so you know. Hopefully, in, in good health and in one piece, and no injuries. Um, my whole thing is, uh, when I wanted to walk away from the sport, I wanted to walk away on top. I didn't want to be one of those guys that was. Uh, I don't mean to bag on Chuck, but like I was, I looked at him and said I was not going to be like that. Meaning like. Chuck, Chuck was so beat down and so beat up, and he's had so many surgeries, neck fused together, back fused together, his, his back's caged, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, the guy can't look to the left. You'd say Chuck, and he's like this, you know? Oh, wow. He can't, um, he can't look in a rear view mirror, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I just was kind of like, I didn't want to, I was, if I was going to go out, it would be on top, and I, I wanted to walk away not being somebody that was you see it with UFC fighters too you know like Chuck Liddell it's like Chuck Liddell stop fighting yeah. you know what I mean you can't out. Right. it's like when you see your heroes and they keep lifting weights and they're not like you know what I mean it's it's so yeah I was 
I don't really remember what the question was, but um... it's about where you see yourself in the next ten years. Oh yeah, in good health and uh, hopefully, uh, I don't know about powerlifting in ten years because. I already have an extremely long training age. You know what I mean? Like I squatted my first thousand when I was 19 years old. I'm, I'll be 33 in December. Oh. So I've been I've been lifting weights a really really long time. Yes. So, and I've done and I've done probably anything anybody could want to do and then some and then some more. So it comes at a point of you know do how long do you want to uh, do you want do, how long do I want to keep putting my body through it, you know, you know, just to, to do things I've already done, so to say, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, there'll probably come a time. I, I don't really see it any time right. soon. I don't know how we're talking about, like, retirement here, but, um, you know. Okay, okay. Um, what advice can you offer new lifters that are just starting out? Oh, well, see, this this one I can attribute to, uh, Travis Mash told me this one, right? Um, I remember uh, I was a teenage lifter at the time, and Travis Mash was another guy that I looked up to, because he was a big-time WPO lifter. And he, was, he was one of the guys that was always winning the lightweights. So I said, you know, I asked him, uh, I asked him the same question, and he told me that, he said, powerlifting is a marathon, not a sprint. And I kind of took that to heart, and basically, you're, sometimes you'll have success quickly, and other times you'll have success rather slowly. And um, you just kind of have to know that it's it's not a how fast can you get success; it's you know, how fast can you la how how long can you last to get the success. Right, right. So sometimes it's a war of attrition, and that's where it goes down to people give up before uh, they get to that point. Sometimes. Okay. Um, is the WPO still on for October? Uh, from what I'm hearing, as far as I know, yeah. Um, um, Michael won't. Um, he usually doesn't say anything about ESPN or any kind of production things until the meet's coming up because just like the COVID thing in March, ESPN was slated to be at the Arnold and that all fell through, so stuff like uh, actually being announced there's there's plans to have it on ESPN I don't know 100% if it will but from my understanding it will still be on ESPN in October and I guess they're having it in 2XL powerlifting which is a 22,000 square foot gym right there that Eric Stone and uh, Howard Pendrins have that's a really sweet sweet facility they just moved into there so um, they'll have it all set up in there and um, He'll be filming. We'll be filming there for the, net, uh, the next uh, documentary. Thing. As far as I know, it's still okay. happening. Okay. Sure. Perfect. How important are training partners? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, um, I will say, at times I am an outlier because up until certain points, I always had good training partners, but there were times I didn't. For the most part, like. Especially when you're starting out and you're young, you need training partners and you need uh, to get with guys that have lifted weights primarily if you can for a long time. You know, don't go listening to the people that don't have scars and bruises on them because they probably won't tell you how to avoid the scars and bruises. You know what I mean? Yep. So um, your training partners, try, they're, they're the ones also that get you through the meat. You know what I mean? They're, they're your meat help. They're the ones that are handing you bench presses. That, Takes takes three guys to have me a bench press. So Brian, you, you same, know same there. Goes. Yeah, it, a lot of my uh, lifting can, is uh, made or broken on the day I show up, and if I don't have my usual three guys to hand off, then my workout uh, is uh, altered. You know, I can't really plan unless I have my my crew there. So uh, you know, a training partner is extremely important. And uh, I'm real hard on my guys. You know, I don't know about you, but you know, I have a philosophy. You know, you know, you don't miss a workout unless you're uh, dead in jail or in a hospital. Otherwise, be there on time. In fact, you should be there early. And I'm, I'm, I'm an asshole, I guess. So, but that, that I mean, that, I didn't get to the top by petting people between the ears, man. I got to the top by kicking people in the ass. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah, dude. That's the thing. You have to be that yeah. way. Um, you have to, you have to demand the best from them, so they demand the best from right. you. It's, like, it's kind of like a 
you guys, I, I feed off of my guys, you know, and especially Same. my help. So, because they're, they're the ones that are always there with me all the time. It's like we're all lifting it together. That's kind of like, you know, so. That's what. I know I kind of it's a, people say powerlifting isn't a team sport but like I probably with your training partners um, and when you have like especially I guess with a three man guy or somebody one of your guys back spotting you at a big meet you always kind of feel like you're lifting a person mm-hmm. well who were some of your favorite training par- partners throughout the years oh favorite training partners well Chuck was an interesting training partner really wasn't one of my favorite training partners because uh, Chuck, he would if you if you started hanging with him in a workout, he would just add something else. And then if you were doing like let's say you would be doing like skull crusher or something like that, you, know, you would get to rep number four, and he would say he would say four three more times. When you're like four, five, six, he would be like four, four, four. You know what I mean? Like so, like he would just he would just do any and everything to slight you and make you do more and try to get you to quit and. Sometimes that's not always the best thing. So, uh, Chuck was a fun training partner. Me and him always had good times. Uh, uh, Joe Bayless was probably another really good training partner of mine. Um, he was a, a 42 in the gym back in the day. He was a pretty strong guy that trained in the gym. Uh, Bob, Bob Coe was a good training partner. When he when I first got there, Bob Bob was kind of still in one piece. Right. And I remember... Uh, the reason that I was allowed to train with Bob it was because uh, I was gonna it was gonna be somebody easy for him to keep up with to come back from an injury. So I was like a little like a, a little bait fish to just and then it kind of just spun around the other yeah, way. That, it's funny how that turned out. Huh? Funny. Yeah. And ha- has Westside always had that mentality? If you miss a workout, you're out the gym. I mean, is that is that you don't? Um, when I first got there, like, I remember in my first four years there, like, I could count on one hand how many workouts I missed. Like, you weren't allowed to miss workouts. Right. Like, because like, when I first got there, uh, it was, uh, tw- uh, it, was around, it was like towards the end of when all the crazy dudes were having their last stint there, you know, like your Fuzzers, Dave Tate, and all those type guys, uh, like your Jimmy Richies. Uh, Rogerio. A lot of the old school. But you know, uh, Ruggiero, Jerio, like all them, all them guys. Um, I was coming towards the end of them, and uh, they they had that really, you know, if you watch the West Side movie, the, that beginning part of the movie, that that feeling, that's like how it really was uh, during that time. And as as West Side goes on, and as time has gone on, it's changed, you know. Like I I tried told somebody else, and uh, you know, nothing good lasts forever, and. Um, things just change, and as time goes on, Westside's gone through many different phases of how things are. Uh, they got away from when I was first there. It was uh, all balls to the walls. Uh, you can't miss a workout if you're hurt. Put some fucking tape on it. You know what I mean? Oh, you don't have tape. Get the fuck out of here. Like that. From that to like, oh, you're hurt. Well, fuck you for being hurt. But go sit over there and do a hyper. Like so, it went from like. When you're like, basically, I should say they just got smarter, you know, like they started de- learning how to deal with injuries better. So their training philosophies kind of adapted to that. They realized that going balls out all the time wasn't necessarily a good thing. Right. So, uh, you know, as time went on, just phases change and people get smarter. And um, um, they wouldn't, I remember when you would get there, if you were late, they'd lock the door. And uh, if you tried to open the door and you couldn't come in, you just that was it you just couldn't come in they'd be like they'd be at the door going like this you know like you should uh you should have you know come early so, i like i like uh, that traffic. they didn't give a fuck about traffic they didn't care about uh if you got fired at work they didn't give a shit i like that next question <laughs> West Side's six by six, eight by eight, ten by ten hypertrophy work workout. Do you incorporate that on speed days sometimes outside of a contest? Um, see, I never really got that far. I I would do five sets of five. You know, I'd do that kind of stuff. I really wouldn't get the in such high rep ranges, um, like ten sets of ten. I just felt that was excessive on me. And I think that was probably uh, in, in part to the weights I would handle, you know what I mean? Certain weights, you know, they tax your body and they tax your ligaments more than 
more than some of these other people, weights that people were lifting. So I probably doing things like that would weren't necessarily beneficial to me at the rate I was being broken down. Yeah, Louis Louis so, Spe- Louis speaks about that in his um, uh, speed bench, you know, as an alternative, and and I I've tried it a few times. I just didn't know if, if that was something that uh, you have ever done or uh, would con- would consider ever doing. I know it's it's extremely excruciating. The ten sets of ten are the worst, you know, of course. But I think I think uh, for somebody that's uh, um, coming up and coming through or new to the system, those are always good things to okay. try. Somebody like me, I, I wouldn't gear towards that. Something like um, um, maybe every fifth or sixth week of a speed bench press, I might do a five sets of five to kind of like reset the whole. Okay. Going from hands to chains or going switching a bar, you know what I'm saying? I might just throw five sets of five. But um, for the most part, okay. no. You know, I kind of, that's just me, though. You know, that's just my right. preference. Okay. I wanted to ask you that question, and I that's why I asked. So, okay. Okay. Can you outline your typical speed bench workout, exercises, sets, reps, and rest periods? Um, usually, it'll anywhere it'll vary anywhere between a ten sets of three to eight sets of three. Um, I, I always switch bars. Um, sometimes I'll stay on a bar for two or three weeks and I'll switch the bar. Um, um, if I'm on a straight bar, I'll change grips. It's usually nothing that's not in any of the West Side stuff. It's I usually follow that to a pretty much T. Okay. Things that I do different, um, I might use a little more bands or chains because I'm a heavier bench presser. You know what I mean? I get into choke purples and choke greens sometimes. Remember I, I remember you telling me about that. Um, so sometimes I'll get up, and that's just when I move closer to a meet. You know, when I'm stronger, I, I'll up band, I'll up the accommodating resistance, but. For the most part, it's always a three, eight sets okay. of three, nine sets of three around there. Um, bar weight, I usually don't ever go over 315 pounds on the bar with the bands or the chains. Um, me, uh, if when, if you want like a percentage to work off of, if you're a shirted bench presser, we, me and AJ Roberts actually came up with this because we used to, Louis used to say, you'd go off of, uh, you'd go 45% of your floor press, 50% of your floor press, and me and AJ at the time found that that was just too much. Okay. You know I mean, we, we weren't. It was like we were, we weren't we weren't moving the weight fast enough to get the that overspeed eccentric uh, feel from it. So I just felt like I wasn't getting explosive and getting fast. So I had to lower the body weight. So we went down to like 23% of your shirted right. max. So if I'm a thousand pound bench presser, you know, 230 pounds is about where I start with accommodating resistance. And that's just me. So. Um, you don't speed work. You don't have to go real heavy, and uh, it's about building uh, rhythm. Um, it's about building explosive power. It's about recruiting muscles, getting your brain to fire in a certain order. And that's just how I've always approached it. I'm not saying that there's that there's not more that it entails, or I'm giving you the full definition of it. But how I yeah. see it in my head, that's how I. Do I'm it. I'm really interested in the choked purples. I, I believe those, um, you know, are 180 pounds of band tension at the top at lockout. Plus the bar, which is 225 without a weight on there. Now you're talking about the choked greens. You've talked about those before. I um, mean, and, and I haven't tried those yet, Dave. Um, that that I don't know how many how much band tension that would be, or if I can. I have. I, I don't even know. I just knew that that was the next band. Okay. And you're still looking for. There's something like Tommy Thompson always said to me. He said, "There's some things in weightlifting that science can't explain. We just know that it works because we do it. You know what I mean? All so right. some things that we." don't know we just sometimes like that's that's you have to have a little bit of that in your training okay. like everybody's like this percentage this thing you know set in stone sometimes you just need to be like oh i don't know but we're doing this because it works so. well you know, you know dave that was one of the things you know i haven't been out to west side um since 2007 when uh the arnold um quit having the wpo out there and curing kidder and all that but uh coming out there this year i really wanted to come out there and see if there was something that i could take away from the west side visit and uh, I only got to speak to Louie for three 10 minutes, minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, and, and that was at breakfast. And uh, so I, was, I appreciate uh, letting me pick your brain while we were there. And uh, I'm just, you know, if, the, if there's something that you guys are doing that I'm not doing, it's definitely something that I want to incorporate in my training. So that's why I, was, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit on benching, you know, see if there's, you know, something, something yeah. I'm missing. Well, um. <laughs> I do a lot of rolling dumbbells, Dave, and I, and, uh, I really get the irritated... Uh, uh, inflamed extensors. You really have what do we call that? Um, you really have the calcium deposits on your elbows to prove it. Yeah, you see that? We 
The little slicer. Yeah, it's it's called the can opener, Dave. <laughs> yeah. I'll cut your fucking head open. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, have to get that taken off one day, huh? <laughs> Violent, that's something know. else I don't want. You know what I mean? So, that was, so people would always tell me, like, uh, do I go like heavy on accessories? And like, dude, I don't. Like, I just, I always thought that that would fucking give me pointy elbows. So let, let that be known. Yeah, let that be does. known, Dave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, thirty years that of doing this pointy, shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a witch's tit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, it's bad. Kinda, yeah. I, I'm proud of it though. I mean, it's pretty to look at. That's not. It's a badge of honor. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Thank you. I don't want to be embarrassed. Yeah, I've earned it. You've been in the shit. You have been in the shit. I've been in the shit. <laughs> I've been deep, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> been, been to hell and back almost, really. All right. I'll go ahead and go to the next question. Okay. Um, have you ever gone into the gym with a plan for the day on max effort, whether it be squat, bench, or deadlift, and we're mentally ready for war, but your body said otherwise. And what did you do? Literally, this happens like every three or four weeks. It's like, I'm going to do this this day, and we're going to go in. It's going to be great. And then I'll do I'll do a workout, and my whole body will be trashed. And I'll be like, I can't even, I can't get out of bed this morning, so we're going to do this next week. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, right, right. Yeah, that happens, that happens a lot. Um, I'm not one to really push the issue on things, because you got one body. That's you know right. What I, mean? I tell people. You have one body, you don't get paid millions of dollars to do this. It ain't like we're in the NFL here, you know nope. what I mean? Uh, I certainly have not received my pension check <laughs> from powerlifting. Uh, they do not, there is no powerlifting fund that gives me free health insurance. And uh, so I've kind of always been, uh, yeah, I just... Eh. Yeah, I was wondering if, if you had to come in there, and I mean, it's called listening to your body, and that's a smart thing to do. Yeah, I was always kind of of the, um, the, I always kind of lifted in the way that if I ever felt like something was off, it's like your gut feeling, you know, there's been plenty of times where I've gone and like, I'll pull a deadlift and I'm like, all right, I'll just do one more. And in, in my heart of hearts, I know I probably shouldn't, you know what I mean? And then I'll pull that deadlift and like tweak my hamstring. It's like, fuck, I shouldn't have right. done that. So, uh, I've there's listening to your body i've always pulled off early like i i always i always tell my guys sometimes just quit one early um you don't have to always take that last one there's always another workout like i said you don't get paid millions of dollars to do this or a bit, but we're all just lifting weights you know what i'm saying i got a, i got a question i want to throw in there um uh power lifting paydays um uh, back when uh, I was running the circuit in 2005, six, and seven, you know, it was Mendelssohn's meat was 5,000 bucks. The Arnold was 2,500 if you want it. And then bench for cash was 25, you know, and then, um, you know, meats like that. Um, I understand you went over to Finland with Tiny Meeker and uh, won some pretty good prize money over there. Yeah, uh, that was pretty awesome, man. I, so that was probably up until that point, up until the WPO, the Super Finals, where I told 3,100, I would say that bull farm meat was probably the sweetest meat I have ever really? done. The In Europe, I mean, you've been to, like, the Ukraine oh, yeah. and stuff. When you go to Europe, there is no, there's no, like, football over there. There's no, there's no like, sports. There, I mean, there is sports, but, like, they're sports. They're, they, they're, they're a culture of strength. You know they what are. I mean? They, they're, they're, their sports are powerlifting, you know, Olympic weightlifting. That's, like, their thing over there. So when I went over there, I was I was like treated like an NFL football. Like if I was, you know, Tom Brady walking into a bar, so they all know who you are there. Um, but Finland was pretty crazy. Uh, I think uh, first place was fifteen thousand euros, and I think it was about sixteen grand. Um, I remember I went over there at a nine thirty six bench opener. Uh, I barely did it, and uh, yeah, one bench press got me fifteen grand. So that was pretty sweet. Uh, I remember when I went when right before right the guy was screaming in Finnish. I don't remember what he was saying. I just knew he went Dave Hall, <laughs> and that's all that I knew. That I had time to go, and then like there was about three thousand people in the crowd. And they were all clapping at one time. It was it was just a crazy experience. And I, well, you know, so Finland was a wild ride. Uh, that was a good one. Yeah, lifting overseas in the Ukraine. You know, strength athletes are worshipped over there, Dave. I mean, for all the hard work we do to go over to the Ukraine. Mendelssohn, myself, and uh, Rob Lando back in the day, 
I mean, it was red carpet. It was paparazzi. We had to have security, and um, it was just um, it was just unreal to, uh, to go over there. And um, it's, a, it's a big change. It's a big change coming from here to where you're just like, oh, you know, people. You have fans here, yeah. but they're the appreciation is a whole different. It factor is. Like yeah. It's a, uh, it, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it, you go to, you go to meets, you know, you yourself, you know, everybody knows who you are. You, uh, you know, you're kissing ladies and holding babies. And then when I come, when, when I come back home, you know, I'm just the big guy pushing the cart at Walmart, you know, I mean. Yeah, exactly. You're, yes. Yes. You're that big mongoloid walking through Walmart at two in the pocket. And that's when I shop. Because you don't like, thank you. That's when I shop. I'm there. Like I go to like Meyer at 24 hour Meyer at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Cause I just don't like, to I don't people. either. Like I don't, I don't. I don't like people. Okay, it's no offense. Like I, I'm not. I'm not like mean, but you don't like, like normal people. I don't know how. To, I don't know how to explain to somebody that I bench. Hey, man, how much you bench press? I'm like, ah, I don't know. You know, I just, you know, I do. I do reps. I just tell my bench press 400 for reps. Like I don't. <laughs> I, but, you know, like I don't. I, I get off on it, Dave. You know, so they'll come up to me and they go, "Oh my God, how much do you bench?" And I'll like say, guess. "I'll say guess." And they're like and they're, 500. Up, 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 and then and then I get I get to 1,075, and they look at me like I'm bullshitting them. And then my and, and then my my agent here whips out the YouTube videos and proves them wrong. That's the thing. I can't do that. Like I, I can't just be like here. But I don't. I don't. It's like I get to where I'm like defending myself. Yeah. They're like, no. I'm like, okay, I don't do that. Like I just that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to explain. I understand. Yeah, totally. All right. Let's, yeah. let's move on. Next okay. question. Are naps or power naps during the day an essential part of your, your training and recovery? Yeah, they are, really. Like I said, um, most times during the summer, uh, I start, I'm up when the sun's up. So, you know, I probably work from, you know, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then I probably sleep from 3 to three to five and then I get up and then I'm probably in the gym by six and I'm usually there two, three hours. Rinse and repeat. Yep. Nice. What's the best advice lifting wise anyone has ever offered you and who was that person? Uh, lifting, it's probably lifting a hard advice. Thing, uh, well, it was probably Gary Frank. And it was one of the most vague statements anybody could ever say to me. Now, if you've been around Gary, you know Gary's like the god. Yeah. Hey, Dave, Dave, how you doing, Dave? Uh, uh, you know, sometimes if you want to lift the big weights, Dave, you, you just got to take the big weights. You know? <laughs> just, just gotta lift. I'm like, Gary, what do you mean I got to lift them? He's like, you need to get on there. You just got to go lift them, Dave. You just got to try them. And I'm like, okay, Gary, like, I'll do that. Like, so basically, like, some, he was telling me, to grab your nuts and lift big weights. If you want to lift big weights, you got to lift big weights. If you want to bench 1075, you got to hold 1075. True. If you want to squat 1200, you better start taking 1200 pound squats in the gym. Like, that's basically what he was saying to me. So, uh, that was probably something that always stuck with me. Um, uh, Louis Simmons, um, I'll say this one if you run with the lane, you'll develop a limp. That is true, and sometimes he falls to his own uh, words. So take that for what okay. it is. Yeah. We can we can get into that later. I don't I don't I don't care to talk about it. I, I don't mind I should say talking about it. Okay. And that just goes back to where, like I was saying, like uh, throughout the years, my side just changes a little bit, and things. You know, Understand the many years versions of Westside. Yep. So. Any cool hardcore Chuck Vogapol stories? Uh, oh, we can Jeff. talk about the, 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 the. Okay, so there. Okay, yeah. So in the movie, it talks about Chuck when he. Had, so Chuck was a, a 198 pounder most of the times when he first started out, and I, I heard I've heard every Chuck Vogapol story, um, probably from firsthand guys. Like a lot of guys, like Bob Coe, Louis told me a lot of Chuck Vogapol. Story. And Chuck's told me a lot. Of, you know, I, I, me and him would always go out of town, and we used to show dogs. We used to breed bull terriers together, and uh, we would always drive eight and nine hours to these dog shows. So I'd get to sit in the car with him and just listen to him talk about all kinds of crazy shit all the time. So if you know Chuck, he's a man of few words. So yep. um, I was fortunate enough throughout my career to have like one-on-one -on -one time with the crazy man. Uh, one cool story that I remember is uh, after, if you remember in the movie, Matt Demmel put uh, 
they were in the gym and um, Matt Demmel wasn't looking, you know what I mean? He was looking this way and they always played this game with Matt Demmel where Jimmy Ritchie and Chuck, they would always try to blindside Matt Demmel and take him out. Because Matt Demmel was such a massive human being that they, they just couldn't do it. Like, so these guys were like, like you know, 250-pound dudes. Chuck was like a 220-pound guy. You know, and Jimmy Ritchie was 250, 260, big guys. And whenever Matt Demmel wasn't looking, they would take off full sprint across the room and try to, like, Bobby Boucher tackle him. Really? Wow. And Matt, Matt would just catch him and, like, pick him up and just throw him off of him <laughs> and stuff like that. And uh, one time, Chuck had, Chuck had run across the room and uh, tried to take Matt Demmel out from the side. And Matt Demmel got his neck in a standing guillotine, and he picked him up, and he broke Chuck's neck. Well, uh, Chuck, Chuck had no idea his neck was broken. If you, if, you looked in, if you look back in the day, Chuck's fucking traps were to his damn ears. You know what I mean? Like, the, guy, the guy's neck basically held his, held his neck in place. <laughs> So what had actually happened, how they found out that Chuck had a broken neck, is uh, he would start, he was speed bench pressing, and every week his bench would go down. He went from benching 405 raw, the next week he bench, couldn't bench 315, then he couldn't bench two plates. And then, like, by week number three or four, he couldn't bench 135. He's like, what the hell is going on? Wow. So he told me this, he told me this story, and he, and he said, so he went to the doctor, and they, they're like, okay, we're going to take an x-ray. And uh, so he's, you know, getting his x-ray done, and all of a sudden, the doctor comes running in, and I, I, I say this in the movie, they run in, they put him in a neck brace, and they're like, they're like, stop, don't move, you know what I mean? And he like looks over, he's like, what the hell's wrong? He's like, sir, you've like broken two, two vertebrae in your neck. Uh, you're going to, if, you, if they, they said if he sneezed, he'd have been a quad. So he was like real close to being, come, oh. being in a wheelchair and didn't even know it. Oh. Wow. So <laughs> Chuck's whack. That guy's got. That guy was born with something that no other human was born with, and it's something that I admire, and probably a lot of people do. So, uh, that was one cool Chuck story. Uh, another one. Um, so this is to the broken neck. So leading after that. So after Chuck was broke his neck, am I still in the middle of the You're you're perfectly right there. Yeah. You're good. All right. So, so after Chuck broke his neck, he couldn't lift weights. Uh, and that, and if anybody knows Chuck. That that like burns his soul when he cannot move, break break the plane of gravity with weights. Just it fucks with him. So he had to do something else. So he started doing uh, Iron Man fights, uh, to where you would fight three guys in a night or something like that. So I remember the uh, he would show me tapes of it, and uh, there was this one fight that he did where he had uh, he had to fight like three fights to the championship. He, the first fight. He, he came out and he just beat the shit out of this dude. Like It was like done in a very short, quick period of time. The second dude saw what he did to the first dude and would not come out to fight him. He was like, hey, I'm not fighting that dude. Wow. Like, fuck that. So the second dude wouldn't come out and fight him. And then the, the champion, the guy that he was going to fight in the championship round, um, he was actually a pretty good fighter from the, from what I saw. And, um, they, you know, the, the, the round started off and they started throwing some punches and one, one or two of them hit Chuck pretty good, and you could just see that fucking flip switch, like, you just hit me. <laughs> you know? And uh, all as I saw was Chuck run across the, 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 the ring, and he starts body shotting this dude. He goes, one, bow, two, boom, and by the third one, he must have cracked him right in the liver just right. The dude fell to his knees, and he pissed himself, and he just fell on the ground, and that was the end of that fight. So. Wow. That was a cool story. I don't, you know, Chuck. Chuck was always a very intense individual. He knows how to focus his focus power, focus strength. So that's something I guess uh, I always try to take from him as best I could. Not another funny story. Uh, I remember another guy that told this story was Joe Bayless. Uh, but whenever Chuck, so we'd be in the gym, and uh, when you train with him, you know, Chuck gets ready to lift the heavy weight. He'll go over by the chuck bowl, and you just see him over by the chuck bowl. And he just starts picking up pieces of chalk and, and just squeeze them. And Chuck just, chalk just starts, like, bursting in his hands. And you're like, and then you see him start going, like, I'm like, dude, what, what is wrong with you, dude? So, like, I kind of, like, left him be, like, and I'm like, oh, he's fucking fuck. So I remember afterwards, I'm like, dude, what are you, what are you thinking about over there to make you so, so angry? He goes, well, first thing I do when I come in the gym is I, is I fucking pick somebody. And I hate him. I hate everybody. I just hate the fucking shit out of him. 
So he will he would come in and he would pick somebody to hate that workout and fucking hate them with all of his being. Like that's whack. Okay, I'm sorry that sounds crazy, but that's what he said to me. <laughs> I was like, okay, you find somebody and you pick them and you hate their being until it makes you so mad you can lift big heads. So that's interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So that was weird. Um, that's another good one. Um, there's all kinds of bar fight stories with Chuck of him uh, overwhelmingly hurting more than one person at one time. That's what that was always. See, Chuck was kind of a wild man back in the day. I'm sure you could probably take from from all of the stories you hear about him. But there was many a time where it was him versus more than a handful of people, and those handful of people did not come out on top. That's crazy. <laughs> So, all kinds of stuff. I saw the one cool story I'll tell you. I got all kinds of. See, now I told you if you get me going. Okay, on, I'll man, go much. for it. We enjoy checking. Another stories. cool one was I think this was in 2000, maybe 10 or 11. Chuck had uh, he went he had gone up to like 275 and he had hurt himself. He had a bunch of rib problems. He was tearing intercostals and stuff like that. Pretty much similar to the same thing I had up here. He just had separated rib heads all down in the side of his trunk of his torso. So he couldn't deadlift. Um, so he he it would like he would sparingly squat. Like he would squat like every two weeks sometimes because he just couldn't couldn't squat. He couldn't hold weight on him. And we had one of those power station pro ams. It was a meet that Mike Ferguson ran. It was basically one of the meets that replaced the WPO. And uh, Chuck had he just didn't have much of a training cycle. You know what I mean? He just he he squatted every two or three weeks sometimes. He didn't deadlift. And we, he goes into this meet, and long story short, the dude squats the all-time world record. He may, in, in maybe 12 weeks, he maybe squatted five or six times. Wow. Maybe less than that. Just because he couldn't do it. He was so beat up, he just couldn't do it. That's the story of Chuck. Chuck is probably uh, one of the most, I don't want to say underachieving, but if Chuck had not, I don't want to call it like that, if he would have just been smarter and not gone so hard and, been, and let himself heal from his injuries... Chuck, Chuck would have probably, I mean, there's no telling what that dude would have done. Like, so injuries are what, are what not let us see the, the full extent of what Chuck could have done. Because I think Chuck would have squatted into the 13s. He probably would have had an 800-pound bench or more, and he probably would have pulled close tonight. A lot of people don't know Chuck can't hold on to deadlifts because he's, he's broke. If you ever look at Chuck's hands, his fucking knuckles are all, like, up in his up in his in his hand, he, he just looks like he's got these like mongoloid hands, because he he has broken his hand so many times from either being in fights or hitting something, that like he just wouldn't go to the doctor because he's one of the most stubborn human beings on the planet. Like ah, I'm doing it, so his he would just let his hand heal all fucked up, and he couldn't and he couldn't hold on to deadlifts after fucking ten years. So like a lot of Chuck's deadlift problems is not that he couldn't lock a 900 pound. I've seen Chuck pull 900 in the gym on more than one occasion. But like he he couldn't hold on to it because his hands were so fucked up. Jeez. So like that that's what was another. I was telling you a cool story and I got into the crazy hands. Boxing fractures. That's what that's what those must be. Is there a, uh, is there a VHS tape of uh, that Chuck Vogelpool tough man fight? Yes. Oh. Um, it's been some. It's been a, It's been many years since I've seen it. It's, I think I saw it. It's in not online, is it? Oh, no. I saw it at his house. Oh, I got to get a copy, Dave. How, how, how do we get a copy? I mean, you can't put a price on I'll, that. I'll have to, when I see him, I'll ask him if he still has it. Oh. Uh, but it's I know it's on a VHS tape. It's damn sure a VHS okay. tape. So next time I see him, I'll ask him about it. He he just smiles when you talk about that. I think that was one of those, like, <laughs> you know, it's like it, like, Knocking the piss out of somebody just really lights like the candle in his heart. <laughs> <laughs> There's all kinds of good Chuck stories. Oh, so the story I was finishing. So Chuck had went to this meet and he squats the all-time world record at 242. It was like 11:45. He squatted. Um, he he pretty much tokened on the bench, but he had not deadlifted. That I had not seen this guy pick up a deadlift over 600 pounds in a year. And he goes to the meet and he pulls 820. Whoa. And I was just like, Holy crap. <laughs> what? 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 Like, how what? did this happen? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so 
Chuck was one of those guys that he had trained so fucking much that like the dude couldn't beat it. He didn't. He was just strong all the time. So Chuck was a very unique individual, and I probably I had the opportunity of probably being closer to him than ninety eight percent of the humans on the earth. Very cool. Cool. Which our next question? A lot of my training was actually structured after Chuck too. Like a lot of my uh, squatting and stuff, I learned like mechanics of squatting from Chuck. Like after after Bob Co kind of, you know, me and Bobby, we got up to a thousand pound squat, and after that, Bob's like, dude, I don't, I squatted seven hundred, dude, I don't know how to tell you how to squat eleven hundred pounds. Like, He's like, you need to learn, you need to go learn from, you got to go learn from somebody that can tell you how to do this. That's done it. Not Chuck. So that's when I started training with Chuck, and he pretty much, if you watch me and Chuck squat, if you ever see videos, me and him squat pretty similar, probably later in life, Chuck, not beginning like Chuck. Uh, so a lot of like my form and my technique comes from Chuck. A lot of uh, uh, mechanics, coaching, coaching cues come from uh, what I learned from Chuck. So Chuck was a big influence on squatting uh, primarily. It kind of answers the second question. I know. I, I was doing whether to even ask the next one, but I'm sure you've got some more stories. What was it like training with Chuck, Chuck Vogelpohl? I know you've kind of already touched, touched on, on that, but is there oh, something I mean, you It was really fun. It got it got a lot better when he wasn't the one that was trying to kill you. When he comes up to you, like, hey, let's, let's try to make this guy puke. It's like, okay, let's do that. <laughs> you know, like, well, let's, do you. let's do that together. You know, like... Uh, his whole his whole thing was he would try to get you to quit. You know what I mean? So he like if you if you could keep up in his workouts, it got to a point where like Chuck would respect you and you were like one of the guys. So then it was you guys murdering other people. So it was always the thing where you would try to get the person to quit. Um, you 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 just keep doing one thing after the next after the next until they either ask if are we done yet and like why are you quitting? You quit? You quit? You're done? You quit? You know. Like, it's like, nope, nope. So I just learned to be like, you know what? No, nope, no, nope, I don't quit, but I am done doing that. I am done doing that, Chuck. Let's go over here and do this. And I would pick something that he wasn't good at. And then that would be the end of the work. So there were ways to get around, Chuck. Uh, but you, it took a really long time to learn how to it. You had to be a really strong guy that he liked. So. Okay. Good training partner. Chuck's a really good coach. He's got a good eye for a lot of stuff. Um, he, he he was probably the one that I would say most creative. That guy would probably come up with the most exercises and put you in the most disadvantaged positions just in case. We're going to put three bands pulling forward, one pulling back, one pulling to the side just in case we get out and get out of the groove and the squat will be able to power forward. Like, okay, like, okay, we'll do that. Like, so... Just Chuck was always super creative when it comes to stuff, so there was never a, a dull moment coming to train with Chuck. Um, so yeah, and another cool thing about training with Chuck is you got to see shit that you just wouldn't never fucking see. I would, I, I mean, I, there's some fucking crazy shit I seen that guy do in the gym, from pulling 900 pound deadlifts. You know, the guy his best his best meat deadlift was 835. And you know, pulling 900 in the gym was like, what the fuck? Like, wow. that's a whole, that's a lot. Uh, other things I seen him do, we were uh, there was a circuit max um, box squat that they did, and um, there was he did he would squat with all the bands. So at West Side we had two blues, a green, and a purple, and Chuck had all the bands on there, and he squatted 880, two blues, a green, and a purple, and it was something like 1400 at the top. Uh, so it was like I've, there's just whack shit I've seen that dude do that no humans done. He's just one. Of, he's he's a spe he's just a unique specimen. Uh, often misunderstood. You know what I mean? He's, he's just a he's just a very he's he's a big introvert. You know what I mean? He keeps to himself and he's just yeah. He's a he's a really good dude though. So very cool. If you could give Louis Simmons a nickname, what would that nickname be? <laughs> Oh, we talked about this. Probably the baby Yoda. Yoda. I mean, as as Louis's gotten older, he kind of has the Yoda sound. You know what I mean? He even has the Yoda laugh, and when he smiles, he looks like baby Yoda. <laughs> uh, in his older, in his older, in his older years, he, you know, they, they, Ed Cohen said it in the West Side movie. You know, he kind of looks like him too, and he's kind of like sitting there with his little like 
Or we just need like a little Yoda cane. And... <laughs> yeah, he looks like maybe Yoda. Yoda. Okay. Baby Yoda. He's he smart like Yoda, That's so he true. still got that going on. That's a good one. What does the future hold for Westside Barbell, Jim, in your opinion? The way you oh, see it. well, uh, I'll just say what Louis said. Um, Louis said, and he stated it, and what, like when I first got there, everybody thought that Chuck would get Westside. You know what I mean? Um, like when I first got there, Chuck was the man. So you were just thinking that, like you know, when Louis when Louis's done, you know, Chuck's gonna get it. And we're gonna keep going, right. you know. Or and then like kind of like uh, when Chuck went away, that was kind of like AJ maybe. And then maybe me at one. Like people might think that at one point, but Louis said it. He says that you know when when Louis dies, Westside dies. And so when Louis Simmons uh, passes on to the next realm. Westside will, in whatever capacity it's in, won't be in it. And that, that, those are, from my understanding, his wishes. Mm -hmm. So when, when Louis dies, Westside dies, you know. Um, uh, the, the brand will probably stay around, and maybe the gym in some capacity will be around in some facet, But because uh, I know they train a lot of fighters and stuff go there. And that's where Westside, I say, is geared now. Um, it's kind of like just as time gone on and uh, I should say like insurance things and having to deal with the current political atmosphere uh, Westside has just kind of gone more towards teaching and athletes and I just think that's the evolution of Westside and probably where it's going and I think the, the powerlifting days of Westside are probably you're probably seeing the end of them and that's just my opinion um, like I said uh, Louis Louis's getting old um, nobody lives forever, and I'm not saying Louis dying anytime soon or anything, but um, he's been around a while, and you don't know how long people have. And like he said, when, when Westside Louis died, Westside dies, and that's probably what'll yeah. happen. Okay. All right. I've been told you've been one to take off multiple months from the gym completely. Is that true? And is that to have longevity in the sport or something different? Yeah, that has a lot to do with it. This is actually a good point. Um, I was telling somebody, I think I did another podcast with my buddy, and we were talking about um, basically, like, I've been doing, and Ryan, you, I mean, you took some years off, but there's a stretch of your life. I mean, every year, I mean, this is my 18th year of powerlifting. And I've done a powerlifting year, a meet every year for those 18 years so i've been competing in meets for 18 years so there comes a time when you just get burnt out man and my thing was is i didn't want to get burnt out so i was going to stop and if that meant turn around and walking away from the gym to not get burnt out on it that's what i had to do um this past time when i told 3100 i had a lot of uh, this last last october so october of 2019 um uh, I told the 3100, and there was just I had a lot of stress going into that meet. Um, there was a lot, there was a lot of uh, pressure put on me for that meet by a lot of different uh, areas, from a lot of different people. So, like I had to perform for a lot of different reasons, and um, it was. I'm losing my train of thought here. Real man here. Um. Well, we were talking about taking months, months off, off of the gym, and we were talking okay. about your method. Yeah, okay. uh, um, so I had done that meet, and I, at that point, when you achieve something that, when you go that far and you go that high, it's hard to stay motivated. So instead of putting pressure on myself, you almost need to turn around and take a couple steps back. And... Uh, I've had 18 years of competing, of wear and tear on my body, so now I'm at the point where I can maybe only do one or two powerlifting meets a year because uh, I can't stay together through 15 weeks of a training cycle, you know what I mean? Because all the numbers I'm putting together cause so much damage. You know, we're, I'm talking 1,300 pound squats, you know, I take 1,100 pound benches in training, you know, I'm pulling 900 pound deadlifts in the gym, and then you have to... You know what I mean? You have to go to the meet and put it all together, and and you you run into this thing of where you're juggling, trying to keep them all up at the same time. So there's been times where um, 
like this past year. So I took I didn't I took uh, November, December, and January off until I trained for that semifinals. I had six weeks of training for that meet. I only did that meet so I could qualify for the super. Fights. So um, I've just been of the thing. I just listen to my body and listen to my mind. And if walking away keeps me fresh, mm -hmm. then and I'm not hurt or injured. So like. In my mind, it's 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 not going anywhere. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. At this point, if I get an injury, any kind of significant injury at the at the numbers that I'm handling, it just won't happen anymore. So I have to be ultra smart what I'm oh, doing. Oh yeah, makes sense. definitely. Okay, so that was the last question that we had. Um, and then we're gonna go into the questions in the chat box. Um, we did have somebody um, da a, Dan a guy by the name of Daniel Walsh um, had a couple questions. He's from Shetland in Scotland, I believe. The Shetland and Islands. And it's in like Scotland. three three in the morning wow. for them right now. So he knew he wasn't going to be able to watch it live, but he had some questions yeah, yeah. Um, that he wanted to ask. So he was hoping that you and Ryan could talk about um, your sleep apnea and how your CPAP uh, was kind of a, ja a game changer for your um, performance. Well, here's a here's a secret. Like I never, I sleep on my stomach, so like I kind of got a. They say a stomach sleeper, they uh, they get a they get by with sleep apnea. Like I so sleep apnea never really affected me up until until I started getting up into like the really heavier body weights. Mm -hmm. Probably you know when you're like 350, 360, oh, yeah. 340, you, you, it's there's no sleeping. So um, and I this is a Chuck story. So. The Chuck sleep apnea story. I remember Chuck. I remember I stayed at his house one night, and uh, I was up in the spare bedroom, and I heard this violent sound. Right, just sound like just the most violent snoring I've ever heard. And I was like, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> I got it. Chuck down there on the couch asleep, passed out. I was like, "Oh man, dude, you you have a problem." So the next morning, I was like, "Dude, do you understand that like you have a sleeping problem, dude?" Like, so. Uh, <laughs> That was at a time when Chuck wasn't recovering. He was having all of his injuries and he wasn't recovering. I'm like, dude, I bet if you get a sleep apnea machine, you'll you'll probably recover better because your body's getting more oxygen. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, so he got one and he actually turned a corner and, and started doing a lot better when he got a sleep apnea or a CPAP machine. Um, I got one, but I don't really use it so much. Uh, but I believe they they are important. If you have sleep apnea, you should most certainly um, use a CPAP because they will make a big, big difference. Uh, my CPAP story is basically, uh, what, February 2007, I did the Mendelssohn Classic, benched a 902, went to the Arnold, benched a 902. Uh, a couple months later, I was I went to an APF meet and uh, I was all tired and I was extremely exhausted and this old man said, you got sleep apnea. And so, long story short, I got a machine. By the end of that year, I benched uh, 1050. So, I mean, it tur turned my life around and lifting around and, and, and made everything work better. Training, eating, supplementation, the whole nine yards. I mean, I got four of those machines, man. And, uh, and um, yeah, it was, it was kind of crazy because uh, I was able, I was, I, it, was, it was hard to, to get to 330 body weight. But when I got that machine, I, I took off the 360 and uh, my handoff partner yeah. said, uh, he goes, you're going to be like Johnny Perry when I hit 400 and I was going to die. And so I quit squatting because this, I couldn't weigh myself on a conventional scale anymore because I only went up to 350 pounds. And uh, I, had to get, I had to use a, a farm scale to get the 360, 365. And, um, you know, I was ugly. I, I wasn't pretty to look at, Dave, but, but God damn, I, I missed some weight. I wish one day that I can be weighed on a cattle scale because my other scale will not work. Or it's nothing to be proud of. I have a life goal. You have you have you have inspired me. <laughs> well, you know, and you know how I got there. You know, Scott Mendelson. You know, I got him on the phone, and and I was like, Mendelson, I got to eat, bro. <laughs> you got to eat. <laughs> he says you got to eat twenty five hundred calorie shakes, and uh, so I was sponsored by uh, USA Supplements, and so I ordered Champion Nutrition twenty five hundred calorie shakes, mixed it with whole milk, and uh, uh, basically it turned into a blizzard, and um, so I had to drop him down to. <laughs> Dude, did you ever? Did he ever tell you about liquid breakfast? Bro? I've never heard about liquid breakfast, bro. Liquid breakfast, bro. Okay, this is what you need to do, bro. 
<laughs> I'm gonna write it down. You need to go. Okay, so he told me about liquid. Okay, this is a good Scott Mendelson story. He, I was, I remember I went out there and stayed with him, and I was like, tell me the secrets of getting huge, okay. Scott. You know, tell me how to get big. And he just kind of leaned over with his like, his droopy like, I don't want to call him John to size, but you know, he kind of looked at. You gotta eat, bro. I'm like, tell me what to eat. I will eat anything. You know, like I will become large. Tell me. <laughs> So he said liquid breakfast. I was like, what the fuck is liquid breakfast? He's like, all right, what you need to do is you need to get two packets of oatmeal, okay. put them in a blender, and then he told me to put two scoops of protein in there with some peanut butter and, and honey, and then pour whole milk in there and fucking put it on the blender. So it's basically a protein shake made with whole milk and peanut butter and two packets of oatmeal. Probably over a thousand just, calories just, there. Oh. Dude, so you, you get this ground up oatmeal and it's easy going down, but like five minutes after you drink it, all that oatmeal like expands in your stomach. Buddy, that didn't last for me. Before. Okay, I've never heard that one. I'm going to try it though, Dave. I'm, it gives me something to do. Well, the story, the story also goes is uh, he had he had one time done like three or he'd, done, he'd like doubled up on the packets of oatmeal and uh, he had, it was at the time, I don't remember that Hummer he used to drive. But he had this big Hummer he drove anywhere, and he, he had just finished it, and he puked, he puked all over the front windshield of his Hummer because he put too much. Uh, so go easy on the uh, the oatmeal. Okay? okay. So too much oatmeal, it's coming up. Two packets of oatmeal. And one, and one more thing on the CPAP machine that I, I, I gathered when I was in uh, Westside this past March was uh, Louis Simmons has sleep apnea, and he knows he has sleep apnea. And, he you know, sleep apnea is a silent killer. It'll kill you in your sleep, and, and, and it just, you know, I, I just wish uh, Louis. I think Louis um, Conley told me that uh, Louis said that CPAPs are for fat guys, and he won't get one. And I, I don't know. You know, I thought maybe I could write him a letter, get through to Louis, but I, you know, I just don't want to sleep apnea. You can take years off your life, and I like to see him be around for a while. And well, you remember Reggie White? Yep. You know, Reggie oh, yeah. White. He was uh, like that. Was probably that that really hurt me when I was a kid. I was a huge yep. Reggie White fan. Reggie White died of CPAP. Yep. I was like Reggie, no, oh, Reggie. But. Uh, but Louis, he's got he has a weird problem, and his problem comes from being trained. Okay. So uh, when Louis when they when they gave him the wrong anesthesia and his heart stopped, they were trying to bring him back, and they had to stick a trach in his throat. And when they stuck the trach in his throat, it like severed his windpipe oh. or something like that. So like uh, he he basically Louis does not go into REM cycle sleep. He maybe sleeps like 45 minutes at a time, and he wakes up. It's really a terrible. It's a really terrible way to be. So I think that plays into Louis's craziness. You know, he's never rested. Um, he's just he's just a tough old motherfucker. He's a tough man, motherfucker. Man. Yeah. For all of his faults, you know, he he's he you know he's. I say Louis's dead center, man. For all of his faults, he's done as much as he's. I don't want to say bad, but for all the faults, he's got a lot of good. So there's as much upside as there is downside with Louis. Louis's just a crazy old man. Yeah, I understand. So I love Louie. Um, is that all you wanted to say about this? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Move okay, on. and then just the other question that he asked, which we kind of touched on it a little, is um, if you could only ever use one accessory movement for the rest of your life for bench press, what would it be? Skull crusher. Skull crusher. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that that was all. That his, was it. So we can. I mean, just that's it. I mean, just just bench press like. That or just not been like an accessory for your bench press. Yeah. One accessory movement just for your one, bench press. If you press, could only ever be? use one accessory movement, you can bench and then you oh. can do one other thing. Skull, Skull crusher. Skull crusher. Perfect. Okay. Well, we'll move over to the chat box, Dave, and we got uh, a lot of them. Um, Ashley. Oh, Eddie. So the very first comment was from the guy whose questions we just asked. He started in with us, and then I'm guessing he's went to bed. Um, he says, hell yeah, I'm still awake, barely, two legends and one pa- podcast, goddamn epic, <laughs> the Iron Gods will be watching this one too. And then, let's, should I just... Well, it's kind of crazy, like, we're, we're, uh, I don't want to call myself old, but it's like, man, we're, we're like, the, the scene, the, the, the landscape of powerlifting is so different, so, like, we're... We're like the, the, I don't want to call it old ones, but we've been around a long time. 
I, I was doing a little research on you, Dave, and I saw that your birthday was in December 1987, and that, that made me feel old when I saw that. <laughs> I was in the seventh grade. <laughs> but, yes, I was born December 25th, 1987. Yeah. Wow. wow. I was born on Christmas That's Day. Crazy. That's awesome. What's it like to have your birthday on Christmas? Does, do, is it okay, cool, or does it get skipped? Yeah, I mean, like, when, when I was a kid, my parents would always, uh, they'd have, you know, Christmas in the morning, and my birthday was in the evening, so I kind of oh, had some cool. separation. There you go. That's cool. Yeah, uh, they, they, they kind of knew. They, they, my parents kind of, like, uh, made a concerted effort to make that day feel special oh, for me. Good. So, you know, I had a really good upbringing. My parents, you know, always supported me and really loved me so i attribute a lot of that a lot of my success to my dad too because my dad was probably one of my biggest support systems or support crutches, so. very cool it's good to have that support system um remy shirley has a question when you guys train do you have set weights that are raw that you work up to before throwing on the gear and do they change um for me um, my stuff, as my shirt, it, okay, so I should say this, like, I usually bench, like, four plates in the warm-up room for a double, and then I'll put my shirt on and jump to, like, 600, six or seven hundred. So, like, uh, I don't, let me see what I'm saying. So, when I put my shirt on it, I usually don't work up heavy raw, because that's not what I'm doing, you know what I'm saying? Like, if, if, you know, if I'm doing, like, max effort work, of course, you know, I don't really, I don't do... I don't, I don't really put my shirt on. I maybe put a shirt on every six to eight weeks. Really? Wow, really? Interesting. Like, before that last meet, I put my shirt on, uh, like, uh, one time before that last meet. Yeah. Jeez. Wow. That's surprising. It's more or less, uh, I, I, I just, I'm so good in a shirt. Like, I, I'm so, I'm, over time, I've become very proficient in bench pressing, or in a shirt, I should say. And um, I just kind of, I just kind of like, it's kind of like riding a bike, you know, like you just kind of know it's going to feel heavy the first time you try it and it'll get better from there on out. So um, a lot of like, uh, a lot of my training is structured to make my shirt and bench go up. So like my raw, all the, all the exercises that I do are complementing a shirt and bench press. So I got to the point where I just didn't need to be in a shirt all the time. But there are times where I'll get in it more than others, so I don't know how I got over that. But to this guy's question, um, for the most part, if I'm putting a shirt on, I, I only get up to about four plates. And, um, some of like some of my other guys are like three plates, two plates. You know? um, sometimes uh, I'll take them um, take them lighter raw and give them lighter shirt weights. You know, I always my guys I'll make them uh, try to touch lighter weights to. Uh, so it's basically harder, you know. You know, you know, it's like trying to touch a light weight and just kind of figure out how to pull the right. shirt down and get full to it without being like scared you're going to be cut in half by this massive weight. You know what I mean? So uh, sometimes I'll give them lighter weights in shirts so they get more reps rather than trying to give them heavier reps at the end. You know what I mean? Just My answer to that question is, you know, on the bench press, I warm up to between 500 and 585 raw and then usually go to a board, uh, half board or one board for 600. And then what I've been doing is putting on the slingshot for seven, eight, because I like to feel the gradual progression of weights. I talked to Tiny Meeker, you know, and he, he uh, warms up to 315 and then he jumps in his shirt and goes up to 900 pounds. And I've not tried, to, tried that yet. Um, it, it just seems like it'd be a shock Dude, to this. I know you can serve energy, but it would seem like it'd be a shock to the system. I like to gradually work up and just fill the weights all the way up uh, on board so I don't, uh, you know, waste myself, you know, seven, eight. I'll tell you what's really disheartening anymore is when I'm warm and max effort bench press, we're in the gym and it's like I hit 500 raw and then I'm like, well, maybe 550 maybe. And then uh, and then it's like a slingshot to maybe 650 and then it's like slingshot like 750. And before I do the 750, I look at it and I'm like, there's a human being on this earth like fricking benches that. Yeah. And not, it's not even, yeah, not even motivating. Like, I, 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 800, I mean, he's going to do that too. <laughs> so I, I just, you know, so it's, yeah. It's a shit. Like, did you ever think you would see, I never, it's not that when I never thought it was possible. I just never thought I would see it. Like, I never thought I'd see a human being benching 800 pounds raw. It's never. Crazy. No, if you would ask me that back, you know, when I did the 800 in 2002, uh, you know, it's James Henderson and Mendelssohn, 715, Spoto, 
you know, and this guy comes along, and um, God, you know, it's just, uh, I was just happy to be at the Arnold and see the 770, and, and um, he's going to get that 800 somewhere, but, um, yeah. I think he'll be the first guy to do it yeah. for sure. I think if anyone's going to do it, it's gonna, and them other guys he's got training with him, like, where them dudes come from? Them dudes are just, like, some of the biggest, some of the biggest, where do you guys come from? Like, what? like where are these dudes coming from? I'll tell you my favorite story. Like, there's and 700 pound raw benches dude these guys just like that's like power like whoa They're i saw two cool. of them at the arnold in one meet it was crazy thomas td davis and julius i remember i was standing there talking to somebody in the hallway at the arnold and i looked over my shoulder and i saw thomas td davis and and julius maddox and i was like well those i didn't know it was them but you know 50 yards away i'm like those are big people and then i looked again and as they get closer I, they, Fucking, they just got so much bigger and the most gigantic 400 pound human beings. Nicest people on the earth, too, man. I mean, awesome, awesome individuals. So, I'm a, yeah, I'm a big fan of strength, and that's oh. some freaky strength. It is. is. Yes, it is. Uh, but one, what, so you we were, you were, another thing to the whole uh, warming up in a shirt thing. I have a funny Mendelssohn story of my first experience with somebody doing those psychotic things. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you ever remember, like when Mendy would do the WPC Worlds, he benched like fucking four times in a weekend. You know what I mean? He'd be like, he'd go to the Worlds, and then all of a sudden he'd be like, Monday he'd come out and guest lift and try something, and then like Tuesday, Wednesday, I remember he'd that. Come I back remember that. Try. So I, uh, there was this was in 2012 when I got there, so I had just bombed out. Remember my we were talking yep. earlier about my the worst you know, I ever the, my worst time. The only thing that made that trip better was I got to hand out to Scott. So I remember I just bombed in the squat, and here comes 340-pound Scott Mendelson running in the back. He goes, can you hand out, bro? I was like, can I hand out? Like, I mean, I guess. Like, you're asking me to hand out. Don't you have a guy? Like, you're Scott Mendelson, yeah. dude. Like, what the hell? A guy couldn't make it, bro. I was like, okay, well, sure, I'll, I'll hand out to you. So we go to the back, and he's just kind of like over there putting his liniment on, spraying himself with his peanut oil, you know, like <laughs> with his DMS that Oh, yeah. Just, just all this shit. And uh, I'm like, okay, so, you know, I see him take a, a 50 kg plate. I don't know what that is. One, it's 110. About it's about 250. Yeah, it's about 250, yep. 250 yep. pounds. Or something. He comes down about four inches from touching raw. Just goes down, stops, pushes him up. Goes down, stops, pushes back. Like four inches from touching his shoes. I'm like, oh, well, you're not going to touch. He goes, okay, it's not enough weight to touch raw. <laughs> I've heard that. I was like, I was like, two fit. You can't touch two fifty raw. He can't, he can't, he can't touch three fifteen. <laughs> yeah. So, so this guy goes from two hundred and fifty pounds, like taking it ten times, and I'm going like, oh, what do you want? You want like three hundred, four hundred? He goes. He just stops. He looks over. and Goes, give me nine seventy. Really. I was like, I was like, you don't want like 570, 670, 770, 870? You don't want any of those? <laughs> just, give me nine, just give me 970, bro. I was like, nah, you okay. 970 it is, sir. Okay, good. So I remember I handed him out the 970. He takes it to a three board. He pushes it up and he puts it in the rack. And I'm like, I mean, I guess that was good. Like, what do you want? He goes, I'm going to take that again. Like you're taking nine seventy again to what a two board, bro? Two board. It's like, it's like okay, a two board this time. All right, let's do it again. So I hand him nine seventy. Does dude does nine seventy off a two okay. board? I'm like, what would you like, Scott? Give me a thousand a. I'm like, you want a thousand a? Well, you want that two of one. Board. Okay. I was like, okay. <laughs> So I give him a thousand eight. He does a thousand eight off of one board. He puts it okay. right. So in the warm up room, this guy's done nine seventy off of three, nine seventy off two. of two, and then a thousand eight off of a one. And I'm sitting there like, what the fuck is this dude bench pressing in the yeah. meat? Like, what? Like, what do you do the weight, dude? Like, you crazy son of a bitch. Like, like you are beyond. You are beyond. Like, I don't even know what to call it. Uh, uh, re re strong. Like, like you, <laughs> you got a different. That he's got something. I say Scott is probably one of the – prior to his car accident, that was probably the strongest human being on I the planet. I agree Like, uh, I saw videos of him doing, like, 800-pound raw one boards. I've seen that. Um, I've seen him do 1,000-pound raw bodybuilding squats. Really? Um, I've seen him 850 deadlifts and stuff like that. Like, Scott – I mean, like, that. that's just my opinion. I think Scott, if he did full power – 
and he never gotten that it never gotten that injury that really fucked his leg up. Remember, it snapped his ankle in half. But he got yeah. in a bad car wreck where um, uh, somebody hit him head on or something, and the engine of his van came through and snapped his ankle in half. Oh my god! And they had to fuse his. He doesn't have a. He doesn't have an ankle in that leg in his right leg. He, he's basically they. They were going to amputate his leg, and he's like, no. He's like, put my fucking foot on my shin. So they took his foot and they fused it to the bottom of his shin. And uh, uh, they got cadaver, a fucking Achilles tendons for him. And the dude is such a mongoloid, like he would start healing and, it, and the Achilles tendon would tear. So he like so what they had to do is take a cadaver hamstring and put down in his fucking foot. So the dude has three hamstrings. Like he has a hamstring down where his fucking Achilles tendon is. Like, what? <laughs> so, I don't know how I got off on that. But anyway, so back to the meat. Um, Scott takes 1,008 off of a okay. whiteboard, and I'm like, what's your bitch opener? He's like, uh, 1,008. I'm like, what? Like, you just took 1,008 back here to a whiteboard, and you're going out there and open it with it? Sure, you're Scott Mendelson. I'm, I have not been, you're, you know what I mean? Not whatever you want, sir. You know, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm no, I'm no person to like question this guy. Right. So I remember we take we I handed him out a thousand eight and he goes down of course vintage Mendy shirts too tight goes down hovering hovering and this dude is probably the only guy that can take that weight down there just sit there and hover with it for thirty seconds, oh, just down there hovering an inch off his chest thirty seconds I'm like how is he not dead like, and then he just dumps it you're like oh well shit dude I was like hey man you're like an inch from touching if you take like ten thirty eight ten four you'll probably touch he goes. Give me ten. <laughs> I was like, but that's that was like your record. I was like, but that's the biggest bench of all time. He, but you'll touch like ten forty one, and you know Scott, he's all about the that's record. Right. Which there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. And Scott's philosophy was, well, you know, if I try the record twenty times and I get it one time, then that was that's worth right. it. You know what I'm saying? If he bombed twenty times to get the record for one time, he got the world record. So I mean, that's one way of doing it. But that. To me, I like to have fun and compete and win right. and get numbers. So, so Scott's, Scott's mentality was a unique and different one, but, uh, yeah. So he he basically, the second attempt, he tried 1080, and he dumped that one and took 1080 again and dumped it. So he bombed out. That was the moral of the story. But Well, that, that kind of answers our next question. Mr. Elite Entertainment it is... Uh said uh, hope you are are doing well uh would love to hear see dave hoff do scott mendelson impression so i think we got that <laughs> taken care of <laughs> yeah do what i tell you to do bro <laughs> i that's oh, it's awesome i thought i had it down but uh dude i remember so i i would go out there and visit him sometimes and he would have uh he would have clients out there like people he coached and he would just he would just scream it, do what I told you to do, bro. <laughs> and these guys' eyes are all this big, like, yes, I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? Like, it was just funny. So <laughs> I got to hear Scott yell and strain a lot. So I got to really, really pick up on his mannerisms. So. We lost you in the video, Dave. You want to scoot over a little bit? Oh. Um, no, other way. Other, other way. All we can see is your arm. A little more. A little more. Window, it looks like. A little more. A little more. A little bit more. A little bit more. There you go. Okay. That works. I don't know what happened, but the uh, camera just did. I'm That's sorry. fine. Oh, okay. That's why I make sure people can see you. All right. Cody Plum has a question. It's, it's, yeah, it's lined up now. Um, right how have you guys ever cut weight to make a weight class? I cut from 272 to 259 this week. What would you eat after weigh-ins tomorrow? Um, well, here's a funny Cutting weight. I see. Here's the thing. I cut weight like one time and I had a very bad experience with it. I just didn't do well in the meat. And I would go through the training cycle, planning to do all these big, big numbers, and then I would just fuck up the weight cut. And then, you know what I mean? My numbers would. So I was in, dude, I'd be 257 pounds weight, like lifted in the 275 class. Like I just, I never cut weight. I, I had one successful weight cut, it was in 2010. I think I cut from like 258 to 42. Wow. And I, I totaled 2,600 at 242, and I think that was in 2010. And uh, I missed my last deadlift to break Greg Panora's total record. 
So, um, roll, it, cutting weight was always a roll of the dice for me personally. It's not something I like doing. Um, there's a way to do it. Um, if you, one person I would suggest if you want anything about weight cutting is Brian Carroll has a weight cutting book. And uh, it's, pro it's really nothing that anybody hasn't probably heard, but he kind of like lays it out for you, like when to drink certain things. Like um, the big thing with cutting weight is you need to, you need to have salts, water, and, and uh, carbohydrates. Um, those are the big things. So I mean, I'm just, I didn't cut weight for the super finals in October last year, but um, one thing I did was, was I would get the, the iodized kosher salt and uh, I, would, I would lick salt, drink water, and be pasta or pizza. And um, it works really well. Yeah. Um, I, my, if I was to answer that, when I cut weight to, to do that 1075 inch at 305, I had to cut down from 325. And basically two weeks before that meet, I cut carbohydrates and sodium. But in order to get it back, I'm a big believer in the intravenous IV fluids. I mean, both of those... Yes. When I, when I, I, had a, I had a registered nurse put two bags in me, and uh, I was eating a pizza over here and salt vinegar chips and Gatorade in this hand. And uh, in, in like four hours, I went from 305 to 320. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of the hardcore way to go. But they, they say, you know, the intravenous uh, way of putting fluids in your body goes directly in the muscle. I mean, you can drink salt water and all that stuff, but you have to do that. you got 24 hours to lift, usually, a 24-hour weigh-in. So, I mean, um, I, I, I recommend IVs. Um, Maybe it's not for everybody. Well, 100% I agree with you because that's something I didn't tell you also is I took two IV bags before that 3102. The night before I had, I had, we have two nurses on our team and they come in and they get me all my bags and stuff. And they, I took two bags that night. And um, uh, one guy, the little Alex Kovach guy on my team, he's a 165er. And um, um, a weight, the best way, in my opinion, to cut weight is. Uh, you, is to do it quick like don't don't come down over three weeks okay. like get get within like 10 pounds and cut like get in a sauna cut your weight out you know what i mean like i never like a, if like a couple days out you know i'd watch my diet or i'd have my little buddy watch his diet or something like that but for the most part we try to get it all off in the sauna okay. and cut okay. it off so, rather than rather than lose it over a period makes of sense. time yeah, that's uh, so okay we figured uh, that was less gear. You, you have less gear waving. Like you, you seem to put, if you're bigger from the start of your cut, you seem to be uh, hold more at the end. And if you're drawn out and you go in to get in the sauna, you're going to be even more drawn okay. out. Right. So it's like, Makes sense. So big time, I agree with the, um, the IVs. What I would do the two IV bags I usually steer towards is the glucose bag, sodium glucose. Uh, because that uh, sugar in the glucose will pull that uh, will pull that fluid into your muscle. It doesn't it doesn't like rest on the top that dermal layer under your skin. So sometimes when you take the sodium chloride bags, you, you get like a your skin's almost like spongy yeah. because it's in the muscle. But when you take a glucose bag, that the sugars that glucose kind of like pulls that fluid into the muscle and makes you harder. And it's better for you. And, 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 so and as far are, as eating after weigh-ins, I'm deep dish pizza, uh, Chinese food, high sodium food, uh, that type of thing. Literally, liter it's literally like what sounds good. Put a shitload of salt on it. There you go. Like okay. You know. Next question, Ashley. Okay. So pronounce uh, his name. Jared Gaddis. Jared Gaddis has a question for Dave Hoff. Have you left Westside Barbell and gone to Doghouse Gym? Yes, I have left Westside. Me and Louie have parted ways. Um, um, we'll probably get more into that in the, the next movie documentary that's coming out. Uh, that's probably the best place to tell the okay. whole story. Uh, but in the long and the short of it, me and Louie just kind of like we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things um, there towards the end. Uh, me and Louie always have a mutual respect for each other. Um, uh, me and him, me and him, over the years have have always have a long-standing rivalry because it's always been night crew versus morning crew, and that's just how it is yep. there. It's nothing new, um, uh, and they're just got it. Some, some, how can I put it? Um, Nobody likes to lose, and when one side starts, I, how can I put it? Um, 
We'll just put it like this. Me and Louie just had a different of opinions. We started, we didn't see eye to eye on uh, the goings on in the gym. But ultimately, it's Louie's gym and Louie's rules. And uh, if he wants it a certain way and I don't like it that way, I don't have to That's be right. there. Um, I don't have to enrich something that I don't agree with. Um, and that's kind of the long and the short of it. Um, I don't hate Louie, you know, uh, we don't talk. Um, and that's not really, I'm not going to put the onus on him because yeah. that. It's just how it all went down and him on all talking terms. Not to say that I wouldn't talk to him, but we're, we don't talk. Um, if you watch the West Side movie, it's kind of the same thing that happened with Chuck, I hate to say. It's just this weird thing that happens. You don't really know why it happens. He probably didn't want it to happen. Um, but it just happened, and that's how shit rolls right. sometimes. So like I said before, uh, all good things come to an end. Nothing great lasts forever. And just like Louis says about girlfriends, you know, new one comes around every 20 minutes and so do fucking gyms. West Side special, but West Side is uh, not what I know West Side to be. And that's just the evolution of it. Gym, you know what I mean? I think that you know I was wanting it to be uh, what it was when I got there, and I just don't think it can be that way. Right. It's not that it, Louis didn't want it that way. You know what I mean? It's just stuff like that. So um, we just kind of parted ways, and you know, my night crew team we went over to the doghouse, and a guy named uh, Jimmy Harrison's that. And when we went there, it was only an 1,800 square foot gym, and uh, I had I had. Um, I had plans of opening my own place, you know what I mean? I'm used to training when I want to train, not with people on my shit, you know what I'm saying? Um, I'm very finicky about that shit. I don't like people bothering right. me. And, um, not that I'm not nice, it's just I'm there to do stuff and I can't sit there and, you know, I, I do everybody's programming in my groups, but I'm, I'm telling everybody what jumps they have to make and I just don't have time to have somebody coming off the side. Like, I don't mind helping people, but there's a time and place. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when I'm training, it's necessarily the time for me. So my my opinion, like West Side was a very good atmosphere for that. Like I wasn't bothered a lot. And um, um, so I needed a place like that. And Jimmy, what he did is he said, he said, hey man, there's this unit next door. What if we get that? Would you guys stay? I said, yeah. I said, that sounds good. So I had already bought a bunch of equipment and I just put, put like, I had a mono lift and some, I got a bench and a bunch of other equipment I had stuck in there. So we just kind of combined our equipment and made the other side and that's where I'm at okay. now. And what's cool is I have things the way that I, that I would more so want them, not the way that Louis had them wasn't good. I just now have things, Jimmy takes, I, I'm just at the point now where he takes some of the things that I want into consideration, you know, which is nice. You know, I, I got to choose how I wanted my squat platform to be built and how I want my bench platform to be built. What, you know, hey, Dave, do you like this piece of equipment or this piece of equipment? It's like, well, I, I prefer this one. So just just stuff like that that are, that are, that are just nice differences. Um, so it's a nice gym. I will say the doghouse now is probably the nicest power that came to gym in Ohio. And I'll put that over West Side. West Side is just a different animal unto itself. It's it's not it's not it's never been flashy. It's never been snazzy, and that's not the point of West Side. There was never there's not no mirrors in there for a reason. But uh, I think to that point, um, it takes it takes a group to make the machine run. Sure. And I think and I think I I just think it's the landscape of people changing today. Like the, the generations are just changing. Uh, kid youngsters are changing and, um, the values are changing and I just think with time that you know just things change mm -hmm. you just, you yeah. roll with the punch right. you know? so to that point like I, uh, I left West Side probably uh, four weeks before the uh, the WPS Super Finals last October so like going into that meet uh, that was something I wish I could have gave Lou but Oh, I guess I'll take that yep. with me. Okay. Um, Chris Lancaster. Gotta know Hoff's numbers on rolling dumbbells. What is, was your go-to tricep exercise for upping the bench total? Well, I will say this. I, I, I told you I've been watching your show since, like, March when you guys first did it. <laughs> That's so cool. So I'll be up there. You're always talking about rolling dumbbells, so I'm in there like doing rolling dumbbells for like 10 years. <laughs> Those are my favorite, Dave. I admit, they're my favorite. Yeah. 
So pretty much like uh, just those single joint exercises, any kind of isolation stuff. You know, rib, you know, I do single arm tricep push downs on reverse grip right. tricep push downs. You know, a lot of bodybuilding stuff for triceps because I, I say this about bodybuilders. You know, you ever watch a uh, video? Right. Yeah. I, heard uh, it. I was like, well, I was trying I, to figure out what. I'm like, what's up? Okay. Okay. <laughs> If you, ever, if you ever watch videos like Ronnie Coleman or Jay Cutler or Marcus Rule or Dorian Yates, them dudes are big, gigantic dudes. And they're like, if you ever watch them in the bench press, they're benching four or 500 pounds for reps. Like it's like Kevin Lavroni. You ever oh, watch yeah. that dude benching five years? Like, what the fuck? And they're not bench pressers, they're bodybuilders. Right. So, like, I say it like this, like bodybuilders, their, their strength is a side effect of their size. And a power lifters, uh, Size is a side effect of strength. So because we are strong and we're big, your body adapts, makes you larger to, to, to handle the loads of weight you're putting on it. And um, so I, the, my whole thing was if you build muscle, muscle stores energy, that makes that converts into strength. You see Ryan, he looks like a fucking bodybuilder. He got big old jack giant arms. I mean, you're, there's 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 strength stored in there. Buddy. That's how that's how I train, so, Dave. The cat's out of the bag. A few episodes ago, I, I trained like a bodybuilder and always have been. Um, just wanted to be well balanced, you know. I don't I don't want a weak chain in the link, you know. Traps, shoulders, you know, just the total package. But I think what Chris Chris is leading to is uh, what what do you work up uh, to uh, rolling dumbbells? What's the most you use? Because they always push. They always uh, see that's a secret. So, uh, for me personally. Um, since I deadlift and squat like a lot, like my elbows and shoulders get pretty jacked up. So I typically, I mean, I, I would say I usually stay around 40, 50 okay. pounds on a rolling dumbbell. Okay. I don't really go super heavy and it's solely because of that. Like I can only take so much wear and tear on my elbows and shoulders. So uh, that's just a case of, I just do what okay. I can do to make, to make thing work. Okay. But if you're saying, the big thing to up your bench press, like just in general, the secret to upping your bench press is speed work, because everybody does it wrong. I agree with you on that. And uh, speed, speed, speed work uh, eliminates transition, which is transition sticky is a sticky point. point. Uh, speed, speed also decreases the time under tension, which is the, the the amount of time your body strains under a load. So if you're decreasing the amount of time you're straining, you're decreasing the amount of time that you that you have to get injured. And uh, so I always took that. If I can get the lift over with quickly and I can do it fast, then I've got a better. Then you're, 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 there's less trauma being put on your body. So and, what, and what's fun, Dave, is a lot of people, newbies or you know, gym gym rat people, they don't train specifically for speed. So you know, in, in one case, and I'll try to make it short because this is your show. But uh, I took I took a kid. Uh, he wanted to bench with me, and I said, okay, I, I speed bench on this day, max on this day. He was a football coach. And uh, I said, well, I need to know what your one rep max is. It was 405. I said, so I, I constructed 45, 50% tiles with bands and chains, trained him for nine weeks, only saw him on speed day. And uh, after nine weeks, he came in and maxed him out. He did a 440 for a double and a 450 for a single, twanged his pec a little bit. And then I thought, uh, I thought he had been doing his own max effort training somewhere in there because he wasn't training with me. Well, two years later, he came back and told me, he goes, I was so busy with football, all I did was speed bench. And so speed bench itself put 40, you know, some pounds on his, on his bench. And uh, I didn't re Well, I, I try to tell people, like, it, it, you, you're recruiting muscles to fire. You're, 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 like, programming your neurons to fire all at once. Like, when you're down here and you hear a press call, uh, all that, there's no wind-up. It's almost like you, you get an immediate contraction of all your muscles at one time, that explosive power. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that that speed work is the only thing I, I say speed work is is bar speed and shirt. If you want to be faster in a shirt, you need to do speed work because that is what like when I see people benching in a shirt and they're slow as piss, I can be like, you don't know speed work. And they're like, well, as you know that, I'm like, it's fucking clear as day, dude. Like, you're I, I'm, I'm sitting here like this, like waiting for you to get done with your bench right. press. So, yeah, I, I always. So I, I, it's always like uh, that speed and explosive power. It's like I, I always mimic it, like getting hit with a cattle prod. You know, it's that explosive power, man. You gotta. Yeah. Uh, it's instant. It's it's instant horsepower, yeah. instant output. There's no the, and in, in, in seconds are everything with these kind of weights. You get what I'm saying? 
Like you don't, there's no, there's no margin for error. The bigger the number, the less margin for error and the more variables that you have to deal with. It's, you know, it's like Louis said, you know, we only have so long to strain. You only have so long to strain. And, you know, and uh, I, I still listen, Dave, you know, I'm, I may be in this game for 30 some years, but I'm still learning from other lifters. And it's, it's nice when uh, Julius Maddox, after he benched the 770, spent 20 minutes with me talking about uh, bench training, gave me his phone number. I mean, I mean, this uh, lifters passing other other knowledge down to other lifters is such a great thing in the sport, you know, so that's kind of fun. Well, one thing, one thing Louie always said to me, he said, he's a near try. He goes, he goes, you know, you know, weight's not measured in, what do you say? Weight isn't, uh, strength isn't measured in weight. It's time. measured in time. Time, not strength. Weight or strength is measured in time, not weight. So if I pull 500 pounds and you pull 500 pounds, but it takes me three seconds to pull it, but it takes you 10 seconds to pull it, who's stronger? You are. Yeah, yeah, because you get it because I completed the lift that's in right. three seconds, where it's ten seconds. So that so that's where Louis is saying you 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 don't you don't necessarily measure strength and weight time it's time. Absolutely. Cody Plum has a great question here. I think you'll you'll like. Yeah, this is a good question. What does Bob Co mean to you personally and to your career in powerlifting? Let me get that. What does Bob Coe mean to me? Well, I'll tell you this. Bob Coe was, he planted the seed of greatness in me in the very beginning. Like Bob, when I first started, made me believe that like I was the next great. That, But if I didn't do the things that it took to be great, I would not. So Bob was always the voice of reason telling me what it took to be great. And he would, and if I started getting stupid, he would smack me upside my head and tell me what I need to do. Uh, so Bob really, really built the foundation of uh, of how I approach weights, of how um, of how I approach not getting hurt. Um, he really, he looked out for me. So like um, uh, Bob, Bob was probably the reason why it lasted so long. Um, Bob, Bob, Bob kind of taught me what it meant to be like a training partner. He, he taught me what it meant to like what, how to coach people. Like I'd watch him coach people, hand out to, just everything. Like Bob wasn't a great power lifter himself. He had a lot of injuries. You know, I mean, he just was always that guy that was injured. He just he could just tear shit off left and right. But Bobby was really great help, man. He could wrap the best knees. He could hang a bench press, and that was Bob's way of contributing to the greater good of Westside. And especially in my career, you know, Bob would travel all over the place with me. He went to Vegas with me and watched me bomb out. Remember? Uh, so like, they, they, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, Bob was always there. And um, so yeah, how, how he was the. I, I'm sorry. Uh, how is Bob Co doing? I, I saw on the internet he had some health issues recently. Is he doing all right? Yeah. So he so he had AFib, so his heart was 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 real jacked up and um it was just a lot of years of bob works uh he's a he does a lot of hard manual labor he's a he does like commercial uh he's like a foreman for a commercial uh drywalling okay. company so you know he, he's just used to he's just used to working hard like that and just years of doing that just in what combined with his diet We'll just say, you know, like, you know, up until some point, you know, he may, he figured out healthier choices to make in life after he had a scare. But long story short, he, uh, they didn't know if he was going to make it. They had to do some procedures on him and start his heart back up and all those other other couple things that happened to him. And um, he was having some that started causing some kidney problems and they and he, and he kind of took a turn for the worse. But um, lo and behold, he. He turned around and pulled his shit right oh, out of it. And he's kicking. Yeah. Okay. So he's doing good now, and um, um, he's on the he's on the well on the road. Oh, good to, good. good to hear. Okay. Good. hear that. It, he's doing really well. Excellent. Um, Cody T was wondering, do you know Nathan Hole? H O L L E. I don't know that name. No, it didn't to me either. Nope. Sorry. I don't okay. know. Hole or Holly? No. Nope. Holly, okay. Holly. Oh, no. I'm not sure. Holly. No. <laughs> All right. All right. Moving on. Um, is Big Gene Richlack one of the greatest bench pressers of all time? Uh, I think Gene is. I'll, I'll say Gene was like, what do we call that? He was a. He was a. 
he paved the way for a lot of us to know what was possible. True. Uh, some people didn't like Gene. Others people did. I didn't really know Gene. Um, I didn't have much contact with him. But Gene is a power lifter. Um, was was the I'm trying. Um, he paved the way, man. He paved the way. He was the first guy to bench 900. He was the first guy to bench 1,000. And and you know what? Squatted 1,000, like too. Like I said, if it had, you're damn right he did. <laughs> he did squat 1,000. I think, he's total, I think he totaled over 25 or 2,600 or something like that. And another cool thing I can appreciate about Gene is he was a, he was a power lifter's power lifter, meaning like he was a guy that understood what a power lifter liked and wanted, and he had his RPS federation, and I believe that Gene gave back to the sport in a lot of great ways uh, when he wasn't lifting with running his meets and stuff like that. So um, Gene, Gene wasn't one that, you know, wasn't, I don't want to say he wasn't one of my favorites, but like he, he was, a, he was a, there's a, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, he paved the way. He paved the way for people like me and like That's you. true. I remember when he did the 900, I was still in the Ray Jack shirt, and he was in the Phenom. When he hit the 1,000, I called up John Enzer, and I said, I got to get in this Phenom. I got to figure it out. I remember John sent me that shirt, and having benched in that rigid Ray Jack for so long, I put on that Phenom, and it didn't even feel like it was a shirt. It was so stretchy. I remember I threw it in the court. Didn't you bench like 986 the meat after switching to that or something like that? Um... I I I put the I, I put the phenom on when I got the CPAP machine, and and I did a, a little meet up here. I think it was um, two or three weeks later, and I did nine seventy five. Just missed ten fifteen. Yeah. yeah, it was on the cover of Powerlifting USA. It was yeah, nine oh six, and then nine yeah. something something, and then you just like three monster benches on there. I, I, I had I had to I'll figure out that shirt. <laughs> That's what made me switch to a yeah. phenom, dude. Because I got to the point where I was wearing Karen Klein shirts, you know, her denim bench yep, press I shirts. One. And I just couldn't, I couldn't touch weight. I got to where 830 wouldn't touch because I was, my body was growing and my shirt wasn't getting, my shirt was getting smaller. So I got to where, and I remember Phil Harrington, he had a two-ply phenom and I tried to put it on and I blew it out with 765. Oh, uh -oh. I was like, well, a two-ply will not do, you know, that's not going to work. So uh, we got with John, and John sent me a three ply one, and it's been all. Awesome. That was that was what I needed. Yep. Apparently. Next question. Todd Beecraft wants to know what is his height and current body weight, and of course I have to ask, what does his neck measure at? My neck measure. I don't have a neck. Dude. I don't know. <laughs> my neck. Uh, um, height. Um, I like to say I'm five nine, depending on what pair of boots I'm wearing. <laughs> um, so I, I, I range anywhere from between 5'8 and 5'9, depending on how hard I squat that week. Okay. Uh, what's what's, what's and then the, my, like your weight. Body weight? My current body weight, I was 298 at the gym yesterday, so I'm around 300 right now. I just finally got started back to training because I got this week yep. coming up, so I got to do some. Okay. And you didn't know your neck measurement? <laughs> No okay. way. 20, 22 I, plus. I, yeah. There we go. I just thought it would be hard to choke me with your <laughs> here, here's a, here's a Here's a lot of questions right here. For okay. Synth. Synth has a question. So. Okay. Can Dave talk about the repetition, about repetition effort? How have you been inserted? How have you inserted it into a typical conjugate setup? Replace DE day for RE. How would that be done for lower body? Thanks. Okay, so like repetition method, um, me and Louie probably have a varying, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, definitions of this. Okay. So repetition method might be something like, for example, on a speed bench press day, um, if we're doing bands that day, uh, and if let's say we do a three week wave, maybe in week two, I might pull the bands at the end of the workout. I might do my nine sets of three, changing my grips. And then I might pick one grip that I didn't really do the whole workout and I'll do a burn and I'll do a rep out set. That. So, uh, there are times where I'll do like a lot of drop burnout sets and speed bench press day. Like, um, the weight, the weight will vary on those. Uh, what else? Um, 
I do the same for max effort day. Sometimes, let's, for example, I work up on a three bull or something like that raw. I might work up to a max effort single, and then I might drop set down to uh, four or five plates and just do a, a repetition, like as many as I can do on a certain rib. And that's just like one that. set? Yeah, usually it's just okay. one set. Because uh, if you pick the right weight, um, I, I'm a fan of just one burnout set. I don't know how many. If you have to do two, then I don't, you know, maybe you didn't use enough weight. I mean, so if it's a max effort day, my, my repetitions, whatever you want to call it, my burnout set are going to be on the heavier side. Okay. And then on speed bench press day, I keep it on the lighter side. So it's like, I can it's, no, the, the trick with this shit is just don't get, don't get, don't try to make it over complicated. It's the most, keep it basic. And if you just keep shit basic, I try to tell people this, like most, all of my training, 80% of my training is the same. Almost every time. Okay. 20% of my training is, 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 is a, is an experiment or new things I'll introduce or new things I'll try because if, uh, if I go through a training cycle and I total 3,100 and I go through the next one and I do something completely different, I don't know what the fuck worked and what didn't work. You get yeah, what I'm totally. saying? I know 80% of this works. So if I always, basically, if I'm, I always have an output of 80% of the meat, and if I go beyond that, I know it has something to do with the 20% I experimented with. So my variable, I only have like 20% of something to go through rather than 100% of the That's Right, cycle. that makes sense. Well, the new or the old stuff that works. So uh, I limit variables and test only few things at a time. So I know if that thing works or doesn't work. Okay. Um, what percentages do you stick to for the dynamic effort squats? Uh, same thing it says in the West Side book. I use 50, 55, and 60% most times in a three week wave. Uh, the accommodating resistance will change. Um, Sometimes, depending on the person, will will dictate the amount of reps they do. Uh, I remember uh, when Westside started losing all of our fat guys, all the little guys had problems with eight sets of two because they they, they weren't getting the, it didn't it didn't affect them the same as it did a bigger man. Uh, Louis said something about like a uh, bigger man's glycogen levels deplete faster than a smaller man, so a bigger man can't do five reps where a smaller, skinnier guy can, like those little ectomorph mm -hmm. body types, you know what I mean? Like they need more, they need more volume. Like somebody like her, I'd have to do five sets of five most times, six sets of three times shit. Uh, a bigger man like you would be uh, triples and doubles. Um, um, I think that there's uh, certain rep schemes will get you in shape. Um, I think when you get into higher reps, it's harder to build a speed and explosive power. I think those things are built in shorter rep ranges in the twos and threes. Um, so you have to have a healthy mixture of distributing of how many reps you're doing and sets you doing. That makes sense. That yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, totally. Cody T gotcha. has a question. Dave, do you train grip? So you yes. You want a deadlift, you have to. So grip work, I do a lot of plate pinches. So like I'll take a, like quarters, 225 pound plates, squeeze them together. And one of the big things I do is I get a five gallon bucket of sand and I take my hand and I just dig down in there as, as far as I can go. Open it and close it and make it a fist. Take, take the sand out and squeeze it as hard as you can. Let the sand run through your hands. I've never done that. I do that kind of stuff. That's a cool idea. Yep. I like that. that's, that's, that's one of the main things I do for grip. One, one thing Gary Frank told me to do for grip all right, Dave, what I do for grip is I go in the rack and I put a thousand pounds in the rack and then I pull it and I hold it for a minute. I'm, I'm like, Gary, I can't hold it. Gary, I can't hold a thousand pounds. I'm like, that's not grip work. I, I, I can't do that. So, like, I kind of geared it down to me where I would maybe put like quad bands up in a rack or something. And, uh, you see at Westside, they'll do a, like a quadded mini band in a rack where they'll, they'll take a band and fold it in half and then put that in a, in, in a power rack. And it's probably 250 pounds of band tension, and I'll put as much plates as like two or three plates on there, and I'll pick it up and hold it for time, um, stuff like that. Plate pinches, I said that. Um, that's another thing I do. Uh, any of the little grip machines? Yep. We do those sometimes, but mostly it's the it's the bucket of sand. Okay. Cool idea, I like the sand thing. 
A lot of fighters do that. I did not know that. Um, wow. Okay. Builds all it builds like all the muscles on the top of your hand and your wrist and stuff. How often would you do that that grip work? Or would you do that one? Yeah, uh, it, um, it's it's pretty situational. Like uh, I I typically don't do grip work on the days I pull heavy deadlifts because my grip's already waxed right. and how it's kind of like it's called training optimally. You have to put the shit in the right spots where you're going to get the most from them. Mm -hmm. uh, I always say do exactly what you have to do, no more, no less. Um, so. Um, if I'm doing like speed pulls or it's like um, a, some kind of good morning variation on that max effort Monday, that's that's a time I'll do it. It could be you know, you know once once every three weeks when I get closer to the meets, I do more of that kind of stuff. Um, I think that your your body you can fall to what's called the law of accommodation. If you keep doing the same shit over and over for too long, just like we we, we talked in your shows. Where if you, you, you sit there and live on bands, your body acclimates to the bands and you get worse. Right. Okay. Lewis said something about like a Golden Gloves boxing. If, you, if your Ryan was a Golden Gloves boxing champion and we were training partners and, you know, we're, we're sparring and he, boom, he knocks me out. And then I get up and then we start sparring again and he knocks me out. Every workout for three weeks, it's knocking me out. Well, as soon as I figure out that that overhand right's coming and I duck it and I knock Ryan out, immediately I've acclimated to his stimulus. So I'm not getting better anymore. That's what Louis says. He said, as soon as you acclimate to something, you're not getting better anymore. You're getting worse because you never, you never ever stay the same. You either get, you either get a little bit better, or you get a little bit worse. Okay. So I've always kind of taken the mentality, and no matter if it's this much, it's you know, I'd rather get this much better than this much worse. Never okay. stays. So you know, you know, months of getting a little bit better adds up to a lot of That's better. True. Right. Okay. Um, I just wanted to hear the man himself, but one question I had is, do you think there's an age limit to getting stronger? No, I don't. And I'll tell you this, because Chuck was... I'll tell, I can go, this is actually a good one. I, I think if you are smart in your body and you know how to, you, you know what certain exercises do to your body after a while of doing so many exercises you know how long it takes to recover from certain things so you can plan for them and i think some of these older guys like donnie thompson's one of them chuck's one of them chuck squatted 1180 and he was 47 years old donnie was 48 or 49 and totaled 3000 louis was what 54 55 years old and squatted 930 or 920 and that was the biggest squat that he had done up until that time so Louis trained his whole life trying to hit the golden number, and after he broke his back twice, when people when he had retired, you know, he comes out of retirement and squats 920. So it's it's, it's I think a lot of that's mental, and uh, how how good how how in one piece your body is like how 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 damaged you are. You know, some of these guys are super damaged like Chuck and Louis, but still they somehow fucking did it, and that's more a tribute to their want to do it. You know. As a bench presser, you know, one, one of the big names that comes up is Bill Gillespie. You know, the guy's 60 years old and and uh, squat, has benched uh, 1,000 pounds a couple times. And so that, that, that was something that impressed me that, uh, you know, when I get 60, I still may be able to do this. We'll see, you know. But I have to train a little smarter. That's a, they, they give me a little bit of hope. Like when you say, where, where, do, you, where do I see myself in 10 years? Well, I'm not quite sure, but... Uh, Somebody like Bill Gillespie, that guy, he's really impressive, and that's a tribute to uh, how smart he is in yes. training. I don't care who you are, what kind of gear you're using. If you're putting a thousand pounds over your face and you're 60 years old, <laughs> you know, you're doing something. Right. You get what I'm saying? Totally. Mr. Elite Entertainment has a question for Dave. Is there any cues that Dave follows when attempting a squat? Be interesting to know what are the common mistakes in his opinion when it comes to squatting. Oh uh, yeah, um, a lot of people they don't step up into the rack. Like if you ever watch me when I squat, I step way up into the rack. Um, I will. I was always of the of the opinion I would rather unrack the weight and fall backwards and have somebody catch me than unrack it and do a Lee Moran and the shit flip over my head. Yeah. So um, to prevent shit from 
basically unracking it and falling forward, you have to step up into the rack. And I learned that more when I started getting into like the upper 12s and the high 11s into the 12s. Um, the margin for error is so so small, and you have to be just literally in the right spot. Like it's it's really hard to describe. But um, stepping up into the rack is something that people don't do a lot. Um, I don't. You know, Louis. See, these are difference of opinions. Louis always tell people to arch out the rack, and I don't do that. Uh, Chuck told me to leg press it out the rack. So basically, I would lock my whole torso in place. If, if you ever see me when I take my air, I straighten my legs out to get my air, and I bring my chest up, and then I just leg press it out the rack. Okay. okay. So none of this shit, too. So that's one thing I, I tell people, leg, leg press it out, legs, legs, legs. So, probably nothing nobody's haven't heard before. Is that it? But sometimes some you still get the cues when you squat, Dave, back, 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 or down, 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 or as you're squatting? Um, see, Louis, well, see, Louis was always a back, 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 and when I had those cues, I just kept going back, back, back until I fell. Oh. So I like to somebody to tell me where okay. I'm at rather than just tell me just back, back, back. You like, so, I heard on your uh, squat video, three, I'm, two, one. Yeah. That's something I learned from Phil Harrington and Chuck too. Um, uh, they would, when you would get about three inches above breaking, they'd tell me, okay, three inches, two inches, one inch. And in my head, I can see myself squatting on a video. Yeah. Like I, I can like see, like when I'm lifting, you probably have it too. Like you can, you can kind of like have an out of body experience and see yourself lifting. Yes. Maybe I'm weird and that's just me, but um, yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Question for Dave. Question for Dave. I saw a video of you benching 970. Then you shoved a guy. Did you not like him, or was it a joke to shove him? So, that was Bob. Yeah, that... here's the thing. Like, you have to understand. Like, these dudes talk shit to me for 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 weeks in and weeks <laughs> out. And it's like they run their mouth. They piss me off, and and I have to sit there and be like, okay, that's my time. To get them back. To give it back. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. So, I don't. That's a, a lot of the times, I, I I'm just really jacked up, and I don't really mean to hit them in the hard. <laughs> it happens. It happens. So that was Bob Cut. Okay. Because what on that particular bench, I missed the 970 on a second. I had to come back and get on the third. So. Okay. In that particular. Uh, that 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 kind of leads into the next question about shoving. Um, because, you know, I want to I talk about when you shoved Louis Simmons to the ground. I We posted that v video oh. in the beginning, and uh, this next guy here is uh, has got a question for you about, kind of, I think, referencing that. Is Yeah, I think it is. Is there any bad blood with Louis? And when you ran him over after your lift, did that satisfy you, or did you feel bad? I'm assuming that's... Uh, well... Oh no! Me, I, there's no bad blood between me and Lou. It's just the rivalry of the gym. It's it's the cutthroat rivalry of Westside. That's the mentality there. Like that's how it is. People, that's how. Like, I'm there. My job is to lift more weights than him and anybody he puts in front of me. And his job is to have his guys that's keep right. me. Like that's, that's what it is. And if you're not there to be the best, then then you shouldn't be there. Um, so. I didn't like. I didn't. I didn't like. So Louis just runs his mouth, man. He pisses you off. So like, I, I just log it in my book, you know. Okay, I note it, and I wait until I'm allowed to tell him how I feel. And rather than argue with him, I'll just do, he gets a bike in those kind of dosages. There was one time I think it was the meet. I let's see. I think I totaled uh, 2960. Um, I remember I pulled my deadlift and I turned around looking for Lou and he had ran his mouth to me the whole training cycle and he knew I was coming for him and he looked at me and like there was nowhere for him to go and I remember <laughs> I picked him up and I hit him. It was like a weird thing where I had just picked him up and ran into him <laughs> and the back of his head is the back of his head caught the light machine, you know, with the lights. And then I headbutted him in the forehead and he had to get like four stitches. Oh no shit. So that was it's like nothing new like this is like when all this shit this has always happened like this isn't when, when people see this stuff like on when i saw it on sports center the next day i was like oh my goodness like like i look like i'm trying to hurt this old man but but what had happened was is i 
that was for 3014 and uh, I had not that was at an APF Nationals meet which to me was the best place you could have ever done something like that and um, um, so I was looking for Lou to like celebrate with him but I was jacked up and I'm used to Louie like kind of meeting me and, and hitting me you know what I mean so I was like racing for impact but I you know Louie's kind of gotten old and, uh, <laughs> So I, I came around the corner and and you can kind of see in the video I go to, I go to hit him and he tries to grab the back of my head to like hold on to me, but he like misses me, and I remember like I hit him and as soon as I hit him I knew I fucked up I was like oh <laughs> shit like his uh, his his feet went up in the air and I remember I hit him so hard it's like it, I have a it was like a still frame picture in my head. His eyes were like closed. It was, I don't want to say it was like I don't want to say it was like a funeral, but like when somebody's like in a you know he, his, his hands were like pinned against his oh. chest and he hit the ground and his head hit the ground and I was like oh I killed shit, him. what have I done? <laughs> God killed him. So I ran up there and I tried to pick him up and he goes oh motherfucker he goes he's like you fucking hit me motherfucker I was like I am sorry. <laughs> But you got in the way. You, in my defense, he came from the crowd all the way up to me. So, uh, to that point, we go to we go to breakfast the next uh, Monday. So this was Saturday. So Sunday, Monday rolls around. We go to breakfast, and he comes up. He goes, "Here's me, Trump." He goes, "Look." He goes, "I can look to the right now." <laughs> I haven't been able to do that in five oh. years. And then he stands up and he bends over and touches his toe. He goes, I haven't been able to do that in five years either. Oh. He's like, you fixed my hip. <laughs> so, like, when I, when I hit him, like, his head hit the ground and, like, I stretched him out and it, like, popped everything. I gave him a concussion, too, but he doesn't know I know that. <laughs> he was, he, they had to, like, carry him in. I felt really bad after it, but uh, but only for a minute. <laughs> hey, D Dave, we lost you on camera. Can you scoot over? Uh, um, Other way. A little bit more. There you are. A little bit more. A little bit more. There. You're centered. Perfect. You okay. Go. Didn't mean to interrupt you. A little you. too much. We oh. just, we... No, dude. I, it's so funny. Like, I moved all the way from the right side. This thing must be moving. It is. Like, Something I moved all weird the way... is happening with the your, camera. Your camera's bouncing around a little mm -hmm. bit. But we'll make it work. Because we'll see you, and then we'll see it kind of move. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's on our end. or. Can you see me now? Yeah. Good. You can scoot over a little bit the other way. Uh, to the other way. Other way. Other way. Other, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit. They're there centered go. right there. Good. There you go. D don't move. Right. Sorry, don't I move. know that's just, that's really annoying. I, no, <laughs> sorry about baby. that. Sorry about that, Dave. So, a little technical difficulty. So yeah, I don't really feel bad for hitting him like that. That's just something we've always done. I've hit Bob. I've hit Louie. Uh, it, it was funny because uh, my my mom called me one day. She goes, "I just saw you on MTV. It's ridiculous." I saw that. <laughs> that's hilarious. And like I don't know how the hell it got on to Rob that Rob the MTV, but that was pretty That's... cool. So they did a segment on that. Like, why is this guy hitting this old man? <laughs> like, the only the shit the old man talked prior to that. <laughs> Had it coming. If only they knew. That's what I. Said. We gotta watch. We gotta watch that episode. You know what? To that point, Louis will tell you. He said he'll take a. He, he said, dude, if if it means a world record for his gym, he'll take a punch right to the face. He doesn't care. Wow, wow. That's that's feels about it. He said, I'll take that to get a world record. If that means my guy broke a world record, then that that Perfect. Louis loves that. People need to understand that. Like, that's like what that. Nice. Intense. Very cool. Next question. Uh, right here, Kathleen. Kathleen, do you ever deload? Oh yes, oh yeah, buddy. Um, most times, um, a deload week comes after a three week wave, you know, sometimes we'll go like for box squatting. I'm, I usually free squat every fourth or fifth week, sometimes every sixth week. So I'll go through a three week wave of box squatting. And usually that fourth week, I assess how those three weeks hurt or didn't hurt me. And I will either deload or continue on into the next wave. So it kind of like deload weeks are usually, uh, sometimes they're a workout, sometimes they're a week. It just kind of depends on how much things I've stacked in one week. Did I put a shirt on in the same week that I free squatted? Um, if that's the case, I'm not going to deadlift after that. I'll just deload and deadlift the week after that. Stuff like that. 
So I just I, I've always been a fan of space and shit out. Louis kind of disagrees with me on that because he, think, he thinks that's detraining. training. You know, you're either lifting maximally or you're not. You know what I mean? So it always worked for me. I just kind of like I would always I, I just don't like working out in pain. Like there is no pain, no gain, but there's there's also being able to do the shit right. Correct. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And if I can't do it right, I just wouldn't you know wouldn't do it. Just remember, like, we're not getting free health insurance. No, we're not. Right, right. Not a million dollar check yet. 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 <laughs> I'm going to keep hoping for that. Oh, yeah. You mean you don't need any, need any more bragging rights, trophies, or free t-shirts? <laughs> yeah, you're right. I would love some free t-shirts. <laughs> Cody Plum. All right, Cody Plum wants to know what's your favorite gear you've used i see a lot of old pics of west side guys wearing metal seems like there was an inzer area era too i have all metal suits and shirts but just ordered three inzer shirts um me personally i have always worn um inzer gear um i've been lucky enough to have john always take care of me when it comes to uh, gear he sponsored me pretty much my entire career through the gym also. Um, so anytime I ever needed a bench shirt, John was always there to send me one. Um, I think John makes the best gear, and I think that has something to do with it being around for mm-hmm. so long. John's had a lot of, uh, he's had a lot of, just like Westside, for example, he's had a lot of years of trial and error and, and improvement, and he's had a lot of the strongest guys like you, you know, give him feedback on what he should do with a oh. shirt. and. Gary Frank was another one. The the Leviathan squat suit was named after Gary Frank because Gary was the Louisiana Leviathan. That was his name. Wow. So, yeah. So that was so yeah. So Inzer Gear is probably is probably the only gear I would ever use. There's some other good gear companies out there, um, but my always thing is I looked at what who was lifting the most weights and what they were wearing, and that was an easy sell for me, and it would just happen to be Inzer. You were at the time were the one uh, bench in 1070s, 1050s. Yep. So I was like, well, I'm going to wear a phenom because that's what the big guy in the bench is. I want to bench 1,000 yep. pounds. Okay, so this guy's squatting 1,200 in a canvas suit. I'm going to wear that suit. You yep. know what I mean? Um, a lot of this gear, um, I think, comes down to personal preference also. Um, some gear, some certain gears might not work well for other people. But for the most part, Inzer is probably your one-stop shop for anything you can want. For True. It's tried and tested, you know what I mean? Okay. So, that's my goal. What is the craziest variation of any lift you've done for training? Craziest variation? So, like. I'm pretty simple with variations. I mean, like maybe the craziest, like training weight or something like that. I think I've done like, I've done some 1130 board presses. I think that's my best uh, one. I think I've done 1121, 1115 off of a one board. Um, I guess you could consider that a variation. Um, I've, I've gotten uh, close to 1300. That's the thing, man. I don't take chances a lot in the gym. Um, I take chances in the meets right. where you get credit. Right. I'm not a gym. I'm, I'm not, I never was one to be a gym lifter and post shit. I mean, like I get shit because I post one thing on Instagram every three weeks. It's like uh, I'm not here to post training videos to get followers. I'm here to lift the biggest weights and win. So uh, I guess it's like, what are you about? You know, are you about a social media following, or are you about being the best? You know? A weird um, question. What's your biggest raw bench? Oh, uh, well, that's a good question. I, I was waiting for this one. <laughs> I wonder when somebody. Okay. Uh, well, the most I've ever done. So here's the thing. I don't. I don't really bench raw off my chest. It's usually like boards or one board. I've done a, I think my best one board is a 661 Damn. board. Wow. That puts around like, um, I think a touch and go, I could probably do between 635 and 650. Wow. Um, 
when I'm closer to meat, like probably I probably could have been 650 raw probably when I did the super finals in the last October. Uh, right mm -hmm. now I'm probably like around a six, but that usually improves as I get through the training cycle. So. Wow. It usually it, it's always over six. Nice. But it's it usually starts slowing down and you get to the mid sixes. I'll hit some 700 pound board press as well, but. So a lot of my training's done raw, dude. Like I mean, people like, like I don't, I don't, I don't really weird people. That's how it was at Westside. People don't understand that. Like back in the day, like uh, when I first started, the first five or six years I was there, we didn't put bench shirts on. We, you, if you put a bench shirt on, you were a fucking pussy. You train. You don't put shirts on. Uh, I was allowed to put my shirt on three weeks out from the meet, and I took a three board, and that's all I did. Really? That. Well, yeah, that's all I was allowed to do. I just, you had to nut the fuck up and be a bench presser. Like, that's, that's how it was. Oh. So I learned quick. Yep. Richard Riviera has a question. You will, you will compete in the WPO to overcome your own total blessings. Greetings from Panama, a true monster of powerlifting. So not really a, a question, kind of a just kind of a compliment. So. Um, well, I mean, it's, you're always looking to the next number. So, yeah. you know, everybody asks me, what do I want to do? It's like, well, more than I did the last right. time. <laughs> I'm, I've got a plan. I'm not one to really talk about what my goals and plans are, but there, my plans are always to lift more and significantly more. Um, you know, and I don't plan on being done anytime That's soon. That's good. Nice. So, That's good. Um, you know. I could see, you know, I could say I, I at least have another three to five years doing it. And I'm just saying that is like a, I, I'm pretty sure it's all you know, Barring what happens in those three to five right. years. You know, right. There comes, there'll come a time, you know what I mean? There, you'll, there'll just come a time when the juice isn't going to be worth the squeeze. That's and right. You're just going to have to cross that bridge when you get to it. Yeah. Can you explain the exercises he had you do for the scar tissue in your hip? Yeah. So a lot of uh, the first thing that Donnie did to me is he, he would lay me on my back and he attached a green band to a power rack, right? So at the base of the power rack, he put the band on it and I would open the band up and I stuck my leg through it. Yes. Okay. And okay. I put it all the way down to where my groin was at. And I would scoot away from the power rack, so the uh, the band pulled my hip over, basically, at, almost out of its socket, kind Whoa. of. And Donnie would push pushed it down, so he would move me away from the rack. That band would pull my impinged hip kind of out of socket back to where it was supposed to be, and then Donnie would put all of his weight down on my kneecap and crush my fucking ass cheek into the concrete. So. It's like he was using my like hip socket to diffuse my glute. Does that make sense? Wow. Yeah. How, on a pain scale, on a pain scale one to ten, what was that? Ten beat. Uh, ten. Oh really? Yeah, was, oh. Uh, I about passed out. Oh shit. There was a time, the first time he worked on it. Like I'm not joking. I I almost passed out. Like I was sweating and stuff. It was it was really hard. It was, it was not easy. To do. Oh. And uh, he put he put some uh, some of his temporary rollers on my IT band, and I would almost pass out from it. Um, but it was only like that one time. And after he did it that one time, it was easier and easier and easier and easier to have it worked on. Um, a lot of the things that we do is called static tempering, which is uh, where you just where you take a roller and you, you leave it sit on tissue and have it diffuse the tissue. So a lot of times what we do is we take a 160 pound roller and we put it on your glutes let it sit there for a minute or two and let let, let that 160 pound roller sink down into the tissue down to that bottom layer of muscle and then he would roll it down your glutes um, all the way down your hamstrings and let it sit between at the bend of your knee and then he would take another 160 pound or 180 pound roller and do the same thing oh. and until you had about three rollers from your glutes to your knees so one two three you know oh saying? my god wow that sit on me for five minutes and what that would do is all that weight would sit there and diffuse my hamstrings. It would break apart all the scar tissue in my hamstrings. And what that does is it lengthens tissue. 
So when you're when you're all bound up, um, uh, all this shit does is sits there and starts breaking up uh, scar tissue. Uh, and when when you lengthen tissue, it starts taking um, um, it starts taking like tension off of of like tie-in points. So if I'm diffusing my hamstring, it's going to loosen up my hip because when your hamstring's tight, it's going to pull down on your glute. You know what I'm saying? When your glute starts affecting your psoas and your adductors and stuff like that. It just goes in a line. So what mine was doing is my hip was getting in pins and it was pulling in, pulling my IT band up. So I was starting to get knee pain. And then from your knee, it goes down into your calf, down into your Achilles, and you start carrying your Achilles tendon. So it, it runs down into trap. Wow. So a lot of what we do is that di- that static temporary where we would leave these body temporary rolls on you and let it let it sit there and diffuse tissue. And after so long, you'd be able to roll the the body tempering device on you f- more freely without um, resistance, so to say. Um, another one that's called a dynamic tempering is where you're rolling the device. Static tempering, you sit for time. Dynamic tempering, you roll. So you would roll it up your back and you'd roll it down to your glutes and then down to your knees and then roll it up your roll it up your calves and let it sit on your uh, Achilles tendons and you loosen that shit up down there and you roll it back up. Um, then we'd flip over and we'd stick it and put it on your quads. You know, I'd do that. I I sit there and put it on the top of my quads. Um, so if you have a knee, a lot of knee problems, if you're having like tightness in your knees, that helps with that a lot. Uh, there's also something called tourniquet tempering that I do, which will take a floss band. Like this might be something good for shoulders and elbows. Um, if uh, you're having bad range of motion in shoulders and stuff like that, uh, we'll put our arm up on like a bench and we'll tourniquet wrap. I'll take a piece of floss band and I'll wrap from my shoulder down to here and back up and then wrap it with a knee wrap. And then we'll lay body tempering devices on it for time, stack dynamic tempering, stuff like that. Uh, so if you ever watch, if you ever have, if you ever want to watch any of that, go look on Johnny Thompson's Instagram. I think it's Stored Shed at Stored Shed or at Johnny Thompson or at Thompson Fat Fat, something okay. like that. Uh, but Johnny puts a lot of videos on how to do all this stuff, and that is the only thing that is the reason why that I'm not trashed. Uh-huh. So that's something I would suggest to anybody: athletes, football players, basketball players, wrestlers, anybody, MMA fighters. Anything that anything where you can develop scar tissue. Um, and what's what's crazy is after you get a 20 minute body tempering session in, you'll you'll stand up and feel like you're completely wasted. Oh. You ever you ever feel like ART oh, yeah. therapy and you get up ART therapy and you feel yep. drunk? Body tempering is AR it's an hour's worth of AR hour to an hour and a half worth of ART therapy in 20, 20 minutes. I have not had to go back to the chiropractor or uh, or an ART therapist or have any kind of massage work done since I body tempered. Do you use a TENS unit at all? Um, not. I used to in the past, but like I said, I got away from a lot of that stuff because it felt like the body tempering kind of okay. did all that stuff. I think those are good, um, like especially if you uh, if you really tweak something or strained a muscle. And you can't work it or get blood into it. I think the tens unit is something that's really okay. good to help stimulate uh, recovery and a muscle that you can't really work with. You I got know what you. I'm saying? That's just my okay. uh, ne- next question is uh, opinion on Maddox. I'm sure, I'm sure it's Julius Maddox. What opinion? He's incredible, yeah. man. Like that's a one of a kind specimen. Yeah. He's he's like one of those. It's like Scott Mendelson when he came around. He was like a one of a kind specimen at the time. It's like this generation's one of a kind specimen. Um, you, 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 you may never see it. You catch him while he's here because you might not never see another one like him. In our lifetime, that's right. correct. For sure. Yeah. My, my opinion, my, my opinion my, he's going to do 800 pounds. That's my opinion. And, uh... Oh, yeah. I think people in powerlifting need to quit bitching about, uh, I think it's just the divide in our sport. Um, I think if people need to just appreciate these kind of things rather than give a shit how they do it, so to say, like for, you need to appreciate because when they're gone, they're gone. You know what I mean? Like that's it. There's no more Bill Kazmaier. We can't, we can't watch Bill Kazmaier. That's no nope. We can't watch Ed Cope. Yeah, those guys are gone. Paul Anderson. And yeah. when, yeah, man. The, when appreciate gone, it while it's here. Gone. 
That's what I'm trying to say. So. Okay. John Smith? West Side Team versus Metal Militia Team. What are your thoughts? I don't. West Side Team versus Metal Militia Team? Who's the Metal Militia like, Team? I don't. Um, I know Metal Militia. Uh, I know Bill Crawford. Um, he was a. He was kind of a. The cowboy of the. I don't want to try. What's the word I'm looking for? He's a. He was kind of another guy like Gene that paved the way for uh, bench pressures, I think. I remember he had canvas bench pressures back in the day and he had uh, some, some really unique denim shirts and he had some new training techniques over time. Um, I don't I don't really, in terms of going against Westside, I don't really think there's a comparison right. in terms of... But I know that Metal Militia has is, is been around for a long time. I know they've always had some really strong bench right. presses. Um, I know, like, Sebastian Burns, I think he was one. Bill Crawford. Um, Crawford. Yeah. Crawford. Uh, you had um, Mike Miller. I think that was Nazareth Barber. Bobby Fields. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, we'll move on. Do you want me to answer my own uh, question here? Oh, sorry. I was, I was reading some of the other ones. Um... Somebody wants to know. Ryan, I can't find a YouTube video of you doing 225 for reps. How many times can you do 225 on a good day? Um, uh, I would assume <laughs> over 50. Um, my, my best, you, you know. 315 my, for 20. Well, 315 for 40 at the was animal it 40? cage. 40? 40 reps in the animal cage hung over. Oh, it because, was 400 that was Yeah, I, I benched an 8, 4, 840 the day before on main stage. Went out with, uh, who did I go out with? Um, uh, oh, uh, Jeff McVicker. It was Crown Royal. It was this, that, and the other. I woke up the next day. Thank you and uh, I like yeah. Frank May. He would get in Facebook jail so many times he had to like change his name to Frank I May saw that. on Facebook. Yeah, well, anyway, in the animal ca cage, they like were doing body weight for reps. I was 315. I went in there and I did 40 reps and about died after I got off the bench. But that's uh, that's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> I think my best. I think my best three fifteen. I think I did it for thirty three. Yeah. I think that was my. Wow, that's a lot. That's Synth a lot. has a question for Dave. How often do you do you use the bamboo bar? Your three hundred for ten video is legendary. Oh, well, I forgot all about that. <laughs> um, that's that's something I use a lot on a dynamic day. You know what I mean? It's like I use it uh, I, when I'm done speed bench pressing. I'll hang a bunch of kettlebells on there, and same thing. I might I might do a standing overhead press with a kettle bar, or, or, sorry, a bamboo bar, and hanging kettlebells, shit like that. Um, I don't typically go heavy on them anymore. But like, let's for example say like if I wanted to use it on a max effort day, I would stack a bunch of kettlebells and just wrap out a heavy with that set or two. So I still use it relatively a lot. It's got another one. It's called, I think, a tsunami bar, where you can actually, it's got Olympic collars on it. So it's a bamboo bar with which you can put, like, plates on it. Oh, cool. I know, I know one of the bars I saw uh, at Westside that impressed me was a bamboo bar with a camber in it. I thought that was, i never seen that before. I, I, I like specialty bars. Yeah. yeah, the guy that makes them, his name's Jimmy Seitzer. It's, it's Ban, Bandel, I believe. And uh, Jimmy's a really great guy. He's a... Uh, you always you always bring bars in to have me try it. Now, Dave, I made this bar this way. You just try it out. Let me know what you think. And uh, so, Jimmy makes really good products. Jim Seitzer, and um, I, I suggest the bar to anybody. Jimmy's a really great guy. He makes good products, and you won't be disappointed. I know. I asked. I, I know. Like I asked it. you this question before, Dave. Uh, bench press bar, saber tooth, or the West Side bar. Which one do you use again? Um, I've I've never used the saber tooth okay. bar. But I know that it is a pound bar, and prior to the first, okay, so I want to say this was around 2010, we started, me and AJ started getting up into the nines, and Louie was like, well, you know, I saw, I was telling Louie, I was like, watch Ryan, these things turn into a fucking uh, cambered bar bench press yeah. in a shirt, you know what I mean? Like, 45-pound bars, you put a G on there, they're bending, and you got an That's inch right. camber in it, and... So we had told Louie that. Louie was like, well, I'll see if I can have somebody make some bigger bars. So Louie got with Texas, I believe, Texas Power Bar. 
and he had to make the full, first Bulldog bench bar. There were 50-pound bars, and the collars were longer on them, and the, the bar was thicker. And then it got to the point where we were running out of room to do three-man handouts, so we're like, hey, man, I need, like, a longer collar so, like, dudes can still spot yep. me, you know what I mean? They're not spotting a nub on the side of the bar, you know right. what I mean? So then we had the 55-pound bull, 55 pound bulldog bars, and up until I left Westside, those were the ones I was using there. But at Doghouse, we got the uh, the older 50 pound one, so it's akin to a saber tooth. So I think uh, if it's, if any any one of those bars, they're they're whatever you can get your hands on, and they're pretty much the same. Thing. They're spendy too. I know the Westside one was 600 bucks, I believe, on their website. Yeah. Maybe Louie will give me a discount. Damn right. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they'll always take shipping, and then the shipping is where they. That's really true. Right. That's true. John Smith has a question. Um, what's Travis doing now? Travis Mash? Mash or Fletcher? I don't know which uh, one. Doesn't specify. Uh, well, we'll tell you both. Travis Mash? Uh, if you're referring to Travis Mash, Travis Mash is in North Carolina and he has Mash Performance, which is a gym he has there. Nice. Works with a lot of Olympic weight. He's an Olympic weightlifting coach for the most part that I can see. Uh, doesn't really much powerlifting anymore. Those days are kind of behind him. So that's Travis. Uh, the guy that brought me to Westside, who's the same as Travis Fletcher, that guy, he kind of just, um, his time ran through the sport. And uh, he had a shoulder injury, and he kind of pulled away, got a better job, and kind of moved on to bigger and better things. I actually saw him two weeks ago, so it was oh. kind of funny. So I, I still see these guys, you know, relatively, you know, frequently. So people... People like that, I still have a oddly a relationship. So. Next question. Okay. Um, what advice do you have for older lifters? Mm. Mm, that's a good, <laughs> one. A good one, right? You got. Yeah, usually it's like don't do this, don't do that. Uh, older lifters. Um, I would say, man, this is, a lot of people might disagree with me on this, but what I found is a lot of the older people I've come into contact with, you have to like not start them off on full range shit. So like, if, if I, there, uh, uh, there's a guy, Jimmy Harris, he's not old, but he, you know, he's in his forties. You know, what I mean, he's had a lot of wear and tear on him, and. Um, you know, I'm like, all right, Jimmy, you're starting back. We're just going to go on a high bump. So, you know, don't don't worry about breaking parallel at the beginning of your training cycle. Worry about that shit five weeks out when, you know, your body, you know, can recover from that shit without blasting it like that. For right. 10, you get what I'm saying? So old, I say older guys, uh, um, don't don't go, don't jump in the shit so quick. Kind of pace yourself. Um, really listen to your, really listen to your body. If something hurts, stop. You know what I mean? Makes sense. That's a bit. It's pretty much the same shit for anybody. You just you're gonna have to listen to your body a lot more. Older guys tend to blood pressure seems to be an issue as the age seems to increase. So if you're an older person, I would I would caution you to watch your blood pressure because that's a good way to get to, to be really done quick. Um, um, so older gentlemen, watch your blood pressure. And that can be brought down through better diet and eating habits, probably. Sometimes that's a uh, congenital, you know, that's just, just passed on. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, just got to be smart. What do, you, what do you do for recovery, and which is your favorite, and why? So I guess, like, what recovery technique. Time? Which recovery technique uh, is your favorite? Really good thing. For like, just sum it up. Like, if if you're really fucked from squatting or deadlifting, pulling a sled is a really good way to bust the cobwebs loose. If you're sore, um, any kind of ab work, you know what I'm saying? Like light pull downs. If you, um, anything like a sled work to pump a bunch of blood into sore muscles. Like that that that's going to help with recovery. Blood carries oxygen. Oxygen aids in healing the muscles and recovery. So. Um, Pulling a sled is a really good thing right. to do. Um, um, I remember Donnie Thompson would tell me after heavy bench workouts, he would come in the next day and take a bar and a plate and just get some blood in there. Um, 
to help to help flush the lactic acid out of his muscles and shit like that. So uh, things like that. Just not nothing crazy. A lot of blood work. I'm all, I, 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 I've always kind of taken that approach, but you know, blood carries oxygen. Oxygen helps the recovery of muscles. So. Okay. Any kind of BCAA always helps. Um, one 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 thing that I noticed really good Redcon One has is called Isotope. It's a it's a it's a very fast digesting protein you take right after you work out. So. Um, that's one thing that I, I noticed that so any kind of like any kind of amino acid based protein another one's called Humapro uh, I forget ALR makes it or something like that um, it's an amino acid based protein and your body will digest like 99.9 percent .9 of the protein or if you're taking like whey protein your body might only your body might you know absorb 30 or 40 percent of it and then the rest goes to waste so some of these amino acid amino acid based proteins will help you recover even more. Uh, Dave, next question. Any books uh, you, that you recommend reading for li uh, lifters? Yeah. Um, I said this again. Urban Meyer, I forget the name of his book, but Urban Meyer wrote a book, and it, and it has to do with being a champion. And uh, it kind of gives you like a champion mindset. He's the head, Urban, if anybody doesn't know, was the head coach of Ohio State football. Um, and he was also the head coach of Florida. And he won national titles at Florida, and he won one at Ohio State. Uh, Nick Saban's got another one. I forget. They're, they're books written by Saban and uh, Urban Meyer, and I would suggest those okay. to anybody. Okay. Um, oh, what's another one? Um, there's a couple of books that Louie gave me, one that I don't know. It's The Science of like Olympic Weightlifting. It has Prelopin's chart in it. Um, kind of gives the breakdown of... Um, for example, if you're going to squat a certain number, that number will require a certain amount of reps and sets and overall tonnage. So a 500-pound squat will require uh, so many reps and sets at a set weight to achieve that work tonnage. So it's, it's kind of hard to do. But that's... Um, so yeah, science of weight training is another one. Weird ones that I can't remember, but it, honestly, if you get on the West Side website, Louis sells all right. his books. So any book that Louis has about weightlifting, he's given me, and I've taken time. From it, is is it true so that Louis Simmons sell. has some books in his house that are six hundred dollar books, uh, Russian strength manuals? Yeah, they're, they're straight from the Soviet Union. He got them. I shouldn't say Soviet Union, but like they're Soviet-based books. So when the Soviet Union was the Soviet Union. They wrote these books, and a lot of these books, like they, for example, the Soviets would take a thousand, a thousand lifters, right? For example, and they would subject, they would subject these lifters to the most like intense workout regimes, and they basically found out what kill, what, 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 what could people take? You know what I mean? And basically, zero point like zero zero one percent of those thousand, so like three people out of the thousand survived the training. And they, they basically found out what they did. It's a, it's, it's a weird thing, but yeah. Huh. yeah. Interesting. So there's a bunch of weird books like that that Louis has where these, these Soviets, they subjected their athletes to all these crazy amounts of workloads and workouts and tests and see how much of, how many of them recovered from it, how many of them didn't, so they could find that happy well, medium cool. of who got much from it where. That's kind of the gist of it. So Louie's got a lot of those cool books that he that he would kind of show me. And I remember Louie always told me, I, I remember that uh, Louie said that uh, he would always try to get Chuck books, and Chuck would open the books and close them and just throw them down because Chuck had an interest Chuck. Chuck just wanted to lift right. weights. Right. So I always, like, even if I, anytime Louie ever handed me a book, I would read it and then read it again and then read it again. So like, the first time I wouldn't I wouldn't understand anything in it, and the second time I kind of picked up on it, and then the third time I'd understand a little bit more. Okay. So uh, after so many years of getting books handed to you, you kind of retain this uh, general understanding of how to how to execute the system. Okay. Cool. And so. Tony Plum. Sounds good. Um, what was it like to train around Dave Tate? 
He seems like one of the best people you could ever have in the gym. So I never actually got okay. I more so saw Dave Tate train. I never, I never actually really trained with Dave Tate. Like he was literally leaving when I walked in. So he was in there. That's when like Dave first started Elite FPS, and um, he was uh, kind of do, he was kind of uh, breaking away from Westside and doing his own thing. And that was kind of around that time. But uh, from from all the things I've heard of Dave Tate, he was a really good training partner. He was a really intense training partner. He had this alter ego called Skippy. <laughs> and, um, you know, you know, hey, come on, Skippy. You know, he, so he, so Dave had this this quirky craziness about him that made him a really interesting training partner. You said all. He definitely. Go ahead, Dave. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I was saying he, he definitely brought an interesting aspect to him. What a you said you said alter ego. I remember Louis Simmons saying he has an alter ego and nobody knows who that is or something like that. It, did, do you have the answer to that, or is that we'll never find that out? I think he says it in the West Side. I don't think. I don't think we'll ever find okay. that out. If he does, he sure hides it. It must only come out when this way. It's kind of hard saying, but I'm sure he does. I think. Oh yeah. Right. It. Here's a good question for you from Cody Plum. How fun was it to hear Kenny Patterson talk shit while benching? Uh, see, Kenny was another one. See, that was like Kenny. Kenny had just as I got there, Kenny was oh. leaving. And Kenny was had started the UPA. Oh. So, Kenny, you remember the UPA when they first started? It was a bench only federation. Yep. Um, so Kenny started the first bench only federation, the UPA. They only offered bench only. There was no squatting or deadlifting or anything. Like that. So <clears throat> I remember he had a gym called Progressive Strength or something like that. Progressive Strength Evolution. And um, yeah, Kenny would come in from time to time, but I never really, I never got okay. to train with him. Next question. Okay. Uh, is that the? Howard. Yep, Howard's question. What was some of the techniques and coaching questions you got from Chuck? Um, like coaching questions? Probably, I think it's coaching you. advice Probably, as like you're training. Coaching advice, yeah. Uh, Chuck, um, Chuck had a, had a funny way of like articulating things, so you had to kind of like I don't want to say he had a hard time explaining some things, but sometimes, like, when you're the only one doing it, it's hard to put things into words. So it was a lot of years of Chuck saying the same similar thing for me to understand. Um, there's really nothing that he said that nobody else said. It was almost like when you did it, he would, when I did something right, he would tell me in the light bulb. Would go. So... It was a lot of that kind of stuff. Like he would, like when I did something, he would he would immediately tell me, "That's what you need to do right there." And like, it was like, oh, okay, I get it. So um, it was a uh, he had his own special, unique way of kind of like teaching you or getting his conveying what he wanted you to learn. So here's a here's a broad question right here. How. Stephen Collier wants to know. How do I bench a grand? David. Oh, that's oh, that's my buddy Stevo from Australia. Okay. Bless okay. his heart. Okay. He's, he's just being he's just being a, a fancy cunt. <laughs> as the they like they like to use the word cunt. You 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 you, you dirty cunt. <laughs> in America, cunt is terrible, but over there in Australia, it's like calling somebody, "Hey, mate, you a fucking cunt." Like, really? hey. It's, it's, <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So, so it's just being funny. How does he bench a thousand? Work out, Steve-O. That's how you bench a thousand. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Zachary uh, McDonald. Something about Will Brody here. Did Will Brody use a dark side Viper bench shirt for his 1105 bench? I believe he used the... No, he did not use the dark side Viper. He used the, the uh, Pharrell, the Kruger, from my understanding. I am not familiar because, with anything that Will Brody has used. Um, I'm just not for up until what you sent me that one thing. I'm not. I've never even yep. really seen him. So I, I'm. Um, they are. I'm familiar. I'm familiar with them. I have multiple brands, and uh, 
And I, I study the internet, and um, I asked him uh, when he did his bench what shirt, and he told me it was the Kruger. So, say la vie. Yeah. <laughs> Easy. It's crazy. Uh, not sure if it has been asked before. Which bars do you prefer for dynamic bench and dynamic squat? Uh, dynamic bench pressing, I use a straight bar a lot. Uh, foot, any kind of football bar, um, a cambered bar, fat bars, squat bars, uh, fat grips, uh, stuff like that. In the squat, I really only use two bars. When I box squat, I'll do giant cambered bar, safety squat bar. When I free squat, it's only a straight bar. Okay. I, like I said, I'm just a fan of... of of making less variables. There's less variables, less things can go wrong. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. So if I'm free squatting with a straight bar all the time, like I don't need to free squat with a giant camera bar, or free squat with a safety squat bar, that doesn't make me a good free squat. You know what I'm saying? That's not, I'm not using a fucking safety squat bar to me. It doesn't. So yeah. a lot of my bars, I switch more bars so on a dynamic speed bench press day. But there are times like on a max effort day, I'll do a fat bar or I'll do the football bar. On the football bar on speed bench, I think you mentioned to me that you only use the wide, the wider grips on it. You don't do the real close. Yeah, I just can't get. Real I can't close. either. Like uh, when I'm close, I feel like I'm doing exactly like a like, yeah. It's like I can't. There's no pushing. It feels like I'm like doing like a, like, like an extension. I can't even. Yeah. Shoulder, yeah, like a shoulder tricep fly. <laughs> weird and it hurts the it does. oh and same same here Dave. Same. not orthopedic on <laughs> i remember you box jumping with brandon lily in a video at west side what's the highest you've ever jumped um i actually used to be able to slam dunk a basketball uh I don't want to call it like a full-on slam dunk, but I could get up and like grab the rim and put a basket on it. Really? That type of explosive jumping power? That's cool. Yeah. Um, I'm probably too heavy to do much of that anymore. I, I do it every now and again, but... Oh, I can get up and... Oh, shit, I don't know. Oh, props. I don't... I think that was a... I don't know, man. That's a good question. I don't want to say a number and then people are like, that is a good <laughs> Like, all as I know is like I can, you know, when I do box jumps, I try to make them hard and they're usually, I usually use the tall box and they're usually, I don't know, about chest height. So however tall that is, what, 12, 24, 36, I don't know, 36, 42, something like that. 46 would probably be a really tall one. Plyometrics are always really good. If you ever want to be a really explosive, box jumps are always a good thing. Uh, sometimes, like, we'll stand in foam and jump on boxes. We'll sit down on a box, stand up in the foam, and then jump up on another box. Okay. Like that. so, it's all kinds of different things. They're really good for sprinters. So if you're a football player or sprinters, any kind of plyometrics box jumps are really good. Ryan, are you working on being a record holder in the 50 to 59 year old class? Well, I'm not 50 that and 59, impressive. but when I, when I do get to 50 and 59, I like to think that I'll still be able to do that and um, I'll do the best I can. Only time will tell, but uh, got to take care of my body. Jesus, I put another how many? 20 years? Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of this question before. Have you ever used the number seven mega steel band from Sirius Steel Fitness? I don't know what that is. Negative. That sounds like a band. I know. I just used blue, green. So, same here, bands. Dave. Or the elite FTS bands, like they have, like, what do they have? Gray bands, fucking. Those are the two bands. I always use the West Side Blue Green Purple Monsters and Same here. bands, or we'll use the Elite. Those are probably your two best bands to get. So either one of those. Okay. Go. Perfect. Um, do you think a two thousand pound back squat is possible? 
Never say never. Right? This is true. One, one twenty. I mean, if nobody thinks it's possible, then that's when the shit will happen. So, Nate, Nate and Brandon Horse wants to know: Are you guys natty? What's natty mean? <laughs> Let's see. Not a, not a... Of course we're Absolutely. <laughs> I, got, I got a shirt that says it, so that means I am. Uh, 125 here in in Pennsylvania, just saying, hi, I, I got to drive tractor trailer in the AM, so I got to get back to bed. Wish I could watch. What time is it in Ohio, Dave? We're at the end of our questions in the chat box. You surpassed. One... You set the world record. I just want to let you know. It's 1030 here. We've been on for three and a half hours. Three and a half. And, and, and Dave, if the questions were still here, I would answer them. Because I, 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 I'm not well, even getting my second I, win. I, I want to take this all in. Life is short. When we, when we were together in, in in Columbus, we sat in that fucking restaurant six hours. Opened it and closed oh, it. Dude, we shut the fucking yeah. shit down. Totally. I've never sat in a restaurant that long. We were like, "Excuse me, sir." Uh, what closing? Yeah. Like what? What the fuck time is it? it it's three o'clock. Yeah, we started. We started nine. at nine. Well, we opened it too. I yeah. mean, I think. They yeah, we got there at like yeah. eight or nine in the morning, and before we knew it, it was like, Crazy. "Oh, well." Ugh. We we Dave, we actually actually recorded our conversation, and we when we go on two hour drives to get out of this state and, and go to a free state where they don't have like laws where you have to wear masks. We always listen to it, and it's always On entertaining to hear. Yeah, <laughs> it's laughing just, and yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. Oh, wait. You, re- you recorded the conversation where we were sitting at. Oh, at I'd the breakfast great. table. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and then we had the. What was that? That was the next morning. Then we went to the, the taco place and had delicious beverage. Uh, Crown Royal, and you were drinking IPA. <laughs> we had chips and queso, and yes. uh, we were there for a while. I had a nosebleed. That was kind of impressive. So. Yeah, that's me. Uh, okay, somebody's got a question here. Nate and Brandon Horse wants to know, how much prize money would it take for you two, Mindy, Meeker, Kolb, and Will to all compete together? Now, when he asks that que- when he asks oh, that question, Dave, uh, free. Go ahead. I'll do it for free. Free. Uh, really. But now, my question, Dave, is: um, Do we all have to wear um, the uh, band shirts, or, we, or do we all wear the, uh, you know, I, I call them old school shirts now? But um, I think we'd have to separate the, we'd have to we'd have to draw lines in the sand and and and, and do it that way. I would assume. Um, I will say that I am in I am in no I am not opposed. I, I would be a hypocrite if I was um, opposed. To, to improvements right. in yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, in my current position and how yeah. I am sponsored, I would have to right. wear a normal bench picture. Um, so yeah, so to keep to keep um, yeah. John Enzer happy, so to say, um, He's always taking care of me, so unless he would allow that and wouldn't care, um, maybe I would do something. I think John I has too. something coming, and I think that's what he's waiting for. So maybe when John's comes out, uh, I could throw yeah. one of them things on. Yeah, he's because newsflash, like I, like we'll just keep it general. Most of these guys that have put these. Uh, these newer shirts on these band shirts, we'll just call them band okay. shirts, whatever you want to call them. Okay. That's the only thing I know for them to. They're a bench shirt to me. It's obviously yep. a bench shirt. It's like a slingshot, whatever you want to call it. Um, you can kind of see what they bench in shirts, and you see what they bench in uh, these band shirts. And not that there's not a learning curve to them. Cause there is. Be, but there's a significant jump from, they're just different. I just think they're just different. It's kind of like racing. There's jet car racing and there's, there's top right. fuel dragster. They're just they're the same the same thing. There's different. Um, yeah, not opposed to it. Um, I'm, I'm. You're not gonna fucking. I'm not gonna bitch about lifting less. You know what I mean? Like if I have something that's gonna make me bench twelve fifty, be careful <laughs> what you wish for. You know what I mean? Like because there's very few people that have actually benched. Um, we'll just call them in. Um, what is called multiply shirts. You know, not the band shirts. There's, there's a, it's a small club. Um, 
I think there's what five or six of us yep. now. Five, six, six. Jimmy Colton is yep. another one that just that just benched a big bench. So I think what he benched ten thirty five. The world record yep. two seventy five. Yep. yep. Beat. <laughs> so I think there's Gene was the first one. I, I think Mendy was the second, maybe. Yes. And then Gene, and, Gene and Mendy were trading that thousand pound bench press every few months by two or three pounds. And um, then I figured out that phenom and uh, figured out I had sleep apnea. And, and then that's what you did. You just came in and took a dump. I, I just wanted to get so far out in front that they would lose hope and actually quit. And that, that was my mentality. I, I didn't want them to ha even have a chance. It was one of the greatest things in powerlifting. That was one of the greatest things in powerlifting. Like, I, I, I'm not trying to, like, no. bust you up here, but when – to bench a thousand was crazy, and then just to have you be like, fuck it, like, ha, like, here's 10 fucking 50, 60, 75, 74. It's just like, and these dudes down here are still yeah. trying like 10, 15, 10, 19. And you're like, I will take 11. Like, just, dude, when you, I think I saw a meet where you had a tiny ass bench shirt on, and you, it must have been 11.05, and you took it down like a half an inch. It was just about to touch, and like, you couldn't touch it, and you just aborted it and went, yeah, like yeah. that was, was like, 1080. Okay, and then I, I believe I came back after that and did 1105 and damn near got it. But uh, man, those were the days. It's crazy. Good yeah. Time, sir. See, that, that's what people. That's what I'm saying. That'll probably never happen again like that. Like that was a time. Uh, like you did some. It's kind of I'm trying to explain. Like you did something at a time. Like that'll probably never be done again. It's like Alabama winning six national titles in 10 years. It's it's like there's not going to be somebody that's just going to come on and slap a fucking 75 pounds on the biggest bench that's of all time. You know what I mean? like, and you know what's funny, Dave? But... And then do it at, at the rate you did it at, what I saw, one big thing from you that separated you from a lot of people, in my opinion, is you went from benching 1,000 to fucking yeah. opening with like, I remember you would open with a thousand eight and just blister it. And I'm going, I can't squat that fucking. Yeah. Like, how does <laughs> and that, that was my mentality in the meet was, uh, and I, and I told this before that Inzer shirt was just the best shirt on earth, man. I, I had it dialed and it was like, when I went out there to open with a thousand, I remember I hear the grinder song and I never really got amped up because a thousand didn't do it for me. It was the next weight after that. That was most important. It's like, get the thousand out of the way and get up to 1050 or 1070 or whatever it is. And I remember there was a time in my training where I kind of sat down and thought to myself, and I was like, you know, I'm doing this 1,000, and I, and I have a good crew, I, but I always ask myself, what if I was at Westside right now? What, where, and how, you got, that gym would have taken me uh, to another level. I believe so. I believe yeah. so. Just the atmosphere there, you, you, there, it, it, it would have just been ultra That's pressured right. to keep doing more. Pushed. You know what I mean? Like, um, yes, it, you would. You would have been there. Louis has a good way of just uh, propping up situations to apply pressure to you. Um, so even though you might have been seventy-five, you might have had a ten seventy-five bench. He's like, well, you probably could have benched eleven. And it's like, well, I just benched ten. Like, was ten seventy-five not good enough? Like, wait, you're only 30 pounds away from 11. You know, why don't you do this meet in three weeks and just try it? Uh, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda, man. You know, if I had to go back and do it all over, I would. Uh, I definitely would have gone to Westside and, and, and that element of training. And um, I think uh, I think it would have taken me further. But, uh, you know, the powers that be and, and how, how life works, you know, it just didn't work out. I think one of the blessings in my life was actually walking away from the sport in 2000. And I uh, got fed up because I was trying to make money off of my 700-pound benches. And I said, F this, Washington State. And my, my, my crew uh, my crew was falling apart. And I just shot off to Florida and retired, took up drinking. And uh, lo and behold, somebody... <laughs> oh, yeah. Went back to Crown Royal and bars, man. And uh, that yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. And uh, ended up, ended up uh, I was like, I got to get back in the gym. You know, Gold's Gym down there. And some asshole came in and said, are you the had a powerlifting magazine. Is this you, Ryan Canelli? And I'm like, I looked both ways, and I go, yeah. And he goes, oh, we got to train together. You got to do a meet, blah, blah, blah. And that's how I met Louie. You know, I went up to Daytona Bench for Cash, lost to all those guys, tried to intimidate him in the warm-up room, 
You know, I really I told Louie that at breakfast, and I uh, and uh, he kind of laughed because you know, they, he said it did catch his attention though. Yeah, I did like, six thirty raw. Person. You know, I had Halbert Patterson and Fusner there, and I was like, okay, motherfuckers, watch this. And I cracked out six thirty raw, shoved it up like a speed bench, and I I thought that might get in their head a little bit. Did nothing, and uh, I bombed that day. And I went back there and I said, Louie, I I want to get better. And he goes, you need to call me. And then I remember Halbert was over here. And I, and I go, what do I got to do to get strong? And Albert looked at me and goes, speed, speed, speed. And I looked at him and go, what is speed? You know, <laughs> and what? That's my, I, I love telling that story, man, because it was a fork in the road in life, you know, that I took, and it was a gamble, but it paid off. I mean, I don't think without Westside and Louis Simmons, there would be no bench monster. I really believe that. And, uh, you know, after talking to Louis, I went from what, what I had done for myself, 733, and, and eight, eight months later, 800, you know, and then I just kind of kept going, so. Well, I remember this. I remember there was an article in Powerlifting USA where they had interviewed you. And this is like when, like, you know, I had never met you or nothing like that. So, and I didn't really, wasn't familiar with how you train. And you you basically said, what is the, what do you attribute to the success in your training or something like that? You said, Louis yep. Simmons and Bands and Chain. And I was at Westside and I was like, well, I guess if he's doing it, I'll just keep doing it. You know what I mean? So I was like, well, he's doing this. So, this, that, and the other, and then to your thing, the whole grinder song, dude. I don't think you understand how many times these songs were played because we felt that this grinder song brought pounds to the bench press because grind. You guys play that? Really you guys cool. played that in Westside quite a bit. Yeah, dude. We, like that was like you, you, you would you would turn it on like grind this, and then you would start finding like other bands that did grinder, like uh, Judas Priest, Six Feet okay. Under. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's one. There's a band called Creator. Oh, that I've one. not heard Creator. them. No, I'll have to, I'll have to YouTube okay. that. YouTube that one for sure. It's like it's kind of like a better version. It's like a Judas Priestier version with more of that like 80s okay. metal type sound. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Yeah, that's like a song it. that gets me going, man. It was uh, it was one that I picked up in uh, Senior Nationals 2003. I went down there with uh, my uh, a crew of guys, and I had a, I tore my pec two months prior. And Mendelssohn was down there, and, and uh, he beat my record, uh, I, my 800. He did 804 or 821. And, on the way, and then we uh, took a trip down to Mexico just for Coronas and Cohiba cigars. And uh, on the way there in the car, this grinder song played. And I go, what the song? What is that song? And it, I played it like a thousand times. And it was June 2003, and I go, that's my song. And I'm coming back, and I'm, that's going to be my song. So, yeah, that's how Grinder came about. I might, I might have to, I might have to do a tribute to Grinder, do a Ryan Billy so Grinder tribute <laughs> the next time I go. Up. That'd be cool. That'd be really cool. <laughs> yeah. I like it. That's my go-to. That's you just gotta do what the strong guys are doing. It's playing Grinder. <laughs> what they're doing yeah when i hear that song man it's like it's you know it's like the fire beanie back in the day you know when i clap put that on it made me it made me think of chuck vogelpool's uh thousands pound squat at 220 in 2002 whenever he did it and the intensity that he had when he approached that bar and uh you know it was just just things that that uh, i used uh, in my arsenal that got me amped and uh uh borderline psychotic before i got out there to lift you know you had to get that right mind frame I never really uh, 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 approached the bar. Um, I, I don't know, man. It, it's a zone. You know what it is, Dave. You know when, you, when, when you're there. And uh, all the, the atmosphere, the music, and, and every little innuendo that you do is, uh, is definitely beneficial, especially though when you're freaking lifting the weights that we are, man. So. Yes, sir. To the, to the flame beam. Like, I remember, like, the first time I ever wore – I never wore a flame beating until the WPO came back. Like, I remember Chuck had, uh, I know that, you know, Gene yep. used to wear one, and Chuck wore one, and you wore one. There might have been a, a, another guy, but those are the three that I, that, like, why I wanted to wear the flame beam. So, like, up until, I think, 18, 2018, when the WPO kick first came back and we were all in Orlando, Chuck had come down, and I had bought this flame beam, and uh, I was going to wear it, but, dude, I was having such a terrible time, and I fucked my back up going into that meet, so I was having a really hard time in the warm-up room, and I was like, man, I cannot go out here and fucking follow my face with a flame beanie on and have Chuck watch me. So, like, I remember I walked over to him, and I took the flame beanie out of my pocket, I looked at him, and I was like, do I have your blessing to wear this flame beanie? And he kind of looked down at the flame beanie, and he gave me a grunt, like, I was like, okay. So I took the flame beanie and I rubbed it on. <laughs> like I'm gonna need some. 
take some junk on my flame beanie. So, yeah. So that flame beanie's been pretty good, you know. And it's done me well pretty Yeah, I saw, I, I, I saw Chuck at the Arnold, and I, I wanted to... I had it, you know, I, I, I kind of had a, a regret, you know, and I walked up to Chuck and I said, Chuck, I just want to apologize, you know, I, uh, I, I know you wore that flame beanie and then I, I went home and I Googled and I found one and I started wearing it. And then House of Pain Ironware, they, they, they developed the flame beanie. Then everybody and their grandmother overnight had a flame beanie. And then Chuck switched over to some type of different Harley Davidson type uh, flame beanie thing. And um, I Paul, He had yeah, one with it, assholes. Like I remember one. Yeah, it was like an Arnold Classic. It was like a it was like a black one with a yeah. red top on it, and it had these like beads well, what, what and What scared me, Dave, was the fact it. that he did it immediately <laughs> after I, I it, it was like overnight. I, all these flame beanies came out, and then and then he switches, and uh, he told me basically he lost it, and uh, I, but I still feel because of my stupid idea of having a flame beanie and everybody else having a flame beanie. I think he, I think I, I felt like I stole his 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 mojo and he, he switched it and i don't know I, I still i still kind of feel guilty but uh you know uh I, it's, it's cool to see you in the, in the opening uh, of our show tonight you know you're at the uh, wpo on espn there and with the flame beanie on and uh that, that's a, a montage you know to chuck man and that's that's awesome yeah that was uh that was kind of like my uh like tribute to him you know what i mean like i felt that for whatever reason i felt that the WPO was kind of synonymous with Chuck, and the, Chuck, the oh, fire yeah. hat, fire beanie was kind of like synonymous with Chuck. So I felt that was kind of like, without him saying it, I think he would have liked it. He wouldn't tell me if he did. If he wouldn't tell me if he did or didn't like it, me. Like, please rephrase that. Um, if he did like it, he wouldn't tell me. But I think deep down inside, he, he appreciates yeah. that. You know what I mean? So that was kind of my my nod to him. Cool. So. Kind of carry the flame beanie on, and, and uh, I don't want to say it remembers. Yeah. In honor. honor yeah. Chuck, I think. How 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 often do you see Chuck now? Um, yeah, it's really you know I see him. It's usually not right. so much anymore. Um, it's usually every couple okay. months I'll run into him. And we'll, call, we'll call each other every now and again just see what the hell's going on. So we, we had planned a trip out to Oklahoma. We've got dog buddies out there, and we always go look at That's something me and him always do. We, we like dogs, so we go and check dogs out and see what dogs he likes to breed to or pick a dog up. He's, he's, dog, he's a dog person. I've got three dogs. And, you know, so. Yeah, I definitely, uh, you know, when this COVID thing is over, uh, definitely like to come out and fly out to your area, get a training session in. And uh, eat some food, and and uh, I just don't know when that's going to be. The six sausage house. I try to tell everybody we have we have an awesome we have like a, something called German Village out here in Columbus, and um, there's a sausage place there called Schmidt Sausage House. Do you ever yes, see I have. Yes. Food. You watch that show? Yeah, he goes to that Schmidt Sausage House, and they have like some of the best garlic knockwurst and deep fried uh, Bavarian pretzels, and they got. All kinds of good shit there. So, uh, yeah, they got a, a schnitzel, Wiener schnitzel. Oh, nice. Um, all kinds of good stuff. Good German food. So, that's one of my favorite places. So, whenever if you ever come out, when you come out here again, we'll, we'll go to the. You know, Dave, house. I love food. And after we ate that, after we closed down that breakfast joint, you told me to go to Starline. Yeah, Is that we did. where? We, or Skyline. Sky, the Skyline. Chili, the chili place. Had yeah. two chili dogs, dude. Best chili dogs ever. Really I, I know that's probably like just a. Uh, like a random little place. I, I thought it was delicious, man. And yeah, they're, they're, I guess they're, they're they're they originated in Cincinnati, Ohio. So from what I understand, I could be wrong, but it's like an Ohio thing. So uh, they also do like a pasta. That's another thing. If you want to gain weight, just make some pasta and put some Skyline chili on it, put cheese on it. It's like a dish. We make That's what you here. told me. Yeah. Hey, I was even impressed with Bob Evans. So I, I, I'm 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 easily impressed. Food. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I had, I had Bob Evans before no we came on here. I had the deep, had the fried pork tenderloin. It was delicious. Uh, what else? I got? I got a bacon cheeseburger. So how many? Cal- that sounds good. I, that sounds delicious. How many calories in that whole setting there? I don't know. <laughs> well, well, Dave, it's uh, well, well, what was it like almost two in the morning your time? 
Is that what I'm trying to... God, wow. one point, uh, Dave, if you have to get up at 5 o'clock... Uh, I'm, I'm, Do you I'm... have to get up at 5 tomorrow? Uh, from Dave. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry time. to keep you up so late. I'm sorry about that. I was doing it Well, we really appreciate you being on here. It's oh, yes. been great. It's been awesome. Not so great, I had a good time. Like, uh, I'm down for this any time. Like, it's, I, I know it's kind of like you... It's like a weird thing to have the same guys oh, not, now and again, but it's always fun to come yeah. on and shoot the shit about all the Dave, just text me and say, hey, I want to be on yeah, your show. Yeah, no, we'll totally plan on having you again. And we can do like a follow-up. Do door's and... always open, Dave. If you if you got a free time on a Thursday, and uh, just let me know a week in advance so I can alert the public. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the My internet guy should be coming here tomorrow or the next day. Uh, so when I... Uh, this, okay. I guess, worked okay. I can't really see my... But I think when um, when I get a when I get this remedied, which yeah, will yeah. be a lot better yeah, next time. Well, Dave, this is... I can't see myself. I don't know if you can see me, but... It I was good. We, we had a few camera there, there malfunctions. There a few times where it was kind of moving, and then all of a sudden there'd just be like a corner of your face. We'd see your shoulder. I, I don't know why it's yeah. doing that. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was... I, yeah, it would just kind of flash over, and all of a sudden you can see like part of your face, and I'm like, what is going on? I was trying to center it on my end a few times, but uh, hey, you know... Now it, it's it, perfect. You're perfect right now, man. But uh, Yeah. Hey, it works, man. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you look awesome, Dave. Yes. <laughs> I gotta give a I gotta give a quick shout out to uh, one of my buddies. I don't know if you you might know this guy. His name his name's Chris <gasps> yeah. Kissling. Yeah. Chris yeah. Kissling, I uh, totally do. Yeah. He, he, uh, he has something. He has beard oil and uh, yeah. beard wax. So if you can see it, this guy sent me yep. some beard wax and some beard oil, and. Um, uh, I told him I'd give him a shout out. This stuff's pretty good. If you got a beard, I know, I know. Maybe it's okay. Maybe you, we can always grow the chops back and get a little. Well, I'm gonna have to get. I'm gonna have to get some dye for but, it though. I got a lot of gray going on now, you know. So I don't. <laughs> not happy with that. But what do you do? <laughs> okay. Just, Just accept it. it. So yeah, if anybody likes beard oil, this is this is like I I'm not one like. This stuff's really good. So if anybody likes good beard oil, um, it's called Viking Beard Care, and I use what's called Midgard. Kind of no, I was going to say, does it have a does it have an aroma to it? Uh... Yeah, yeah, it's got like a spicy, uh, woody scent to it. You know, it's a uh, it's very like it's, it's what like a guy would want to smell. smell. Like, you know what I mean? It's really... Dave, Very I don't know madness. if I can pull off a beard. I mean, it, it's it's just like getting food in it. it it's itchy. Uh, I like the chops and the goatee thing, but never say never. Next time you see me, I could be fully grown and, <laughs> and look like a bushman. You look weird. I don't know. I think you need to at least okay, I can do that. For one, just for one time. <sighs> I, think, I think we're due for some chops. A lot of facial hair. That'd be entertaining. I kind of miss it. That's, a, that's Canelli-esque. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To recognize symbols. Yeah, well, yeah. Sure. Then okay, it's on, it's on the list of things to do. Chops, go to chops. You know, I, you know, maybe next time we talk, I can ask some of my more uh, generic questions, like uh, fat-free milk, two percent, one percent, whole milk. Yeah, we could totally come up with more questions. I got. You know, I what, mean... What's your favorite cologne? Two percent. Okay. 2%. Do you? Do you? 2%. It's really great on cereal. The calorie intake's really low. It doesn't get curdy. Doesn't feel like you're drinking okay. pudding. Yeah. Two percent. I got a lot of off the wall questions for, like for, random, for yeah, for just random stuff favorite. to figure out what you do and how, and how you do it and and uh, what was some of the other ones I asked Tiny. Uh, uh, do you wear cologne, Dave? Um. Well, I mean, when I do, I it's called um, what is it? Green Irish Tweed. <laughs> and where do you buy that at? Is that what it's called? I don't know. Uh, my girl got it for me. I think they, okay. they sell it on Amazon, but it's really good cologne. It's called a Green Irish Tweed. I think that's what it's called. I could be wrong. Okay. It's really good stuff. It's really interesting. It's a little simple stuff. Uh, uh, what's your favorite fast food place out there in uh, Columbus? But if you if you're oh that is... if you were to eat fast okay. food, what's your favorite go to munchy fast food place? I would say I really enjoy Taco Bell. Those chicken chalupas really have a place <laughs> in my heart. Uh, 
Uh, Raising Cane's, we have something called Raising Cane's out there. I haven't heard of that. There. It's really good. Chicken. Uh, maybe Zaxby's. If anybody I don't knows know. what Zaxby's is, it's something similar. That's a South thing. Uh, Chick fil A is always like fantastic. I do. Uh, you can never go wrong with Chipotle. Chipotle. Okay. okay. Um, it's always good. We've been getting some. Five Guys. I'll tell you what, Five Guys is where it's at. You can't do it better. Really? really? We should try that. Never I, oh, we, we, we have one out here. Oh, we, ha we have yeah. one here. I don't know. If, I I've don't eaten there I've once. Ever, I don't know if I've ever had it. I'm telling you. I five Custom guys. make your burgers. It was delicious. Right. So basically, when I come next. out there, I, I'm, uh, my diet's going to go to shit, and uh, I'm probably going to put on 25 pounds in a few days. So that's fine with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. Do it. Do it now. Do you know, it. I, <laughs> do it. Oh. Yeah, I can't. I can't wait, man. I'm just, I'm just. We're waiting to get this COVID thing over with so we can travel and do things yeah. like normal human beings. But it just seems in that. Well, let's wait till after November because I'm pretty sure. Funny, after I November, was thinking the same thing. Normal. Yeah. What? Go figure. What? What? What phase are That's... you in, in 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 Ohio, Dave? Are you phase two? Uh, we're moving oh, into what? four. You. You're in, in Ohio. Four? We're in phase three right now, where um, basically they did a they did a mask mandate to where if you can't socially distance and you're in public, they ask you to wear a mask. So like if I walk into a grocery store, they'll ask they ask that you put a mask on. Um, but like if you're in public in parks, you don't have to put a mask on. Bars are open; you can go to bars, but the yeah. seating's like fifty percent capacity. Oh, good for so you guys. Um, yeah. It, um, what else? Pretty much everything's back to normal here, as yeah. far as I can say. Like, there's, they, there's still pretty precautionary. Like, we have fall sports. Like, the Buckeyes are practicing, and they're letting the, the stadium be 20% capacity okay. here. So, there we have a stadium that holds 106,000, but they're letting, like, 25,000 in, and they got to wear masks. So, I think um, with uh, a lot of the treatments that they're, they're coming out with and yeah. the potential vaccines... Uh, I think that it's looking bright for the whole COVID thing. Um, Hope so. I think that I think I think us as a country would disagree if we are not. It's turning the country or turning the corner. That's good to hear. COVID it's thing. promising. I, yeah, I like like to get, get this behind us, man. I really would. I know. I drove to New York, so I drove through Pennsylvania. You know, I was drove down the Jersey Turnpike, and I went into New York and. Uh, my advice to people, just real quick, is uh, don't always take what the what the mainstream media says as as blatant fact, because they on the news portray like New York to be this big crazy epicenter of chaos, and you know I drove all through New York, and yeah, there's some spots that are pretty hairy, and you know with some protesters and stuff, but for the most part, like everybody's, it's that. I just think we as a country are getting ready to turn the corner, and I think uh, it might bring the country together a lot more. I hope so. so I think uh, I think the future is bright. I, I like positivity, man. Oh, yeah, that I like good your answer. That's yeah. <laughs> I hate doom and gloom, yeah, man. And, and so we, it's, it's it's almost hopeless up here. Our government is a piece in, of shit. We're still in phase one point five. Yeah. We're imprisoned in our own and, homes. And, and we oh, have a mask uh, mandate. You are not allowed to go anywhere, like inside anywhere without a mask on. And they're pretty strict about enforcing it. Um, so we're not. Yeah, like, uh, um, I think <clears throat> one big reason that they put a mask mandate, see, like when, because I, I was, my job was considered an essential worker. So I, I could still work when everything was shut down in phase one. And I didn't have to wear a mask during phase one, two, or three, and now here at the end of phase three, they're having mask mandates. So it's like, a, some of the shit's kind of backwards, yeah. but then, I keep, they're basically they're saying like, basically, hey, do you want to do these things? Do you want to watch fall sports? This will help, and if it helps move yeah. them along, then uh, move I them along, you know what I mean? Well, I'm just... I think there's a, a place for it, like, you know, um, I don't, I don't, think masks are going to really actually, I think they're going to protect sick people from spreading it. I don't really think they're going to prevent somebody that's, I mean, they even say it, unless it's an N95 mask, I mean, they get on there and um, 
even the boxes on some of these masks will say does not protect you from further. <laughs> kind of right. weird. It's not weird. So there's just all kinds of varying things that are being said, misinformation, the right information. Yeah. So. It's hard to decipher what's true. Pick the one, like, like they say in a fight, pick the one in the middle. <laughs> and you're gonna, you're, you're gonna you're gonna be fucked from inaction to so just act on something and go with it. There you yeah. go. Well, hey, well, Dave, it's two a.m. in I Columbus, know. and wow. I feel really bad. I, I feel hours. bad for you, I, man. We're sorry that you have to get up so early, we, but we really appreciate you being been on here. This has been awesome. It's been great having you. Oh, no, I'm I'm good. I'm gonna I'm gonna probably get off. And eat yeah, I don't know. Food. I'm kind of hungry myself. Yeah, I'm starving. So, well, hey, Dave. But we'd love to have you again sometime. This has been a blast. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. Again, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe if you get some uh, come up with some more things to talk about, we'll yeah. just touch on them. Maybe we could do something like that every every other month or something. Just pick That'd a couple awesome. topics that happen over course of some time. I'm we'll down with that, Dave. We, we yeah. love that idea totally. Yeah, totally. I, I think people are getting tired of seeing us sit on here and talk. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can only go so far. I don't think I. Look much I don't think I look much better in my puffy cheeks. Oh, no. oh no, Dave. Dave. Everybody loves you. Thanks. You're a sports <laughs> model. You just don't understand it. You're a sex symbol. Okay? Right. <laughs> sex. Yeah. Powerlifting sex symbol. I'm bringing, sex, I'm yeah. bringing the sex back. The bench press belly. Oh, I hear you there. Yeah, I'm kind yeah, of I'm totally hungry yeah. myself. I have some food. That sounds like good. I like the idea of having a I got the munchies right now. Money. I'm not looking for anything good. I just want, I want something... Do you have in and out burger? Up I there? wish we did. No. We don't have water burger. We don't have any of the good stuff out here. It's your bit. Five days of your Yeah, but day. 11 o'clock at night. Uh, They're not open. Yeah, I don't even sure if Taco Bell's open. I don't know if there's any. I don't think anywhere around here yeah, is we're open these days. We're aft. 2 a.m. here. What's that? Taco Bell is open until 2 a.m. here. Is it? Is ours? Oh, yeah. It, it might be. It might be. It's tempting. I like the cheesy gordita crunch. Cheesy gordita crunch. And those. what was that you get at Taco Bell, Dave? So I get three chicken chalupas. I will get a gordita crunch also, but you can also get chicken gordita crunches or steak gordita crunches. Ooh. Hmm, I don't think I've ever done that. Yeah. Um, I also get the nachos and cheese because they're fantastic. I always like the yes. cinnamon. Yes, they're so good. Cheese. Okay. Kyle, you're making me hungry. And what I also do is Get, get, if you get a cup of cheese, you take the chicken chalupa and you dip it in the cheese. cheese sauce. That sounds wonderful. Dave, you're making my mouth drool. I... Okay. <laughs> Extra. <laughs> it sounds so good. We should go to Taco Bell. They're open. All right. Well, I guess I'll let you guys go and get some food. I mean, I think we you hit four hours. Right four hours, Dave. And, and there's still there's still people there's still watching. Twenty one people, people watching, still, dude. <laughs> this shit could go on all night, Dave, dude. There's been people that I was, have been on the whole. I was four hoping. Hours. I, I was hoping we could crack an IPA beer next time. You know, Tiny and I drink tequila, so I know you're an IPA beer guy. Just I I saw that. I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna. Well, be we, able just, to we, we just have one. Hours, but, but, no, I mean, like I was like. Yeah. Uh, ring yeah, the yeah, bell, yeah. Like the I can't, I can't hang with Tiny, <laughs> but I, I think I can drink one beer with you. Like, you know, we'll have a cheers, you know, next time yeah, we do this. Cheers. Just let me know what, what brand of IPA I need to get. Yes. That's the, that's the Delirium trimmings. Okay, I'll find the... I'll, I'll find the... Delirium trimmings. Yeah, it comes up with a really? ceramic-looking bottle. There, it's awesome beer. It's got a pink elephant. Well, hey... Yeah. Hey, next time we talk, I'm having it, and then we're gonna we're gonna, that by then. we're gonna drink it. Yeah. So, all right, Dave. Fantastic. God bless, and uh, we'll sign uh, off again. Yes, thank sir. you so much. Thank we you really very much appreciate for your time. having you. The audience loves you. It's been a blast getting to chat with you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah definitely do it fun. again. Oh yeah, totally. Sure, we'll be we'll bugging you. I'm gonna send you a text tomorrow apologizing for how tired you are, and um, <laughs> just be aware. So. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, okay. there's naps. We'll be all right. Perfect. Nothing <laughs> to nap to. All right, Dave. Well, you have a good night, sir. Yep. Have a good night. All right. Good night, Dave. You're welcome. Bye, Dave. Thank, right. you. thank you. And, and thank you.